Hi, can I check whether I can share my video, uh, share my presentation or not? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's working fine. You can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Now, how do I unshare this? Same button. Same button. Uh, okay, got it, I think. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Hello, good morning, Mariasan. Uh, good, good, good morning, jo Joby. <laughs> uh, you want me to try a share now? Before, yeah, if you want to try, you can try. Uh, I think, uh, colleague uh, Professor Rishan is trying something now, or can I? Try? Yes, finished. Yes, finished checking it. Okay, okay, okay. I'll just try to share this now. Yeah, good. It's fine. It's fine, right? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. So we we go in the um. In the full, uh, yeah, yeah correct. Mode? this is correct. correct, correct. In, yeah. in this mode, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. That's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, how can I reduce this? Is you can just um, unshare. There is an unshare button. No, no. I'm just wondering because I'm seeing, uh, um, you know, the IC. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying uh, how I can. Uh, Reduce the video view. Uh, yeah, okay. I think this is enough, right? Yeah. So it's okay, right? So now I'll. It's okay. It's fine. How it's fine. to unshare now? It's another question. Oh, this is a different plat. It's a different platform. How to unshare now? Yeah, okay. I got it. Uh, Okay, Joe, yeah. So how, how is the thing? I mean, we, we start around uh, in about 10 minutes time, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. so that's right. The first uh, one, then, yeah, right. The chairpersons have not arrived yet. They will come soon. Yeah, I know okay. GCA, one more DS Meta will come soon. Okay. Good morning to you. Good morning to you all. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Anuj, I noticed also, whenever your mic is unmuted, <laughs> all of them there is no. Yeah, yeah, I think there's something with the with this, uh, laptop mic. Uh, something is there. So I'll be keeping mostly mute, except for. Yeah. For the question. Yes, today I think it's nearly the same situation. Anuj, uh, can I just. Uh, hello? Hello. Yes, please. Uh, yes, sir. Is it audible when I'm speaking or I need very to good. use yeah, it? Your, your voice is very good. No problem. Yes. OK, your thank voice. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
So I, I think we'll just wait for it's around eight more minutes. <coughs> Eight yeah, more minutes. We have a yeah, around eight minutes. Yes. <laughs> I think um, Ishan is also here. Uh, Dr. Professor Ishan. I see him also logged in. Yep. Morning, Anand. Uh, hi, Ishan. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Thanks. So, so thanks to both you and Professor Murakeshan for joining in. So we'll just start in around eight minutes. It must be very early over there, right? Uh, more like very late. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. In, in your day, very late. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're at twelve thirty in the morning. Yeah. But, yeah. And so, yeah, exactly. So thanks, thanks, thanks for yeah. Your, your original schedule was was very early in the morning, but then because of the time change. It became even earlier, so so yes. So this was a good. This was, I think, better for you. It seems, although nothing, yeah. nothing is very because you know still a very inconvenient time difference. But, but yeah, we had we had a lot of speakers from U.S. and Canada, and these were the only possibilities either late night for them or early morning because that's it's just
Now, hello, Anuj. Now there is no noise. Yeah, yes, yes. So I am just chatting. Professor Dees Mehta is also here. And, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, Shari Parmani is here. Yeah, good, good. Okay, your voice noise is yes, but your voice is not very really audible. No. <laughs> okay, is it audible now? Yeah, disturbance is there. Huh? Okay. Hey, so just. Yeah, anyway, no problem. Let us go ahead. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think we, uh, we can introduce yeah, so this game method is also in, so we could, uh, I think we can start. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, so both the co chairs are here. So, Professor D.S. Mehta and myself are the co chairs for the session. And, um, and Professor Jovi Joseph, who's a co convener, and myself is also here. And here we have Professor Ishan Barman. Um, who's our first speaker for the session, and I'll just briefly introduce uh, Professor Ishan Berman. Uh, so Professor Ishan Berman is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and he holds in the Johns Hopkins University, and he holds a joint appointment in the Johns Hopkins Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. <coughs> he received his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2011, where he investigated transdermal blood and light monitoring using vibrational spectroscopy in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Fell. You know, he did his BTEC from IIT Delhi, so this is, you know, we welcome him back to uh, IIT Delhi. And following his postdoctoral fellowship at the Laser Biomedical Cancer Research Center at MIT in 2014, um, Dr. Berman established his independent group, the Berman Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. By combining optical spectroscopy, chemical imaging, and nanoplasmonics, the Berman Laboratory develops non-invasive approaches in which structural and molecular data converge to provide integrated insight into disease mechanisms. So we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ishan Berman, Professor Ishan Berman, in the session. And thanks, Dr. Berman, for being here. Thank time. you. Uh, Thank you uh, let me see if I can quickly share my screen and then we'll get started. Okay. You can see my screen good? Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak at the Photonics and Plasmonics Symposium of the IEEE ICWE Conference 2020. I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering, oncology, radiology, and radiological science at the Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. I've been a faculty member at Hopkins for the last seven years, and I'm also part of the leadership team for the Laser Biomedical Research Center housed at MIT. Our research interests reside in engineering innovation at the interface of biophotonics, nanomaterials, and artificial intelligence for analysis of complex biological systems as is required to address questions important to both fundamental biology and applied clinical research. By forging long-term collaborations with medical scientists and physicians, and by leveraging our engineering innovations in spectroscopy and functional nanoparticles, we are developing optical diagnostics, prognostics, and treatment response monitoring platforms for infectious, metabolic, and oncological conditions. My seminar today tries to weave together some aspects of economics and cultural and societal trends in the precision medicine space along with some observations about the technologies we are developing and how they can have an impact on the future of healthcare. And hopefully that sets the stage for an engaging conversation to follow. So what's the main problem that we are addressing? At the 35,000 foot level, healthcare is in a crisis today. The costs are unsustainable. There must be a change. It is inevitable. Either we are already in the transformation or it's coming very soon. One critical aspect of the new model to fix healthcare is to offer targeted therapeutic alternatives that requires a better understanding of the individual pathobiology. 
Precision medicine is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle factors for each person. This approach will allow doctors and researchers to predict more accurately which treatment and prevention strategies for a particular disease will work in which individual. And it's a stark contrast to the one-size-fits-all approach in which disease treatment and prevention strategies are developed for the average person with very little consideration for the different differences between individuals. The question, therefore, is how do we do that? Certainly, genomics has been widely touted. But another area at the forefront of precision medicine is digital health technology. Digital technology moves us in the direction of understanding each patient and away from the current practice of defining health in ways that honestly makes very little sense to many of us. With the goal of incentivizing diagnostics over therapeutics, uh, we are developing biosensors that could come to define this precision medicine space and ultimately provide a far better measure of your own health. Now, what is this all doing as far as innovation is concerned and where do we stand? So it's quite interesting. Digital health is broadly sort of encompassing a variety of new technologies that are going into healthcare, right? The innovation and disruptive technologies have been remarkably stimulated over the last, uh, actually over the last, if you see this particular uh, graphic, over the last uh, uh, whatever number of years since the uh, first Affordable Healthcare Act in the US kicked in in 2011, and there's been, uh, since that time, almost a six and a half fold increase in venture funding. So we're now at about $6.8 billion. That's actually 2018 numbers in venture funding. And the growth's almost uh, two and a half, six and a half times, as I said. The average deal size, if you see, has also increased by nearly two fold. So this is a very, very interesting trend. And with all the money that's going into disruptive technologies and potential digital health solutions. And you might wonder where are the what are these technologies and where is all the money going? And it sort of breaks down into six major areas. Of course, there's a really significant component in tools for engaging consumers in a way, in a better way, uh, with healthcare, with the healthcare system. But you look at this me two major major areas. These are directly relevant to the kind of things we are doing in wearables and biosensing, in personal health tools and tracking devices. So just in the uh, wearables and biosensing area, there are about 720 million people across the globe using these wearables and projected to be one, more than 1.1 billion in 2022. That's a mind boggling number. Clearly people believe that there is a, a lot of invaluable information that's coming from this. Not sure that's the reality just yet. I think we need much more information content and more molecular contrast embedded in these technologies, but the trends are clearly there and the money is obviously going into these disruptive technologies in a way that it's never really been going before. In this context, our own expertise and interests lead us to harnessing Raman spectroscopy. In my opinion, and that of many others, Raman spectroscopy is poised to usher in a new era in clinical diagnostics. As a field, it continues to experience tremendous growth for several reasons. Continued development of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is the photonic probe of molecules and materials, progress in the fabrication of nanomaterials and nanostructures, Increased sophistication and design of the design and control of ultra fast pulses for nonlinear Raman processes and dramatic improvements in machine learning, as some would call it data sciences. All of this has meant that Raman spectroscopy and related modalities continue to find new application in data fields such as therapy response monitoring in forensics and pharmaceuticals in art conservation and archaeology. Naturally, we would like to capitalize on these advances. More broadly, our research interests, as I spoke about earlier, reside in engineering innovation at the interface of biophotonics, nanomaterials, and machine learning. One of our main workhorses is Raman microscopy, which serves as this bridge between chemical and morphologic analysis at the cellular and tissue levels. Here, I show you the first compositional maps uh, that we were acquired in our laboratory of hemoglobin and the malaria pigment hemozoin in live red blood cells infected by the plas malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. What's interesting is this actually, because these are maps recorded in live erythrocytes, it offers fresh insights into the formation and packaging of hemozoin that has important implications for drug development. We're also deeply engaged in the development of surface enhanced Raman technology or SIRS that can offer rapid, accurate, and convenient measurements of blood-based biomarkers, as well as perform single cell analysis. 
On the left, you'll see we create these mechanical trap-based platforms and ultra-thin graphene nanoparticle hybrid skin for capture and 3D molecular profiling of single life cells. I'm going to be talking a lot more about that in a few slides. On the right, you see a furin-targeted magnetic resonance or Raman detectable nanoprobe that we reported last year in Nature Materials, which allows imaging of tumor aggressiveness, drug accumulation, and therapeutic response. So why Raman? In biology, imaging is a major driver of discovery. Richard Feynman had once famously said, it's very easy to answer many of the fundamental biological questions. You just look at the thing. 60 years later, dramatic improvements, particularly in fluorescence imaging, have, allow us to visualize increasingly smaller structures, view specific molecules inside cells and tissues, and study their dynamics. Yet, labeling may perturb the function of a molecule and limits the capacity of discovery as it is applicable only to known species. But you have to wonder, could we perform the same quantitative imaging without using any labels whatsoever? Raman microscopy, which uses inelastic light scattering to probe vibrational modes of molecules, enables multiplex chemical fingerprinting in live unstained biological samples. Hence, in our various research programs, we seek to leverage this emerging approach for single cell analysis, for spectral pathology, and for monitoring treatment response slash resistance. As you are likely aware, Raman spectroscopy is a fundamental form of molecular spectroscopy that is widely used to investigate the structures and properties of molecules via their vibrational transitions. What makes Raman spectroscopy stand out is its exquisite molecular specificity. Here I show you, for no good reason, actually there is one, uh, the Raman spectrum of cholesterol that exhibits these characteristic uh, steroid ring vibrations, as well as a number of very sharp bending and stretching modes. Raman spectroscopy, of course, has come a long way in the last decade and a half. Several biomedical applications of Raman spectroscopy have been reported. For instance, a recent investigation in science translational medicine reports on live local detection of cancer cells in the human brain. This Raman probe enabled detection of the previously undetectable diffusely invasive brain cancer cells in patients with grade 2 to grade 4 gliomas. Clearly, this is not, not the Raman spectroscopy of a couple of generations back. So for many of our investigations, we use Raman spectroscopic imaging because it does not use dyes or does not require dyes or imaging probes, allowing us to probe the composite biomolecular information rather than interrogating a small set of suspected molecules. It also offers real-time information in a non-perturbative manner, requires minimal sample preparation, and does not use radiation. All that being said, the work that I'm going to talk about today uses surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. While we love the molecular specificity of Raman, the problem with it is that you only get a handful of photons to work with. SIRS is a surface-sensitive technique that enhances Raman scattering of molecules absorbed on rough metal surfaces or on nanostructures. The degree of enhancement primarily depends on the localized surface plasmons on the noble metal nanoparticles. Because excitation of the LSPR, as you can see here, i.e. the uh, coherent delocalized electron oscillations, lies at the heart of SIRS, our improved and continuously improving ability to control the surface properties has transformed SIRS from a somewhat esoteric phenomena to a reliable analytical tool. Indeed, nanoparticle enhanced Raman assays have re recently exceeded fluorescence detection limits and that of conventional assays while being quantitative over a wide range of probe concentrations, providing a potential opportunity to quantify spectroscopically multiple epitope concentrations in very small volumes. The specific work I want to discuss today is in the context of single cell analysis. Single cell analysis has become particularly important in the elucidation of biological functions in light of the emerging consensus of cellular heterogeneity even within an isogenic cell population. That is, even if the cell population has the same genetic origins, there is marked cellular heterogeneity that is observed. However, cellular heterogeneity is missed by population analysis as classical method only reports the mean expression level of a bulk cell population. Think Western blots. That's the necessity for single cell analysis. Our work in this area is directly motivated by a long-standing collaboration with the Hopkins Medical School in understanding organotropism in metastatic breast cancer. 
Understanding metastatic progression remains challenging in part due to a rudimentary knowledge of molecular adaptations that allow for the cancer to thrive within different tissue types. As an aid to deciphering this divergence, we and others have established isogenic metastatic breast cancer cell lines from organ explants using an orthotopic xenograft mouse model. Our collaborator has found strong evidence that these cell lines are actually distinct biological entities showing different growth patterns and critically marked differences in their drug sensitivity. So you can see the MDMB231 uh, breast cancer cells, the parental cells, as well as the ones that metastatize to the lung are pretty responsive to paclitaxel, but the ones that metastatize to the brain, not as much. We reason then that an in-depth understanding of such divergences requires single cell analysis platforms that can systematically catalog the molecular profiles from the cell populations and analyze their interactions with external stimuli such as drugs. To this end, we have long envisioned that an ideal single cell analysis platform would combine the high throughput efficiency of flow cytometry, pattern microfeatures for biomolecular analysis, and 3D manipulation precision of optical tweezers. Together with the Gracias Lab at Johns Hopkins, we worked and reported on such a platform, a molecular mirror, well, almost. This is a new shell-based spectroscopic platform that we call Mechanical Trap Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, MT search for capture and 3D molecular profiling of the plasma membrane of single live cells. We first fabricate arrayed single cell grippers, as you see here, composed of biocompatible silicon monoxide and silicon dioxide. The energy required to actuate these grippers is derived from the release of residual stress in these 3 to 27 nanometer thick films. So no active components, no wires, no tethers, nothing of that sort. Next, by leveraging the functionalization of the inner surfaces of the mechanical traps with plasmonic gold nanostars, as you can see in this cartoon, and by exploiting the conformal contact with the cell membrane, our platform enables non perturbative acquisition of SIR spectra of the plasma membrane constituents. We selected here these two silicon based oxides, as I mentioned, for our single cell grippers for their biocompatibility and notably for the self curling properties. As you can see here, the grippers are fabricated with flexible pre stressed uh, bilayer hinges, like so. Uh, the pre stressed bilayer hinge was constructed from E beam evaporated thin films of silicon monoxide and silicon dioxide, the SiO-SiO2 combination provided a sufficiently small radius of curvature for single cell grippers with radii as small as 750 nanometers. The rigid segments here, uh, like so, uh, were formed from thicker films of E-beam evaporated SiO. The grippers themselves can be fabricated in a wide range of sizes and shapes for capturing different objects of interest with a high degree of tunability. We were able to fabricate grippers with a 10 micron to 70 micron tip to tip size. What does that mean? With a 10 micron tip to tip size, we are capable of capturing red blood cells. With 70 microns, well, we can capture anything we really want. See, more importantly, since the films are optically transparent, the cells captured by the grippers can be readily observed using optical microscopy, as you can see in these images here. The scale bars here are 10 microns. So we then set out to validate two important capabilities of the MT search platform, namely the ability to measure molecular signatures of an entrapped object and B, the capability for dynamic in situ measurements. For these experiments, we used Janus like microbeads with spatially distinct molecular surfaces, as you can see in this cartoon inset here. One hemisphere of the microbeads was coated with a thin gold layer and the then functionalized with nitrothiophenol or NTP. The resultant spatial map, as you can see in this image, clearly indicates that the surge signal of NTP is much stronger in the selectively functionalized hemisphere compared to the other one, uh, as expected. Based on the stack of 2D spectroscopic images that we collected using our confocal Raman microscope, we generated a 3D Raman map, or should I say we reconstructed a 3D Raman map of the distribution of NTP on this microbead which closely resembles, as you can see, the gold pattern observed in the corresponding SEM image. In a separate set of measurements, we also observed the temporal decay of the surge intensities 
recorded from the entrapped Janus microbeads in the presence of oxidants because, of course, it cleaves the NTP. The ability to differentiate between the decay profiles for the two oxidants reflects the quality of the in situ dynamic measurements here. Now, while the empty search platform presents unique and very interesting possibilities, and really our imagination is the only limitation, one of the potential drawbacks of biosensors based on 2D rigid substrates is that they're definitionally incapable of conformally wrapping a soft or irregularly shaped 3D biological sample, such as a cancer cell or a pollen grain. Besides the folding force of the grippers deforms or can deform the encapsulated cell, disturbing its native biomolecular state. We have therefore recently engineered an ultra thin graphene nanoparticle hybrid screen, as you can see here, that is thermally responsive and can be triggered to self fold and wrap around 3D micro objects in a conformal manner owing to its superior flexibility. Graphene provides an atomically thin monolayer structure with good chemical inertness, should I say excellent chemical inertness, biocompatibility, and extremely low bending rigidity. Here, graphene is combined with silver nanocubes, like so, to permit strong plasmonic enhancement. You can see the nanocubes here too. The other critical piece here is the grafting of the PNIPM brushes on the graphene that endows it with a unique temperature responsiveness and therefore its self-folding capability. So we characterize first the optical properties of the hybrid skin and its precursor films using UV vis spectroscopy. The pristine graphene, as you can see, is highly transparent with transmittance above 85% across a wide range of wavelengths. And even after surface functionalization, the film remains highly transparent with just slightly reduced transmittance. After coating with uh, silver nanocubes, with a high density of silver nanocubes, there are prominent absorption features here at 400 and 600 nanometers, as you'd expect, 400 and 600, uh, which correspond with the LSPR peaks of silver nanocubes. The Raman spectra of different concentrations of rhodomain 60 or R60 deposited on the surface of the patterned skin demonstrates its nanomolar detection capability with an estimated enhancement factor on the order of 10 to the power 8. Raman spectral maps uh, or peaks from the PNIPM brushes have negligible intensity as compared to those of the analyte, and th thus we do not expect interference with the surge mapping. An additional attractive feature, as you can see here, is that we can use both the density and the spatial distribution of the plasmonic nanoparticles on the skin. This panel here shows um, SEM images of the dumbbell-shaped, right? You can see here the dumbbell-shaped skin with plasmonic nanoparticles. This panel provides SEM images of the dumbbell-shaped skin with 750, um, 1,000 and 1,800. So 750,000 and 1,800 silver nanocube per micron square. A higher density of silver nanocubes results in greater surge enhancement but also increases the bending rigidity of the film, which is not desirable, of course, for self-folding. The bottom panel are SEM images of the skin with photolithographically defined line features, as you can see here, um, of silver nanocubes on the surface. The panels H and I uh, are progressively zoomed in regions corresponding to the dotted yellow squares. Uh, and here's the Raman spatial map of R6G that's deposited on the skin with patterned silver nanocube lines. So clearly, we get very strong Raman features. The self-folding process of the dumbbell-shaped skin uh, is shown here, in which the two petals right, uh, fold towards the center when heated in water to 37 degrees centigrade. The self-folding mechanism is that upon increase of the temperature above the lower critical solution temperature of the PNIPM brushes, approximately 33 degrees, the densely grafted bush layer um, undergoes significant shrinkage in volume, approximately 50%, while the graphene and the PD layer, the uh, polydopamine layer, does not shrink at all. The internal strain mismatch induces the folding of the overall structure. So what can we do with this? The low bending rigidity of the skin means that we can wrap any object with highly irregular geometry. This here shows the structure of an oxide DC pollen, which has an irregular and spiky geometry with an average size of 35 microns. It's extremely challenging, well nigh impossible for conventional rigid biosensing structures and devices to form intimate contact with such spiky microparticles. From the C and D panels, 
you can see that these uh, G, uh, graphene uh, silver nanocube skin wraps the surface of the pollen, including its spikes, and the characteristic wrinkles of the skin-like materials are formed along these edges and the bottom of the spikes. The intimate contact then allows high-resolution 3D surface chemical mapping to demonstrate the feature the surface of the pollen particle was adsorbed with R6C molecules prior to its encapsulation with this graphene skin. Here you can see the Raman spatial mapping using the 1310 wave number Rhodamine 6G peak at different planes along the z-axis. We observe that the spiky features on the pollen particle with significantly stronger intensity along the peripheral region, right? So you can see the peripheral regions really light up as compared to the internal area. So, so far so good. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you a couple of other demonstrations. Of course, our real interest here is in using the skin for multiplex 3D spatial mapping of single live cells. We've taken a couple of steps in that direction. First, we have observed that MDA, MB231 breast cancer cells adhere really well on these graphene skins. And the cell culture the temperature, 37 degrees centigrade, was sufficient to induce the folding of the temperature responsive skin, as I demonstrated earlier. Here are the corresponding bright field and the fluorescence live dead assay images. The dotted circles here um, correspond to the positions of the pattern dumbbells. Crucially, the breast cancer cells were successfully wrapped within the skin following the temperature-induced folding and were viable up to 48 hours, not 48 hours following encapsulation. The optical microscope and the immunofluorescent images here uh, show the Alexa floor, um, the, the green fluorescent antibody and the blue fluorescent DAPI, which were used against the fibronectin and DNA respectively. The images clearly indicate that the morphology of the wrapped cells and the free cells, uh, you can see here, for instance, are fairly similar, highlighting low perturbation during the wrapping process. So between this and this, we found them to be relatively similar. Uh, Finally, uh, we performed Raman measurements of the breast cancer cells wrapped inside the hybrid graphene skin. We detected strong signals from the lipids and relevant proteins on the cell membrane. In contrast, the MDMB231 cells from the bare quartz substrate did not show any discernible Raman peaks under the same experimental conditions. Moreover, when a cell was placed on a flat film, uh, on a flat graphene skin, there was limited enhancement in the Raman signal as compared with a cell wrapped inside the hybrid skin. For spatial mapping, we used two major peaks, the 1010 wave number, 1002 wave number, sorry, protein peak and the 1447 wave number lipid peak. We observed that the overall Raman intensity is strongest at the bottom Z plane, as you'd expect, corresponding to the contact region between the bottom of the cell and the hybrid skin. We attribute this observation to the fact that a soft biological cell tends to spread out at the bottom of the substrate with the largest contact area between the cell membrane and the graphene skin, therefore, forming at the bottom. There's clearly a little way to go here to optimize the substrate and create a quantitative 3D spectral mapping platform. Nevertheless, it does show promise in tackling several challenges that have impeded the ability to capture and perform in situ label-free chemical analysis of single live cells in 3D. Before I let you go here, a final teaser on heterogeneity. Remember, I was talking about heterogeneity of chemical properties. Let's talk about heterogeneity of mechanical properties within the isogenic cancer cell population. To understand potential differences in mechanical phenotypes within such isogenic cancer cell populations, we created an isogenic breast cancer cell line panel occupying the spectrum of metastatic progression by allowing spontaneous dissemination from a primary tumor xenograft in the mammary fat pad. So we subjected these three cell lines, the parental, the circulating tumor cells, as well as the ones that successfully leached the lung to different biophysical measurements, of which I want to focus right now only on the microchannel migration experiments, which shed some new insights as to why only a microscopic minority of cancer cells successfully metastatize. So here you go. Here's a sneak preview of the confined migration, microchannel migration experiments of these three isogenic cancer cells in the three by five micron PDMS microchannel with identical chemo gradients. We observed that the lung metastatic cells, as you can see, exhibit increasingly, significantly increased motility, which is not too surprising, I suppose. But remarkably, the CTCs resemble the parental cells, not as much the lung metastatic ones, indicating that extravasation is a much more selective process as compared to intravasation and even circulation. 
Such studies may pave the way for mechanotyping assays that inform an individual patient's risk of metastasis by performing the motility, by measuring and quantifying the motility potentials of the cancerous cells, while also aiding the development of patient-specific therapeutic strategies, while which focus on blocking the epigenetic changes and signaling events associated with extravasation and colonization, because those seem to be the crucial changes. With that, let me quickly uh, acknowledge those whose work forms the foundation of today's presentation. Santosh Paidi, a wonderful graduate student, and Ming Li, a former postdoc, currently a professor of material science in Central South China University, have done much of the heavy lifting for the studies I mentioned today. Of course, our collaborators have made significant contributions to our studies. David Gracias, in particular, has spearheaded much of the work on single cell analysis platforms. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all our funders for their generous support. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Yes. Any questions? Please, if there are any questions, um, we'd be very glad to take any questions. So if not, I have a question. So, so basically, these nanoparticles that you form, like the nanocubes that you form on the surface, can they aggregate also? Like, you know, how do you keep their them from aggregating and, and essentially, you know, that would disturb their surface plasma resonance behavior on yeah. top of that. It's a great question. I mean, in general, I think uh, one of the problems of performing surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, or really for any kind of morning enhanced measurement, is how do you keep the nanoparticles from irreproducibly and uncontrollably aggregating? Right. Um, in fact, uh, that's been one of the central concerns for a very long time, which has led to the theorization of the so-called surge uncertainty principle. Right. I mean, you can get great enhancement but little control, and you can get great control but little enhancement. So you kind of marry those two and solve that problem. Um, so I think that's a very difficult question. What we have tried to do is in these particular cases. So let's look at I talk about four, but let's look at these uh, vacuum skin for a moment. So these silver nano cubes are deposited on a graphene skin. Uh, so first we have the CVD graphene, then we have surface functionalization, then we have another second graphene layer, so that there's pristine contact between the graphene layer and the silver nanocubes. So when the silver nanocubes are deposited, there's almost no chance here that the cells actually move them about. So we've tried and tested these with spiky pollen particles or with much more, um, as I said, rigid microparticles, and we don't move the nanoparticles around at all here. Even in the case of where we have, uh, let's go back a little bit, um, these plasmonic gold nanostars, which are uh, somewhat uh, more randomly soon about, if I can call it that, uh, on these silicon, oxide, silicon, mon uh, silicon monoxide, silicon dioxide uh, substrates, here we don't really have the same degree of control that we have on the silver nanocube. But what we do is we try to ensure that we have a certain density overall of the distribution so that they don't seem to act. I mean, they, they were plastered together later. So what you really need to control is your fabrication process to ensure that you have a certain density. So for example, if you have higher density here, you get higher enhancement, but then there are other issues. For example, potentially the nanostars are not fitting properly on the silicon monoxide, silicon dioxide substrate, they could be internalized, right? And if they, Cells start internalizing them, well, lo and behold, in 24 hours, not let, leave alone 48 hours, the cells would potentially be dead. And we don't want them dead because we want to monitor the cells for a long period of time after we capture the cells, right? That's one right. of the features of this kind of a platform. So um, I think uh, there are obviously, um, you know, nuances and layers to be, uh, to be tackled in this particular problem, part of which is getting them not to internalize, uh, not the, getting the cells not to internalize these nanoparticles, but we haven't encountered too much problem because these are pretty rigidly put on the substrates and they're going to cluster together. If, however, this was colloid nanoparticle solution, then all bets are off and they would come to, you know, kind of cluster together easily, predictably and uncontrollably. Right, right, right. I think I think that answers it. And how do you, like, when you drop the particles on the substrate, on the graphene, at that point also, they don't, you know, like, basically you know, aggregate? Yes, yeah, so, so there's a couple of 
ways of doing this. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, there's this usual uh, set off. I mean, uh, kind of. Uh, you always do bottom up at bottom up or top down, right? I mean, so there, there's possibilities of doing certain sort of elaboration or top uh, CBD, for instance, uh, or you could have the uh, be put together using um, uh, bottom up techniques, uh, wet lab, wet chemistry techniques, where, for instance, you have the polydopamine, which we also put over here, and therefore that kind of grinds pristinely to the graphene layer because while the DNA and PF brushes are good. If I only had contact between this and the super nanocubes, I would a little bit of a bother because I just want to ensure that I have good coverage between the graphene and silver nanocubes. There. Um, sure. So the top of doing that, uh, the more the more challenging task here really is to ensure that we can get the full right, which is accomplished using this DNIPM process. Uh, sure. The silver nanocube deposition is fairly standard. There's, uh, there's no rocket right. science for accomplishing on that on that end. Uh, sure. But then, I mean, of course, this. Other question is, can you get other shapes? Uh, I mean, here I'm just showing a very simple dumbbell shape because it's easy to fold around this kind of uh, right around this uh, point. But then you could get, you could potentially argue, let's have a box structure where you get uh, bending or folding across the various faces, right? So there's various faces which come up and fold around that. So we've done some experiments using other kinds of shapes also on that. Excellent. I think that completely answers. And these were CBD grown graphene or these were exfoliated? No, these were CBD grown. That's a great. I mean, it's a good question in the sense that I haven't actually uh, uh, tested a lot of exfoliated graphene. No, no reason we can't make it work, but these were CBD graphene. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ishan. Yeah. Thanks for a wonderful talk. And I just wanted to add that you did your VTEC from IIT Kharagpur. I think yeah. I mentioned IIT Delhi. So I just wanted to clarify before moving to MIT, Ishan had done his VTEC from IIT Kharagpur. And a wonderful talk by Ishan Berman. And uh, are there any other questions? If not, we'll move to our next speaker. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one quick question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's a nice, nice talk. A very important work. I just ask one question. of the work you have done for cell lines, right? Cell lines. And yes. is it possible to use this technology and for uh, uh, tumor margin detection during intraoperative procedure? Yeah, uh, that is very, very, very challenging. Yeah. Another great question because we do a lot of work on tumor margin assessment using Raman spectroscopy, but not using surface enhanced Raman, but just generally using uh, Raman and other optical uh, tools. So our own vision, you know, I mean, this is very far fetched and it's going to sound like a moonshot, which it is, mm. is ultimately some of this can be uh, performed uh, in situ and perhaps even in vivo. We think of these almost as the surgical micro robots that can go inside, right? right? excise a little bit of the tumor and that can then be analyzed as such so we haven't actually tried it on uh, tumor margin assessment or for tumor margin assessment on on a chunk of tumor but potentially that's where the greatest use is because that's where you'll see a lot of tumor heterogeneity across mm -hmm. the kind of the field of transition from malignant to uh, apparently normal tissue but which is not normal you know there's biochemical transformation happening biomolecular transformation even if it's morphologically appears or seems to be normal so certainly it's an area of interest for us uh, but there are there are certain challenges in us getting there yet but the cell line is what we are trying right now so we do dissociate from the tumors tumors right uh, so the next step is right now we have done with cancer cell lines the next step is actually taking tumors, dissociating the different set, set of cells from there, and then putting it together with these kinds oh, of uh, uh, really? uh, single cell analysis platforms, right? Yeah. Oh, thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there, is, there is one question in the chat box, uh, Professor Ranuch. And this one. Okay, chat box. So, how, so the question I'm reading is how metastasis in brain in the physical yeah. morphology is different from other types of cancer cells or yeah. other sites different despite the presence of lymphatic system in the brain. So uh, while I'm not an expert in cancer metastasis alone, what we've seen along with a lot of collaborators, and you can actually go and talk about this with a lot of oncology experts, is that what happens is for a very long period of time, I mean, for uh, it used to be imagined that 
you know the primary tumor the primary tumor cells really are an implant in these various uh, atmospheres or milieu if you will in the brain in the lung in the liver and so on and so forth but what's now increasingly becoming evident and there's a wide uh, variety of literature that's reported uh, stating the same that as it goes to the different locations it tends to morph in various ways including their epigenetic changes right of course and it changes from a molecular standpoint it changes from a metabolic standpoint because different environments have um, uh, different metabolic capabilities and so when the cells go into these different environments they need to mute mutate is not the right word but they need to morph in certain ways in order for them to survive and even thrive within those organ systems which is why you'll see for example when breast cancer actually metastasizes there is a certain pattern to the metastasis it for example preferentially metastasizes to the lung and then to the brain then to the liver and so on and so forth it's not a random pattern of metastasis so metastasis in the to the brain of breast cancer is distinct in its physiological morphology from when you get for example lung cancer cells metastasizing to the brain there is a lot that's unknown at this point in time both in terms of the physiology or in terms of physiology metabolism function characteristics molecular properties we just trying to study a few different things the ones we've started include only breast cancer right now but hopefully going beyond uh, we'll study a few other kinds of metastases and provide a little bit more insight on that so hope that gives you a little bit of an overview or an answer to that question thanks ishan for for answering that question and thank you are there any other questions If not, I think we'll move to our next speaker, and I would like Professor D. S. Mehta, our co-chair, to introduce um, Dr. Yeah. Professor Murugeshan. Yeah. Anus, Anus, go ahead. Yes, Please introduce him. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll introduce. Just one second. I'll introduce Professor Murugeshan Vadake Matsum. So, Professor Murugeshan Vadake Matsum is with the Center for Optical and Laser. Engineering Coal at Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. He has more than 25 years of professional experience, and his basic background is in physics and optics with a strong interdisciplinary research expertise and interest in the areas of nanoscale optics and biomedical optics. He has 22 patents or 12 innovations that are either filed, patented, or assigned to MNCs and that have attracted significant amount of innovation and potential industry funding. He has published 195 papers in archival journals and more than 150 conference proceeding papers. He is an associate editor of two leading SCI index in national journals such as Optical Engineering and IJO, and also in the editorial board of NPG publication. He has guest edited in national optics journal issues, apart from being a reviewer for many leading optics journals. He was awarded you know, several, he was given several awards you know, such as um, you know, like basically the erudite fellowship, the chair fellowship, eminent scholar positions at leading institutions, and he has achieved many recognitions in his career, uh, which includes the Fellow of the Institute of Physics in UK, the Dodd Fellowship in Germany, and Singapore Prime Minister's Technology Challenge Award, TCT Exchange Fellowship, MEXT Visiting Researcher in Japan, and Rolls-Royce Innovator Award, to name a few. And so he's currently serving as the director of the Center for Optics and Laser Engineering, COAL, and deputy director of the Photonics Institute at NTU. So we'd like to welcome Professor Murkation to ICWE. Thank you, Professor Murkation, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction, uh, Professor Anuj. Let me just uh, open this. Is it uh, visible now, the slides? Is it okay now? Yes, yes, it's completely visible. Thanks. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, okay. Uh, um, very good day to you all. Um, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank Professor Joby Joseph as well as uh, Professor Anuj for inviting me to deliver this talk uh, at this conference. The title of this talk is actually coined as Multimodality Imaging. Resolution Enhancement and Effect of Nanoscale uh, Contrast Agents. I'm actually from the Center for Optical and Laser Engineering, which is one of the uh, seven active research centers 
uh, in the Photonics Institute at the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. <clears throat> the major uh, research area that uh, my group uh, specific, specifically focus upon is uh, uh, are on nanoscale optics, engineering metrology, and diagnostic biomedical optics. In nanoscale optics, we uh, use uh, physics optics concepts for um, mainly writing micro uh, uh, to nanoscale features, which, use, which we use for uh, various engineering applications, um, uh, such as uh, interferometric lithography applications uh, for, um, you know, for different, uh, 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 different template fabrication for biomedical applications, etc. In the case of engineering metrology, uh, we mainly uh, look into develop uh, next generation uh, metrology tools, mainly uh, to meet the uh, technological needs of the fourth industrial revolution, focusing on the aerospace industry, as well as the marine industry, to be specific, uh, based on the recent research that we have been pursuing, which include, uh, we, we are developing uh, um, very high resolution crop-based schemes for uh, uh, you know, uh, measuring surface roughness, of uh, next generation uh, engine, aircraft engines, as well as uh, large area curved surfaces, uh, which are otherwise very difficult to uh, uh, do the surface evaluation. Especially due to shiny surfaces, uh, the problems associated with the shiny surfaces, as well as the problems associated with the 3D printing structures. We also do uh, you know, develop hyperspectral imaging, but hyperspectral imaging was mainly uh, developed for biomedical applications, uh, but we were using that for biometrology uh, as well as uh, corrosion monitoring applications as well. The third important, uh, uh, you know, the, the specific application area that we have been working on uh, was on diagnostic biomedical optics and nanobio-optics in which uh, we were looking to develop, uh, you know, uh, different optical schemes as well as instrumentation, um, you know, um, uh, uh, instrumentation and devices for uh, early diagnosis, diagnosis of diseases such as, uh, uh, you know, colon cancer at a very early stage, the breast cancer diagnosis, something like, uh, you know, something like a pregnancy type, uh, you know, kits we are trying to develop. And the re uh, recent past, we have been developing uh, very high resolution imaging, non contact imaging uh, uh, protocols and devices uh, such as this Goni Open, which we developed quite recently, which is in the commercialization pathway for the ocular image, mainly to look into uh, the angle uh, for managing glaucoma patients. We're also developing uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Basel B microscope uh, for such biomedical applications, as well as to uh, you know, help the clinicians while doing the surgery, especially, especially to uh, you know, look into the area uh, that are opaque when they're actually inserting the needle, we actually uh, developed an imaging around opaque obstacles, uh, some probes as well. Very recently, we have been developing very high resolution props for, uh, uh, you know, individually as well as uh, sequentially and simultaneously, uh, you know, exciting uh, cells or organelles, uh, uh, you know, using a specially developed uh, fiber optic prop for optogenetics application. And this last one is actually extremely high resolution uh, imaging while using far field imaging. That means that uh, with the low NA numerical aperture objectives, we are able to still get a very good resolution about 500 nanometer down to 300 nanometer spatial resolution. So today's talk mainly uh, focus on this uh, diagnostic biomedical optics, but the major uh, uh, you know, focus of today's topic is actually on the high resolution um, uh, multi-modality imaging and the role of contrast agents in such bioimaging applications. Uh, let, let us just uh, go through this, uh, but we will be mainly focusing on the uh, ocular imaging as well as the colon uh, and cancer diagnosis in this talk due to the benefit of uh, time. So the overview of this talk uh, can be actually, um, um, you know, start from this. We all know that the medical imaging, especially when we are doing the diagnostic medical imaging, it has seen very challenging, uh, uh, you know, trying to come up with uh, multimodality, whether it is dual modality or multimodality imaging for implementing better diagnostic procedures as well as the uh, therapeutic for the recent past. The basic uh, reason has been uh, the, the changes in the tissues at a very early stage. If you want to diagnose this disease at a very early stage, generally it is, uh, uh, you know, these changes are very subtle. And not only it is uh, subtle, it is uh, many a time, it actually uh, occur beneath the surface layer. 
So most of the time, uh, the conventional types of medical imaging may not be able to detect these changes that easily. Uh, not only that, each imaging modality has its own advantages as well as limitations. And one cannot actually fit one single modality for all diagnostic applications, which we, uh, uh, we might be already knowing that sometimes we have to go through very many diagnostic procedures before we really do a confirmation of the disease uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, um, as far as the clinicians are concerned. So this actually uh, necessitate for the uh, for developing a multi or hybrid modality uh, imaging uh, protocol or system or uh, such platforms. However, uh, uh, combining such uh, different modality, uh, though overcome uh, many of the limitations, it normally associate with uh, uh, certain challenges. And these challenges actually is going to be the uh, talk of I mean the focus of this uh, talk today focusing on one, uh, two such uh, uh, areas that uh, we have been uh, you know, working in the recent past during the last five, six years. And, uh, and uh, in such a situation, what actually uh, some of this uh, uh, nanomaterial uh, you know, constructs can actually help us in subduing those limitations. And that is actually the overview of this talk. And let us actually uh, uh, you know, uh, briefly overview this. Uh, from this perspective, uh, the outline of this talk is uh, by giving a brief background on this multi-modality imaging, what actually it means, uh, and the background and motivation for those individual, uh, you know, targeted uh, uh, applications, we'll be focusing on uh, multi-optical modality imaging and hybrid optical Im uh, modality imaging, looking on the photoacoustic as well as uh, <coughs> ultrasound imaging. Due to the benefit of time, I am not talking today on the hyperspectral imaging, which is initially planned. Uh, and we'll be discussing uh, also uh, um, not only on the <coughs> colon can, uh, cancer diagnosis, but also we'll be looking into the ocular imaging aspects. And when we are doing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, combined uh, platform, uh, what is actually the challenges we face and in such uh, uh, context, how actually nanoscale contrast agents or new constructs can actually help us to subdue those limitations. That is what is the uh, main uh, uh, focus of this uh, topic uh, for this uh, uh, discussion today. So medical diagnostics, if you see uh, in the recent past, uh, if you want to really summarize in, in one single slide, that is uh, this, it is almost like the game of darts. Uh, rather than actually uh, going through very many, uh, you know, diagnostic procedures using different modality, uh, in order to make clinician friendly as well as patient friendly approach, uh, the, the scientists at, as well as the clinicians are jointly working together to develop uh, uh, a methodology with which uh, one can do the confirmation and reconfirmation in one single setting. And that is actually the uh, in the multimodality imaging when we are talking about. From that perspective, uh, the recent definition that is given uh, in about 2016 for multimodality imaging is any form of technology aiming at designing, developing, optimizing, or testing a medical imaging approach or methodology combining at least two distinct uh, imaging techniques are actually uh, you know, uh, defined as a multimodal imaging. Uh, uh, by imaging techniques, when we say uh, it means any visual representation technique used to visualize structural as well as uh, uh, functional aspects of a living body. Uh, these techniques can be classified into uh, different modalities based on magnetic, optical, ultrasound, X-ray, nuclear imaging, and some of the uh, methodology or modality that we are going to discuss today. However, the technology is aiming at monitoring physiological parameters such as temperature, electrical activity, et cetera, excluded from this uh, kind of uh, definition that is multimodal imaging. It also span uh, uh, you know, into the translational imaging umbrella where we use uh, not only to take this uh, developed uh, methodology or uh, a setting uh, you know, from the you know, lab uh, or the chair side uh, to the clinician bedside approach, we normally uh, use contrast agents, uh, image processing methods, devices, and all this comes under the translational imaging. So both translational imaging and this uh, uh, different modality all comes under this multimodality imaging when we actually combine them together. However, uh, if you are telling uh, broadly you want to classify these different uh, uh, multimodality imaging, we can actually classify them as uh, dual modality or bimodal approaches or multi-modality. Uh, uh, we will be actually discussing multi-optical modality imaging, you know, one such system today, as well as hybrid optical uh, imaging. In hybrid optical, we use one optical and one, at least one non-optical approaches. And we can also, we will be also doing a lot of non-optical using MRI PET as well as 
optical imaging. But today's discussion, we will be mainly focusing on multi-optical and hybrid optical approach. So in the case of multi-optical uh, uh, modality imaging, let us just uh, uh, take uh, uh, the example of uh, uh, colon cancer diagnosis. In the case of colon cancer diagnosis, uh, the uh, biggest advantage is that if the clinicians or the doctors can actually diagnose this at a very early stage, the survival rate is very, very uh, high. If you look into these different classifications, such as um, you know the Duke's classification or even TNM classification, you can see that if you can actually uh, you know uh, diagnose this uh, uh, disease in the, uh, when it is in the B1 or A, the survival rate is very high. That is the uh, advantage actually we have. However, many a times due to the uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, you know the procedures that is available in every countries. Uh, when the patients actually approach the doctor, it is too late. However, uh, what actually now the uh, thought process is that uh, can we actually diagnose this kind of uh, uh, diseases at a very early stage? But at this very early development stage, many of these uh, you know um, features or signatures are actually very weak and they're very subtle and many a time it's below the surface. And how we can actually uh, uh, you know overcome these uh, limitations? And that is where this uh, particular uh, uh, section of this talk comes. So we actually developed a multi-optical modality imaging, ma uh, mainly for endoscopic applications. Uh, in this talk, we focus on the, uh, detecting the uh, you know polyps uh, and to check whether they are cancerous uh, or benign, mainly uh, from the uh, cecum to the rectum. Okay, that is actually we are trying here, and this uh, particular uh, approach, uh, trying to first to go inside the well that is uh, uh, in in the in the GI tract and look into that, identify the suspicious region, and we try to localize, and then after localization, without uh, excising the tissue for biopsy, while doing the interrogation itself, whether we can actually uh, confirm whether this is a benign, this suspicious region, or the identified region is benign or cancerous. And that is actually the uh, uh, sum of this, uh, uh, um, summary of this particular uh, uh, imaging, or multi-optical modality imaging. Basically, we uh, you know we use uh, three different uh, concepts embedded in one system. Let us actually uh, go through this uh, uh, um, system. Uh, if I uncover the, uh, the, the the developed system, it actually looks like this: the lab prototype. Uh, there is um, I, it has got actually uh, three modalities. One is actually the normal imaging modality, which is uh, generally that you can see with any endoscopic system. But this can only, uh, you know, detect uh, protruding polyps, which are actually uh, much bigger in size. But if you are going for the subtle changes, uh, that you have to look for the early stage, uh, you know, growth. But the growth can be protruding as well as a flat dysplasia. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, you know, detect such a thing uh, with the normal endoscopic uh, approach. Okay, so. We have actually developed another modality based on uh, speckle correlation, which we uh, coined as a biospeckle modality. Okay, and then once we identify this, we are, during the interrogation itself, we, we check whether this is um, cancerous or not. And uh, the, the distal end of the probe actually looks like this. Uh, there is uh, two illumination channel, and then there is an imaging channel actually inside. And let us uh, just go to this uh, uh, in detail. The uh, the three diagnostic uh, modality, as I told you, there actually is a normal imaging modality, uh, which is uh, you can see in any endoscopy procedure. The biospeckle modality uh, work based on the correlation of the speckle patterns as well as the speckle pattern in the in the programs. And uh, in order to uh, you know identify the uh, the such small minute growth which are of the size of one mm to three mm, and also to uh, visualize how it looks like. And then uh, we also, because many of our tissue fluorophores can actually give out, uh, uh, you know, naturally occurring uh, fluorophore emission, fluorescence emission, and uh, these emissions will be tapped on, and this autofluorescence will be looking either based on its intensity, phase, or lifetime to decide whether these growths are really cancerous or benign. And the system actually looks like this. You can see that uh, uh, there is a, a, a light source. Of course, we use a tunable laser. And it is split into two, and you can see that these are the two illumination channels using a, a normal optical fiber uh, probe. And this is a special custom-made uh, digital lens in which there are very many channels there. Uh, the channel that are shown here, shown here is only for uh, uh, the, uh, connected to the optics, and that is there are two illumination channel and one, uh, you know, the collection channel for the imaging purposes. And there are some optics uh, uh, from the digital lens once it is outside, 
you can see that uh, there are a few optics there. And, uh, and the, what it is going to do is that uh, it can actually give you uh, the the bigger polyps. At the same time, it can also give you uh, you know the, uh, the the spectral correlation where even the small uh, growth can be identified as small king here. And uh, the fluorescence uh, uh, modality, all in one uh, one monitor, you can get it. You can get the uh, signature characterization. Looking into the signature characterization, you can actually say whether it is benign or cancerous. Now, um, in the uh, this kind of spectral uh, correlation modality, normally if you're looking into the fringe pattern-based approach, it can only show you discontinuous, uh, you know, this um, uh, uh, information that is the fringe discontinuity. If you want to actually uh, make it actually continuous and uh, we want to really get those information, whether it is in the surface layer or subsurface layers, we actually apply this image processing protocol uh, to get this uh, uh, kind of uh, information, which actually give you the contours as well as the size. And this is actually, um, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, this is based on a simulated, uh, uh, you know, uh, phantom uh, uh, tissue sample that we have done here. So this is the kind of work you can do with the multi-optical modality imaging. Currently, we are applying this on animal models as well as uh, uh, human trials in the next phase. So uh, this is multi-optical modality imaging. Now, if you look into the other modalities of the imaging, you can see that uh, in the clinics, the clinically uh, proven uh, modalities are actually X-ray, a CT, X-ray CT, MRI, fMRI, nuclear ultrasound. Uh, there are very many such uh, modalities of imaging, but many of the uh, many of those modalities are actually ionization-based uh, modalities. There are also non-ionization-based modalities, uh, which uh, uh, we can look into it. Uh, but if you look into all these modalities. And if you look into these imaging parameters, which is the focus of our, our uh, research, we can see that um, uh, we can actually uh, see that the resolution of this imaging modality are actually varying, whether you are using PET, SPECT, MRI, et cetera, you can see that the, that the spatial resolution is actually very poor compared to if you are uh, taking an optical uh, uh, you know, uh, imaging modality. Uh, uh, and that is actually, you can get uh, uh, from a few hundred nanometer to a couple of micron uh, resolution for an optical modality. But you actually, if you're looking for optical modality, you, uh, you sacrifice the depth resolution because we know that uh, there is a, a serious uh, optical diffusion limit uh, in tissues that is uh, around one millimeter. So if you want to go beyond one millimeter, such optical modality may not be the ideal one. So, but you uh, can see that if you use ultrasound imaging, you can actually get uh, millimeter to centimeter uh, depth penetration you can use uh, photoacoustic imaging. You can also get uh, millimeter to centimeter, uh, uh, you know, the penetration. But their uh, spatial resolutions are actually uh, not as good as the optical resolution. So the uh, the thought process is here is that uh, can we actually combine all these different modalities? And that is, we are actually combining optical with uh, uh, non-optical approaches. We are combining uh, multi-optical, which we have seen. Now we are going to combine, uh, you know, these three modalities: ultrasound, uh, photoacoustic, uh, as well as the uh, fluorescence imaging together and see what actually happens. Okay, and uh, this comes under the hybrid optical imaging because such hybrid optical imaging we can see that they can give structural and molecular uh, information based on the heterogeneities of this biological tissues. Uh, but it demands, uh, uh, you know, uh, the interrogation of the samples with the multiple energy sources if you are using it individually. So what we are trying to do is uh, uh, how we can actually integrate such uh, optical and acoustic energies. To perform both at photoacoustic ultrasound as well as fluorescence imaging at multiple resolution scales from the tissue surface to uh, go deep into the tissue. So this is what we are trying to do. Whether uh, we try to get uh, very high resolution fluorescence signatures as well as we try to exploit the uh, the acoustic heterogeneities based on the absorption heterogeneities that normally associated with the tissues uh, along the depth beyond uh, you know two centimeter. Uh, with a multi-scale resolution ranging from 0.5 millimeter to one micron and beyond. And that's what we're trying to do here. Let us just to go through this uh, simple uh, uh, view graph, where we can see that if you take this ultrasound imaging and the photoacoustic imaging, you can see that the resolution is in the scale, but the depth penetration is actually can reach even up to 10 centimeter. Whereas if you take the fluorescence imaging, uh, very high uh, spatial resolution, but it sacrificed this uh, penetration depth. That is basically what we have been discussing. When we combine these uh, 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 modalities, uh, what we are trying to do is by combining, we try to see that whether we can get the best of all these modalities or are we going to face any challenges?
So these are the kind of uh, uh, system that is uh, we have developed in the lab. Uh, we used, uh, uh, you know, a, a medical grade ultrasound uh, uh, system, and with the same uh, transducer arrangement, we have actually used for both ultrasound as well as photoacoustic imaging, and we integrated this with uh, a, a microscope, and uh, we uh, try to do both photoacoustic ultrasound and fluorescence imaging, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, we can uh, this. Uh, the sample, the test sample, uh, a simulator sample that we have uh, used here has got uh, uh, very um, small micro size beads, fluorescent beads that are there. And at the deeper layers, there are uh, absorption centers that you can see here at a different uh, depth scale. And uh, you can see here in the system, when you do this, you can get a very high resolution fluorescence image. You can get a very nice um, photoacoustic image as well as you can get. Uh, uh, the uh, ultrasound image, though the resolution is very uh, uh, not as good, but you can get the information from deeper layers. If you take uh, uh, the, uh, you can also do this uh, for, with an endoscopic approach using a custom fabricated image fiber bundle as shown here. Without going into the details of the instrumentation, uh, um, uh, we, I would like to actually show this uh, data that uh, we can actually get, uh, whether we are using with the uh, microscope or whether we are uh, using with this uh, uh, endoscopic approach, we can get uh, similarly very high resolution. This is a single micro bead that is actually captured here. <clears throat> and uh, we can get very high resolution uh, fluorescent image, very uh, good, uh, uh, you know, photoacoustic image as well as uh, much deeper layer uh, for uh, ultrasound image. But what is the challenge we face is very interesting. If you see this um, <clears throat> legend here, uh, each represent this represents the ultrasound, and this represents the photoacoustic, and this represents the, uh, the the fluorescence image. You can see that while there are no much compromise on the uh, the resolution aspect uh, when you are using uh, combining together, uh, the the depth penetration has been severely affected. And you can see that uh, if you take the photoacoustic imaging, it has actually reduced from 25 centimeter to 10 centimeter when you are actually combining uh, this into one setting. Okay. And uh, this is the kind of uh, challenges uh, we are facing and what we can actually do in such situation. That is the uh, challenge. In this context comes this um, nanoscale uh, contrast uh, agent and uh, uh, use of uh, uh, such a new nanoscale uh, construct. But if you look into this uh, fact sheet of this various nanoscale contrast agent, many of these optical imaging modalities these days use um, uh, you know, nanoscale contrasting agents. If you look into the optical imaging, they generally, as we know, we have seen already, they, they are generally quite good in mapping optical heterogeneities, but limited by the optical diffusion limit in tissue. And the photoacoustic imaging is very good in mapping absorption heterogeneities, and it can offer a very high, rich contrast and uh, less acoustic, uh, you know, scattering. And uh, the usual contrast agent has been uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, quantum dots, gold nanoparticles, and um, organic dyes such as ICG. While gold nanoparticles has been the gold standard for uh, uh, in this because of its bioinert uh, nature, uh, in this particular approach, uh, we have a problem because we don't want to use different laser wavelengths in one setting for uh, exciting these different uh, modes. Rather, we would like to use one uh, single image, a single wavelength, but uh, that is in the visible region because we are using the fluorescence excitation as well. So, in the but the visible region, the uh, absorption cross section of gold nanoparticle is uh, not as good. You know, uh, the, uh, it means that is, that is actually, uh, uh, you know, can reduce this, um, uh, you know, the, the photoacoustic uh, uh, signal amplitude. So in this context, we are looking for, uh, uh, you know, some new nano uh, materials, uh, which can actually really good, a very good absorption enhancement, cross-section as well as uh, amplitude enhancement. Uh, and in such cases, and also the size of the nanoparticle cannot be too large, it should be, uh, within the confined size of uh, a better, uh, uh, you know, biodistribution and tumor objects. Uh, so we have uh, done a few, few, few such uh, constructs, and uh, this talk uh, focus on mainly graphene oxide wrapping on plasmodic coastal nanohybrids as well as gold nano cages. So uh, uh, this uh, plasmodic, uh, uh, you know, uh, graphene oxide uh, uh, wrapping on uh, uh, this coastal, especially the uh, you know, the silica gold nanoparticle uh, coarsel. What is happening is very interesting. When you actually do this kind of, uh, uh, the developing such a, a graphene wrapping around the such coarsels, which is uh, silica gold nanoparticle, we have seen that uh, the absorption cross section, you can see that is uh, uh, very nicely increased 
at the desired wavelength of uh, where we can actually also use the same wavelength for uh, exciting the fluorescence emission as, as well. Okay, by uh, and it is actually following the same uh, uh, you know theoretical simulation work that we have done, and we have tried this uh, with the different approaches and different sample. And uh, uh, one of the thing you can see here, even the absorption uh, uh, you can see here uh, for the graphene oxide is uh, really uh, quite high compared to this um, uh, the normal uh, <coughs> silica gold nanoparticle or even the normal gold nanoparticle that you can see here. So this is really um, uh, can give a very good absorption enhance, en en enhancement. This is a very good work done by one of my PhD students, uh, uh, Dr. James Joseph, who is currently as a, a faculty in the University of Dundee in uh, Scotland, and uh, another uh, collaborator, Dr. CG. And they de developed this uh, nanoparticle. And uh, we tried this into the same system. And you can see that uh, compared to the previous uh, uh, scenario, the photo it has really uh, did a very good enhancement of the photoacoustic signal. It can really go much beyond 10, uh, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> 10 millimeter, and then when you can see here, uh, uh, this is millimeter. Eh? This is actually can give very high contrast, uh, uh, very high signal amplitude, acoustic signals. You can see, and you can compare th this with the gold uh, uh, nanoparticle, all uh, all the coarser that you have seen there. Okay, so this is can really uh, enhance like anything. This is uh, the advantage of uh, using such a nanoscale contrast agent. We also tried this to apply to ocular imaging uh, uh, with the, another uh, nano uh, construct, which is, um, uh, I would like to actually emphasize that uh, th in these days, uh, ocular imaging is also a very highly critical diagnostic procedures uh, for uh, diagnosis therapy and uh, various uh, analysis of the uh, you know, eye diseases. And the photoacoustic imaging <coughs> um, has been uh, fast adapt, uh, being fast adapted to this uh, ocular imaging uh, um, you know needs in the recent uh, past and uh, the it can uh, really um, it was able to really go deeper uh, layers uh, to get the relevant signatures of uh, interest and uh, here what we have done is that we found the same problem of this uh, reduction in the uh, you know the absorption uh, cross section when we are using uh, the photoacoustic imaging combining with the ultrasound imaging and we found that in this bimodal approach uh, we de uh, developed a gold nano cage. A gold nano cage. This is actually uh, a work. Uh, the development of the gold nano cage is a work by our collaborator, uh, Professor Shakti Kumar, and uh, his uh, research staff, uh, Dr. Srijit. I believe he is currently in IIT Delhi, and um, uh, they developed this gold nano ca uh, nano cage using uh, uh, this uh, microwave uh, oven approach, fast synthesis uh, synthesize approach. But what we were interested here is that we found that. Uh, the plasmonic uh, wavelength is actually shifting towards this uh, near IR. Uh, uh, when you are using this uh, silver nano cube, uh, and uh, from that, when you are making this gold nano cage, it's actually going shifting towards, which is uh, very, uh, very significant for us for this particular uh, work. Uh, where, and not only that, we found that uh, the when we increase the concentration, we found that the uh, signal amplitude, the PA signal, a photoacoustic signal amplitude also increased uh, by a large amount uh, on an average of about 40 to 50 percentage uh, uh, increment uh, we have found in the in the signal amplitude and uh, uh, this we have tried to apply into um, uh, uh, of course we first try into uh, phantom uh, this work is actually already uh, cleared the bioethics and some of the uh, research i'm showing so now you can see that we tried on uh, eye sample and uh, this is on force in eye sample and you can see that when we are using uh, 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 in different concentration, and you can see that this uh, signal at the uh, the point where we are targeting is this point at this uh, iris region, and you can see that the signal amplitude is actually enhanced like anything. We just focus on every different concentration. You can see that the variation in the signal amplitude is actually varying, and uh, we can see that the average increase in this amplitude is around uh, uh, 50 uh, percentage, 50.8 percentage, if you are looking into different samples. Uh, if you focus on this one single, uh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, image, you can see it is very clear now. This is uh, really enhanced like anything. And uh, we can actually further enhance this by um, using uh, higher uh, <coughs> frequency, uh, you know, the, the transducers as well. And we can see that uh, such work has been continuing uh, currently. So the remarks for use as, uh, as far as this uh, gold nano cage is uh, uh, based work is concerned. Yeah, it, it is acting as a very high strength PA contrast agents. 
and we are applying now this uh, into the diagnosis of uveal melanoma in fact it is proving to be a good marker for uh, uh, you know uveal melanoma, uh, melanoma uh, especially uh, in in the hybrid modality approach it can actually determine the size uh, the spread as well as the depth and location of the, uh, uh, you know this particular uh, disease related to other structures and it is uh, and we say that uh, such an approach is going to uh, help clinicians uh, for better diagnosis uh, the impact of uh, I, before concluding i would like to actually highlight that uh, there is a new uh, set of uh, fluorescent uh, uh, you know uh, enhancement uh, agents are uh, being developed such as uh, near infrared uh, um, fluorescent proteins uh, which can actually uh, give uh, emission spectra beyond 650 nanometer to the range of uh, 950 nanometer which is really going to uh, give much deeper penetration as far as uh, uh, this kind of work is concerned and uh, before concluding i just want to take this quote from uh, cia merali uh, in the nature uh, that um, it was actually for another quote that is uh, believed that uh, we will eventually be doing a whole body imaging with optical light one day in the near future because we can see that with the new new uh, uh, you know contrast enhancement agents uh, that are being developed the penetration depth is uh, going to be larger and larger we may be able to get much uh, information from the much deeper layers with that, uh, I would like to actually uh, uh, give due recognition to these uh, uh, students who are uh, working uh, for these bi various biomedical projects. And they, they are actually, um, their work is actually reported here. Uh, the major work that is uh, reported, uh, I mean, presented here, are uh, the work done by Dr. James Joseph, as well as photoacoustic imaging, and uh, um, uh, Dr. Lim Humta. I was also doing on the ocular imaging um, and uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar on the multimodality imaging. And I thank all the collaborators uh, from various medical schools uh, uh, for working very closely with this project. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you once again, Professor Joby Joseph uh, and Professor Anuj and all the IC team for uh, uh, inviting me to deliver this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Murkation, for this wonderful talk. Um, and, you know, we would uh, definitely invite questions. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please ask Professor Murkation. So if not, Professor Murkation, I had a question. Uh, so these nanoparticles, the plasmonic nanoparticles that you use, so, uh, you know, you mentioned about the core shell nanoparticles. Uh, and so, so how would the geometry of these nanoparticles affect uh, your enhancement? Did you study that in detail? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very good thing. At the moment, uh, you can see that uh, uh, you can see that the one that I have used is actually almost like a spherical shape. Uh, and uh, but our main target was uh, I'm getting some noise. Is it clear? Hello. Yeah. The the main uh, main uh, target is actually on the uh, uh, absorption cross section, and we have done another study on different uh, geometrical shape uh, uh, with a spherical, uh, with a triangular as well as uh, elliptical uh, shape, and uh, uh, we our study and it is actually published uh, uh, in Plasmonics as well as optical communications. And uh, we found that this uh, triangular shape is actually going to give you uh, much uh, better uh, plasmonic uh, enhancement. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we have to be very uh, careful here that we need to actually find a trade-off between uh, what actually we are doing. We are, if you're only looking into the plasmonic enhancement, uh, we can look into that geometry. But when we're actually putting all this together in one setting, we should be also looking into the absorption cross-section. So uh, that is uh, uh, the prime uh, thing we are looking at. And if you're looking into the absorption cross-section, we have found that, uh, you know, the, uh, this kind of uh, uh, particle, uh, it is actually giving you much uh, uh, better absorption cross-section. Uh, if you're having um, scattering centers, uh, you see that we have, uh, take, uh, we have actually shown two. One is actually in the spherical one. The other one is actually the gold nano cage, and it has got very many sharp corners. And that you can see that the, the absorption cross-section actually has been really enhanced to, to, 
uh, to to thirty to forty percent like that. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So, Manoj, can I ask one more question? One question. Please, please, sir. Please. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, Professor Murkeshan. Very nice talk, and you combining multi modality is very important for diagnosis. Thank you. And one thing I wanted to ask you that. Still, people believe for the final uh, decision have for cancer detection, for example, is done by histopathology, right? Yes, yeah. slides. So, based on your multi modality, can we really detect or parallel? Uh, I mean, is basically very fast detection without going to histopathology? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Actually, um, I would rather uh, like to say that. Uh, this is already now uh, practiced uh, in some places. Um, uh, you know, the with the Mayo Clinic, uh, um, <coughs> Maunaki has actually already uh, started developing uh, such in vivo bi um, biopsy uh, probes, uh, uh, though it is not exactly like what we are doing. Now, what is actually doing, they're still doing histo uh, uh, pathology type of uh, uh, studies. You know, uh, that when we are telling, uh, you know that in the, during the interrogation itself, the probe actually they are uh, in the probe they are actually integrating this modality also for such analysis. Uh, in the current one uh, that I have uh, mentioned to you, uh, though many people call this uh, probe these days, uh, uh, even after, after reporting this in, in the literature, they call this as one of the in vivo biopsy uh, probe. We can only tell that as yes, we can tell whether this is cancerous or not based on the fluorescent signatures in okay. terms of uh, because uh, let us just take the intensity when mm -hmm. you take the in, when you take the intensity when the uh, when the cancerous grows the uh, the concentration of this uh, naturally occurring fluorophore the endogenous fluorophore get reduced so the intensity get reduced so this is actually a very good marker so it is actually okay. can uh, it can actually replace the the conventional approach so that is one argument the other one is actually sometimes uh, the challenge here is this: many of the naturally occurring fluorophores are actually going to emit many uh, fluorescent emission, where there will be very closely spaced uh, uh, wavelength emission. In such yes. emissions, you cannot just looking into this reduction in the intensity. In such cases, your probe should be having a, uh, an approach with which you can differentiate or delineate, uh, delineate these uh, two emissions. And there comes this fluorescent lifetime approach, and that is that is exactly this. Uh, some of these commercial uh, uh, vendors now doing this. They are trying to not only use this intensity uh, delineation, but they are actually trying to use uh, phase result as well as uh, fluorescent lifetime based approach. We are also currently doing it, but we are in the midway stage. Yeah, I hope okay. I answered that question. Yes, yes, yes. I uh, thank you very much, and thank you for for your nice talk. Yes, I'm just go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, so, so, sir. Are you going to introduce Professor Paul, or should I? Excuse me. Hello. 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 Yes. Yes, yeah. uh, Professor Murugesh. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, and uh, just want to see: Are there any other questions? If there are no questions, then I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Murugesh, for his wonderful talk. And we'll move on to the next talk, uh, which you is very much, very much uh, the time. Thank you, sir, for we're coming and giving this talk. Uh, we really appreciate uh, thank you. your coming. And uh, so now the next talk is by Professor Vishnu Pal. And I'll just briefly <laughs> introduce Professor Pal. Professor Mehta, would you like to introduce Professor Pal? Okay, okay. I'll, I'll introduce Professor Pal. Oh, please. So, yes. So, uh, uh, next, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Paul. And Professor Paul is a professor of uh, currently professor at the uh, Mahindra Ecole uh, uh, Central of uh, Hyderabad, India. And since July first, two thousand fourteen, after the so he was uh, earlier in at Department of Physics, uh, head of Department of Physics also. And since you know, did PhD since nineteen seventy five from New Delhi. And he's a fellow of uh, Optical Society of America and SPIE and senior member of IEEE and honorary foreign uh, member for Royal no Norwegian Society for Science and Arts, member of OSA Board of Directors and distinguished lecturer of IEEE Photonic Society 2005-2007. Uh, 
uh, and Professor Paul has been named as 2021 recipient of the SPIE Maria uh, J. Israel uh, Educator Award. Congratulations, Professor Paul. And this, award is, this award is presented annually in recognition of outstanding contribution to optics and edu optics education and uh, by any uh, an SPIE instructor and, and, and educator in the field. And I, I remember Professor Paul also uh, received an, uh, a recognition from Optical Society of America. I do not remember the exact name of the uh, award, but a few years back he received a, a distinguished award from uh, Optical Society of America also, and for the distinct, uh, distinction in education, optics education and all that. So, uh, Professor Paul, welcome to this uh, conference, and uh, we would be very happy for your uh, you know talk, and we'll be listening. Yeah. Welcome, Professor Paul. Uh, welcome to the conference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anuj. Let me first try to share if it is working all right. Uh, what do you do in the share? I went to the share, then I click on this one, I think. Click on the slides, yes. Yeah. Is this coming? No, not yet. Ah. I can see. Is it there? Can you see my slide? Yes. 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 You can see. Okay. 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 Uh, <clears throat> first of all, let me thank uh, Anuj, the one, my former colleague at IIT Delhi, uh, for inviting me to this uh, conference. And also, uh, also my uh, colleague Dilip Mehta for uh, for you know uh, for introducing me with some <laughs> nice and kind words. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see the slides? The slide actually earlier we could see, but now not. not okay, uh, let me let me do one thing. Let me get out and just re-log it. Just hold on for a moment. Just give me a minute. Sure, sir. Uh, just give me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Join meeting. Share. Fight. Uh, not, not yet. yet. Uh, Can you see now? No, no, sir, not not yet. Not yet. Uh, just one second. What happened? <laughs> it was there. Yeah. Professor Paul, I noticed that you are logged in from two places. Uh, oh, that may be the dinner. Just one second. Oh, yeah, no, no, yes, now, now, yes, yes, now. Yeah, now you can see it, right? Yes. Some see your screen, you have to go to the PPT now. PPT, yeah. you, you can click the PPT. Okay. Yes, yes, now, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, yes, correct. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Okay, are these uh, are the fonts okay? Can you see the clearly the slide? Yeah. Yes, yes, clear, clear, Okay, clear. okay, yeah. okay. Sorry for the um, uh, delay and. Uh, ah, that's okay, that's okay. Okay, uh, I already thanked uh, Dilip for the nice introduction and a very kind introduction. So my topic, my topic of my talk would be. I think we are running short of time. Uh, guided wave photonics for media and wavelengths. So I'm not going to do really a very new results or latest results. But in very recently, we have done several works. All of those are published. Uh, it was essentially carried out by my former graduate student, Babita, along with my uh, colleague, Ravi Vasne at IIT Delhi. 
So I will be essentially reviewing those, but before that, let me introduce the topic. So they are my co-authors um, in this particular presentation. So Babita is the graduate student who has just submitted her thesis on this very particular topic. And there are some former students, Ajanta, who is now in ETA, Somnath Goth is the associate dean in IIT, IIT Jodhpur. Uh, uh, Basti is my colleague who is currently serving IIT Delhi's physics department. So outline of my talk would be something like this. In this sequence, introduction, then silicon photonics based media and optical trace gas sensors, media air polarization splitter, media air polarization rotator, uh, followed by a quick conclusion. So what is photonic? This is more for initial slides and more for uh, young research scholars in this particular field who may be working or may be listening. So photonics involve control of photons, as you know, and it is the fundamental unit of light, quantum unit of light of an elite or an electromagnetic wave in free space or in matter in terms of its generation, transmission, manipulation through modulation, signal processing, and all those uh, <clears throat> things, detection, uh, switching, amplification, and sensing. So if you do it, if you carry out this photonics of the, in the media uh, spectral region of the electromagnetic spectrum, we call this as the mid-air photonics. This is a relatively recent term which is used, like terahertz photonics in the literature. So electromagnetic spectrum is essentially, you can uh, see the electromagnetic spectrum taken from uh, internet. So VBO spectrum, you can see here in the VBO spectrum, uh, beyond the VBO spectrum, towards the red end, you get what is known as the infrared wavelength. So infrared radiation was actually <clears throat> uh, it was discovered possibly for the first time by and reported formally by an astronomer known as William Herschel in 1800. Expanded view of the IR regime, I show it in the following curve, following figure. So this is the infrared regime for the beyond, this is the ultraviolet region, this is a microwave size. <clears throat> And uh, in particular, the wavelength regime 2 to 2, 10 micrometer, notionally, that is referred to as the media air wavelength. Functionally, IR spectrum, there are several divisions or several, uh, you know, classifications of the media spectrum, but it's very notional. I mean, it's not that very, uh, very hard and fast, but near infrared like this, then there is a short wave infrared in this wavelength regime, mid, mid wave infrared 3 to 8 micrometer, Low, uh, long wavelength infrared and far infrared, 15 to 1000 micrometers. And media, uh, sorry, the length, uh, very large number of applications of the IR regime, in particular mid IR. So one could be astronomy, one could cite the example using astronomy, biological imaging, sensing, military, like for example, countermeasures against heat seeking missiles, optical frequency metrology, and <clears throat> optical tomography, and so on, molecular fingerprints in the atmosphere of different molecules. So this is an example of the transmittance of, uh, in the mid regime, in the mid regime, transmittance of different uh, molecular uh, elements, which are shown here. These are the absorbing molecule. You can see the drop in transmitters at this particular wavelength due to this particular molecule. So by monitoring the transmitters, one can sort of detect in the mid air, one can sort of detect the presence of these molecules in the, for example, in the atmosphere as a pollutant. Molecular fingerprint regime, five to 6.5 micrometers, strong absorption band for these proteins and so on. These are um, hydrocarbons, various hydrocarbons, hydrochlorides, hydrochlorides, and uh, sorry, the protein comes into 6.1 to 6.45 micrometer particularly consists of absorption lines of some of the key components of human tissues, like this uh, protease amide 1, amide 2, and so on, water molecules. If you look at an, uh, an extraterrestrial object, for example, here is a picture taken by NASA's Peter Space Telescope of Andromeda Galaxy. This is in the visual spectrum, whereas in, this is taken in the infrared light, and you can see much better resolution and much better uh, detection of the object if you carry out this observation at this particular, at this wavelength range. 
another example, this is again a NASA Hubble Space Telescope picture, visible light view. You can see it is not so clear, but if you do it in the mid and light view, you get a much, much clearer view of this uh, extraterrestrial object. Now, <clears throat> applications in biomedical, we have, this is an example, this is a very latest picture taken from science, which appeared on 14th of October. This is about uh, um, mouth heart taken in the bright field. You can see it's not so clear, but if you take it in the mid area spectroscopy, make use of this, you get much better definition of this object, microscopic object. This is a picture about his signature of the group of people here. So color bar shows how colors in the image correspond to temperature. Here is insulating and does not allow heat to escape, so it appears relatively cold. The emergence of silicon photonics, which is actually my subject topic to be discussed in the media regime in particular. But before I go over to that, I would like to share with you why it has become an extremely important field of research today. It has become extremely important because the necessity to reduce the humongous power consumption in internet traffic and cloud servers. What is meant by that, that we are having a huge explosion in internet traffic. So estimated annual global traffic, data center traffic in 2015 was about 4.7 zettabyte. And it is likely to triple to 5.3 zettabyte by 2020, according to a Cisco global cloud report. One zettabyte corresponds to about one billion terabyte. Primarily is driven by the applications ranging from social networking, streaming media to genomics driven medicine and proliferation of connected devices within the internet of things. But this increased data use comes at a cost. What is the cost? A single internet search consumes about one kilojoule of energy, according to Google, published in 2009. You may be surprised about that. Because when you skip, when you press on your keypad, the signal goes through a large number of servers and so on. And each server consumes a lot of uh, energy. And as a result, effectively, the single search, you are consuming roughly one kilojoules of energy. There is a beautiful article by David Miller from Stanford in one of the IEEE transaction journal, which you can see, uh, which you can see to find out more details about that. It is about 200 uh, terawatt hours energy is being used by data sensors annually. Many of these issues would be substantially mitigated if cables and switches were configured to communicate using photons rather than electrons on a monolithic integration of both. So this realization and the maturity of the CMOS technology whose compatibility for this integration can substantially reduce power consumption if we exploit this particular technology. So <clears throat> typical photonic integrated circuit components here, so these are delay nines which are already developed, ring resonator, waveguides, Y splitter, grating couplers, and so on, taken from this particular paper. And <clears throat> uh, what I meant to state in this particular slide is the state of the art of photonic integrated circuits and future vision. So, 10 gigabits, uh, picture one corresponds to a 10 gigabit per second channel, per channel, as a 10 gigabit per second per channel, single chip optometry transceiver pictures based on silicon on insulator. The picture B here is an Intel taken from Intel. It's an Intel's end to end silicon photonics connection with integrated lasers. And this one C corresponds to what is known as IBM's 2020 vision for 22 nanometer CMOS on chip optical interconnect that both connect electronic chips and route the data traffic. So it's an example of some of the photonic integrated circuits, the state of the art, which has already been achieved or you are about, they are about to be achieved by these big organizations. Examples of waveguides in terms of silicon photonic integrated circuits. This is an example of channel waveguide. This is a ridge waveguide. This is a uh, photonic crystal waveguide, and this is a slot waveguide. This is, uh, is a picture is taken from this particular paper. Some of you, those who work in this area, Michal, Michal is, a, is a very good friend of mine. She is a Lipson. She is a professor in Columbia University now, and she has been doing an excellent and outstanding work in this particular field. This is one of her initial papers that appeared in GLT. 
Now, <coughs> guided uh, silicon slot waveguide would be my out of these different geometries, silicon slot waveguide, or in combination with one of those that will come into the pitch in, in my following uh, subsequent slide that I'm going to, when I'm going to present our own work. So, guided this guy, silicon slot waveguide, is a high index contrast. Very narrow, small refractive index regime surrounded by two high index regimes. So this strongly confined light in a sub wavelength scale, low index region, sandwiched between two refractive index slabs, which are usually actually silica, high refractive index represented by NH, and leads to an extremely high confinement factor of the light in the slot region. How it happens? So schematically, this is the vertical example of a vertical slot waveguide and its corresponding calculation, MATLAB calculations of the confined light in the central, in the, in the narrow slot region here, and the corresponding version of a horizontal slot waveguide and its picture of the uh, confined light in the slot region. The slot waveguide was first proposed from Cornell University in a theoretical study. Now, if you look at the electromagnetic theory, then our boundary value problem as a boundary value problem, continuity of the normal component of the uh, normal um, vector, electric vector, D at the high index contrast interface requires these two should be equal in the normal component of D in the smaller refractive index regime and higher refractive index regime. If you write it in terms of the dielectric constant and the corresponding electric field, then you get an expression of this kind. You further expand it in terms of the free space directly constant and the refractive index of these two regions. Then you find that for NS much smaller than NH, NH is in the refractive index in the slot region, and NH is the refractive index in the high index regime, that is the silicon. The contrast is ES in, in the low index region is higher than NH in the high index silica by factor of n square by n square, if you transpose this to the right-hand side. Epsilon and epsilon cancels out. The ratio of n square by n square, the ns square is six for silicon silica interface. And if it is with air, for silicon air, it is 12, extremely high. When the slot width is much less than the characteristic width of the decay in the evanescent field as one by gamma s, which is, if you assume that in the decay region, electric field is e to the power varies with uh, special coordinate as e to the power minus gamma SS, as a, if it is a single one-dimensional uh, analog, then the <clears throat> E field remains high all across the slot. There's a uh, calculation made for this, for, the, for this parameters, for silicon and uh, this as in the, uh, small refractive index region is 1.46, uh, that corresponds to silica, you find that in this slot region, you get a very, very strong uh, electric field confined in this particular regime. And this is the corresponding uh, color viewpoint of the modal field confinement in that slot region. So making, uh, realizing this, we have made use of this concept of silicon slot wave, right? to detect some mid optical, as a mid optical gas, uh, configure some sensors, rather design them as a mid optical phase gas sensors. Why we got into this field is that the projected market of global industrial phase gases is about $114 billion US dollars as per a market research report which published in 2018, just two years ago. Silicon on insulator based optical sensors, which exploit evanescent field absorption sensing scheme, represents a popular platform for trace gas sensing. Importance of detecting trace gas sensing is the environmental studies, detection of hazardous presence of hazardous gases, greenhouse gases, etc., industrial leak detection, medical breath analysis, and so on. For example, detection of gases that present in exhaled breath of a patient. One can diagnose various diseases like asthma, cancer, renal failure, diabetes, etc., and monitor underlying health conditions. So this is one of our first papers, which appeared in Sensors and Actuators. This is on silicon on nitride slot or silicon on nitride slot wave right? It is a platform as as a popular or promising platform we we demonstrated for media trace gas sensing, NH3. Materials for silicon photonics 
correspond to could be any of this calcium fluoride silicon silicon dioxide sapphire silicon nitride this yellow portion corresponds to the transparency regime in terms of wavelength of these different materials these are the representation of different uh, slot waveguides different waveguides on the based on silicon and this is the old uh, the figure that i have already demonstrated i have already shown shared with you so even as in field of the slot waveguide mode interacting with the surrounding gas what it will do it will induce significant attenuation as per bear lambert's law of the environmental gas in terms of the transmitted light you get a drop in uh, intensity of the transmitted light that you can detect and that would if it is at the corresponding absorption line of the gas then you can say the gas is present in the environment by detecting uh, through transmission of light of that absorption uh, particular wavelength at which there is a strong absorption exists for that particular material or gas why is nsg gas important because its characteristic absorption peak in the terrestrial environment appears at uh, <clears throat> this appears at environment uh, uh, appears at around 3 micrometer permissible human exposure to limit of nsg is 25 parts per million for 8 hours and it substantially reduces to 15 minutes if it is about 35 ppm per minute uh, per, um, per ppm for 15 minutes if somebody gets exposed to the presence of this 50 ppm of nsg may produce immediate irritation in the eyes skin and upper respiratory tract human threshold limit is 25 ppm for 8 hours and 35 ppm for 15 minutes proposed structure to detect the presence of ammonia gas with nsg gas so a silicon air slot waveguide on a silicon nitride substrate silicon nitride has a wave uh, sorry refractive index of 1.9 and uh, this is shown here this is the structure to silicon high index regime is separated by an extremely small regime of gap of continuous which defines the slot and the calculated modeling of this and calculated confined light in the slot regime you can show the events in field in the slot region is pretty high similar to the one figure that uh, published literature that i have shown earlier so minimum detectable concentration we found out to be in terms of defining this quantity in this and this is the bear lambert's law we get and this is the confinement gamma is the confinement factor all these parameters are here epsilon is appearing in the bear lambert's law so c minimum in terms of this characteristic parameters of the sensor would be for a with a mercurium cadmium detector uh, tellurium detector in the infrared this is 10 milliwatt input power intrinsic waveguide loss if you assume to be 5 dB per centimeter absorption coefficient of the gas is this much you can this is the figure of the intensity detected nominalized intensity as a function of wavelength at the 3 micron regime you can say even up to it will also depend on the snr you can see there signal to noise ratio so c minimum is about 2 ppm and 10 ppm for signal to noise ratio of 1 and signal to noise ratio of 5 respectively so it's a pretty uh, pretty sensitive detector for nhg gas in the next one we have again sensors and actuators this was for detecting n2 a gas at the mid ir band is about 4.47 micrometer n2 is a greenhouse gas that absorbs and emits radiant energy within the thermal ir range characteristic absorption peak is at 4.47 micrometer largely responsible for depletion of stratospheric ozone long term exposure may cause adverse effects on reproductive systems audio visual ability and mental performance proposed structure is a slot again with silicon surrounding on both side but this is the this is the wave guide here and this is the digital wave guide here with in between is a slot so a slot so you have this different dimensions and geometric parameters defining this to the the wave guides and the slot region and this is the calculated again you can see there is a strong confinement in the slot region of the light as it is depicted in this particular 3d picture the optimum parameters are represented here for the sake of time let me not repeat it but only i can highlight that for a gap of 0.1 nanometer micrometer we could detect we could get a confinement of light in the source region of about 58.3% and that is the which corresponds to other optimum parameters of this or overall sensors we also studied a double slot waveguide also studied a double slot waveguide for which 
the optimum parameters corresponds to uh, corresponds to these are the different parameters as it is shown here the optimum um, there is the gap is g so this is 0.11 uh, is a micro it has to be a micrometer here so 0.1 micrometer and other parameters are here with the double slot geometry we could in, enhance the confinement to from 58 to 68 percent in this particular geometry so if I compare this particular table, so the minimum concentration and gamma confinement factor for different gases. If you consider N2O gas, whose absorption takes place at 4.47 micrometer, confinement is 68%. And this is, uh, these are the other parameters. The minimum for a signal to noise is of one, minimum uh, concentration that you can detect is 0 0.021 parts per million. And if it is a signal to noise issue of 10, you can detect it about 0.214 parts per million. Corresponding quantities for CO, which is around the similar wavelength, and CS4 also is a 3.67 micrometer, you can get in parts per million concentration that you can detect with this configuration here are tabulated here. So these are the two papers on exploiting silicon photonics for the media air. To, to be used as sen gas sensors for two particular noxious gases, NH3 and N2O. But in our papers, we have shown that you can detect presence of other um, such noxious gases using similar configuration of a slot waveguide or double slot waveguide. Now, it so happens that since the reflective index contrast in a slot kind of waveguide is pretty large, because of this large reflective index contrast, those who work on electromagnetic theory would realize that you cannot make use of a uh, scalar wave equation. You have to go for a vector wave equation. And as a result to find, because for a large reflective index contrast, the device becomes highly polarization sensitive. And to get an idea or, or estimate or model the polarization property of a waveguide, you need to then solve a vector wave equation. Now, due to the polarization sensitivity of some of those components, those working in the integration of different components, they came out with an idea, which is in this particular, for this paper, Nature Photonics, there is an EP, EP, who is at the MIT, a very senior professor. So they suggested that you need to have different kinds of polarization components to be integrated on the same platform. To get the to get over the complications which is um, which is raised by the high polarization sensitivity of some of the components. So you need sometimes you need a polarization splitter. They called as polarization rotator and so on. Combiner, identical photonic geometries you can have. So this is an example of a picture taken from this particular uh, paper to show the different kinds of polarization components which are important in dealing with silicon photonics integrated circuits. So this is one of our paper, which appeared in 2019 last year. This is the design of a silicon on calcium fluoride based ultra compact and highly efficient polarization splitter for the mean infrared. So it consists of a directional coupler with one horizontal slot waveguide. This is the slot waveguide, and this is a strip waveguide. Is based on a silicon uh, calcium fluoride substrate, and these waveguides are basically made of silicon with an air gap in between these two silicon regions for the slot case. So, if you inject the, an unpolarized light, which could be decomposed into a T and TM polarized MOS, then as a result of this directional coupler configuration between this strip waveguide, where you launch these two polarization and the slot waveguide, which is the couple, which would act as a coupled waveguide, you can couple TM mode almost 100%, almost 97 to 98% into that, uh, in the strip wave, uh, in the slot waveguide from this waveguide, and throughput waveguide will consist, still make the T out in this, uh, almost as whatever was injected, except for the loss in the uh, waveguide. So these are for different parameters. You can see there's a very small dimensions all in sub micrometer dimensions and a gap here for the silicon uh, slot waveguide is 0.42 micrometer 
normalized power transmission if you calculate you can show that as i said this is a directional coupler you inject two polarizations unpolarized light and what you get at the coupled port is a tm polarized light and in the throughput port is the te light so if this is the normalized power transmission as a function of the gap in the slot so the slot geometry design is an important factor here so as you can see here as a function of the gap the cross coupled port which would be this one would be uh, would remain the transmission here is pretty high and whereas in this case in the t case t is uh, sorry in the throughput port it is uh, very little nothing is almost most of it is coupled here so this is shown in this particular uh, matlab plot which is a tm you tm and t you put as an input in the coupled port you get only tm and the rest is coming out as t or a little bit of tm which is not did not couple because of the um, less than 100% efficiency but it is very close to 100% efficiency likewise this is for the t mode you can see the transmission is almost 100% and the tm mode is almost nothing and almost along the zero axis this is the t all around this is the throughput port couple of uh, uh, in the coupler the throughput port is carrying only the t mode then we have another couple of papers we worked on design of silicon on calcium chloride based compact and efficient polarization rotator for the bdir and design of a promising silicon slot slot wave guide based on ultra short low loss efficient polarization rotator for the media so polarization rotator for an operation at 4.47 micrometer i may i may caution here or just i want to or you to note the the audience to note that polarization rotator is extensively used in the modern literature to even if you compare is essentially an earlier terms in our when we were young we used to call this as a, not as polarization rotator but a, but rather as a polarization splitter but these days these are called as a polarization rotator so in the beta wave wavelength regime of 4.47 micrometer we have designed a polarization rotator whose working principle is the following you work with a say again there is a slot wave bed silicon slot wave bed based on this is calcium fluoride here and this is a uh, sweep wave guide here so breaking of wave guides in excitation of we working principle is to break the wave guide symmetry as uh, this, this is not a wave guide these two are not identical excitation of you displace to excitation of hybrid modes and polarization rotation of modes after propagating through a coupling that takes place in this case the length of the overall device is only 0.57 mm even less than a mm 0.57 mm and the results as in before you can see this is a, the t remains in this port and tm goes continues into the other um, other uh, in the strip uh, in the slot waveguide and if you plot the normalized power at the 576 micrometer around length of about 557 576 micrometer that is about 0.57 mm you can see that power in the t t waveguide is shown here whereas in the tm mode gets completely coupled out from there to into the slot waveguide this is the design of a silicon slot waveguide based on ultra short low loss polarization rotator for this is an ultra short is probably the smallest one reported to date in the literature although it is at a design stage uh, it is not been fabricated but i must say that in all our papers in this uh, in the whichever i have just referred to here every time every uh, reviewer said for this asked us to spell out what is the way to fabricate it. so each of these papers contain a section on how to fabricate it in the cmos technology so I, these are details there and i will not go into the details of that so this is a design of a silicon slot wave guide of extremely low slant ultra so lot uh, ultra low loss and efficient position rate for the media air on a very small length so again this is a double slot geometry here followed by strip wave guide material system is very similar as calcium fluoride here these wave guides are based on silicon so you can see this is the double slot wave guide the other um, picture of this and oh sorry i am almost uh, coming to end because i thought i must finish up by 30 uh, 25 minutes i don't know what is the time now but 
this is more or less just to give you a flavor of the things that we have done recently, a review that we have done. So sometimes people ask, I have a picture here. I thought I'll maybe before I do the thank you, I'll just show you this particular slide, this particular slide. This shows and one of the uh, examples of how to fabricate such as a, as a guideline for fabricators or web, uh, or the foundry uh, people to fabricate such webguides. This is a picture to show how you couple light into a slot webguide in combination of a grating coupler, Y splitter, followed by the Y splitter in the form of a coupler that you can use to launch light into the slot webguide. So with this, I think I will end up my presentation. And uh, if there is any question or anything, I'm not sure about how much time I took, but let yeah. me see. Uh, is the time okay? Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. This is great. It's good, sir. Ah, okay. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And if there are any questions, uh, we would like to invite them. So there is a question in the chat box. What does so it is for? For a practical use, how much minimum coupling efficiency is acceptable? Minimum coupling efficiency is acceptable. So, yes, uh, yeah, the coupling efficiency is, you see, the device is very small, very small. So the loss of the device is practically, you can say, is very little. Since these are sub millimeters, so the coupling efficiency could be even relatively low, even 30 to 40 percent should be sufficient to use it as a detector because the light confined here within that region is very, very high. Any other question? If not, can I ask one question, sir? Yeah. So in terms of selectivity, you said basically uh, the absorption band is there. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 correct. And uh, how sensitive is this technique for measurement of refractive index directly? Uh, refractive index. The, yes. We have not, we have not um, made any quantitative study of that, mm -hmm. but it, it should be like any other refractive index sensor, where okay. a lot of refractive sensors are using uh, evanescent wave cup, uh, evanescent wave sensing. That means in the even in the so lower index regime, you put the reflective index of the material to be um, um, measured or detected, and mm -hmm. you interact uh, because of that interaction. There is a overall uh, drop in transmission, and with a with suitable calibration, you can find out that there is the basic principle of any uh, reflective index sensor. So you should be able to detect it uh, without any problem. Uh, I I guess, but we did not do a quantitative study. Oh, thank you. Uh, another one is you showed that in the beginning, this 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 band of particular mid air band is very important for a biomedical diagnosis also. Yeah. So, so in terms of uh, human skin, what is there any uh, literature available? How much it, it penetrates into the skin? If you, I I would uh, I would guess I have given a reference to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, several, several references in our uh, paper. So if you look up those, you can see that. And also that one, which is this October 2020 paper in science. I'm sure that contains some of those references. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you very much for this interesting Thank you. and uh, very important uh, area of research and silicon photonics. Yes, Thank you. Anush. Thank you. So, Anush, do you want to say something? Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, we uh, thank you, you back, thank you. back at IIT Delhi and for giving us a uh, <laughs> wonderful talk. Uh, and thank you. Um, thanks from uh, on behalf of the entire ICW committee to Professor Park. So, uh, thank um, you. Onu, oh, actually, I have a very bad toothache, so I'm on antibiotic. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for coming in despite that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thanks, thank you. Oh, thanks for, uh, thank for you, thank uh, giving the talk despite the uh, okay. despite your toothache. We really oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.
Anuj, Anuj, you can go ahead with the next talk. <laughs> so, so, so now the, we'll go on with the next talk. And the next speaker over here in our current talk is, is S. Gupta from Delhi University. And the talk is on SPR integrated electro-optic properties in SBN 7510 films. So do we have S. Gupta logged yeah. in? Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah, okay, great. Excellent. So, so uh, we would start with the presentation of uh, Ms. Gupta. Sure. Am I uh, audible, sir? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. So here we have Dr. Surbhi Gupta from the Department of Physics and Astrophysics in the University of Delhi, Delhi. And she'll be talking on SPR integrated electro optic properties in SBN 7510 films. So we have 10 minutes for the talk and then a couple of minutes for the questions. Yeah, sure. Sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be presenting on the topic SPR integrated electro optic properties in SBN 7510 films. Now, first is what are optical devices? Optical devices are the building blocks of any optical systems and network, and the performance and the reliability of any complex optical network depend heavily on the quality of the optical components utilized. Now, there are certain advantages which the optical component and the optical devices offer as compared to other, that is, they are completely passive in nature, they are resistant to high temperature, and they are ideal suited, suited uh, for medical applications. Now, in order to study what is the electro optic First, what is an electro-optic effect? So electro-optic effect is defined as a change in the refractive index of any anisotropic material induced by the application of a static or a low frequency electric field. Now it is given by this equation that the refractive index is governed as this uh, by this equation, where this coefficient is the Pockel's electro-optic coefficient, which implies that how the refractive index is changing with a linearly electric with a linear electric field. And this is the Kerr electro-optic coefficient, which defines how it is changing quadratically with electric field. Now, why there is a need to study the electro-optic effect in thin film? As we know that all the established electro-optic modulators available utilizes the bulk crystals which have disadvantages such as low speed of modulation, higher driving voltages, and they have a large device size which makes them bulky in nature. So the solution to all these problems is to utilize a thin film electro-optic modulator. But the challenges which are faced by fabricating a thin film electro-optic modulator is the fabrication of the optical waveguide itself. Now, there are various techniques which are available in literature to study the optical waveguide fabrication, such as prism coupling techniques, surface plasmon, and the third is Max Zender. But in the present talk, I will be discussing about the surface plasmon resonance technique. Now, what is surface plasmon resonance? I, I know uh, all of you must be aware of it, but still just an overview. So plasmon is a collective oscillation of electron and synchronization. And these surface plasmons are the electron, electron oscillation, which are due to the charge density gradient at the interface of the metal and the dielectric. Now, there are various interrogation techniques which can be used to study the surface plasmon resonance, such as angle interrogation, wavelength interrogation, phase interrogation, and intensity interrogation, among which I will be utilizing the angle interrogation among uh, uh, in the present work. Now, there are different configurations in which the SPR can be set up, such as the main configurations are the Kreshman and the Auto, and there are sub, sub, sub categories for, this, uh, for both of them, such as waveguide coupled SPR, plasma and waveguide resonance, and long range SPR. But in the present work, I will be focusing mainly on the waveguide coupled SPR owing to its certain advantages over the other techniques, which I'll be discussing in the further slide. Now, what is a waveguide coupled SPR? As the name suggests, it, it has a waveguide mode. It has a SPR mode. On coupling the two, we get a waveguide coupled SPR mode. Now, what happens exactly in a waveguide coupled SPR mode? There are three distinct parameters which defines a waveguide coupled SPR mode. First is the theta SPR that defines the synchronous angle of mode of excitation or the working angle. And second is a minimum reflectance, which defines the maximum energy coupling efficiency or the maximum modulation index. And third is the width of the resonance dip, dip which defines the function of losses and the driving voltages. Now, what happens in a waveguide coupled SPR, that electromagnetic field associated with the waveguide mode efficiently couples with the energy of the SPR mode so that the waveguide, so that the surface plasmons are extended over a large length so that we can get a, a wide range of utilization for the surface plasmons. 
So there are certain advantages which a waveguide coupled SPR offers over the other electro-optic modulators, such as they have a large bandwidth, they have higher efficiencies, they have compact and structure, and they are cost effective, lower modulation voltages are achieved, and they have low optical losses and easy alignment. So the material of concern in the present work is I have chosen to be strontium barium niobate. Now why it is chosen? Because it is a ferroelectric material. Second, it crystallizes over a wide range of X that is in this composition. So it varies from 0.25 to 0.75 with a tetragonal structure. And these are the lattice parameter and other parameters of the two configurations. Now in the present work, I have utilized X to be 60% and 75%. I have worked upon two compositions in the in my in my work. Now to, uh, to prepare the S-Bin thin films, I have used uh, pulse laser deposition techniques to be the uh, deposition technique as it owing to its advantages, which is uh, owing to advantages which it offers on deposition of a multi-component material. So the films were optimized, uh, C-axis oriented films were obtained by optimizing the deposition pressure, laser fluence and substrate temperatures and different different crystallographic and uh, atomic force microscopy studies were performed on the deposited films. Now to study the electro-optic characteristics of the films, the first uh, part of the presentation is to study the static electro-optic electro, electro SPR measurement. The indigenously developed SPR setup was modified to study the DC electro-optic SPR measurement and the SPR curves, reflectance curves were obtained as a function of electric field varying from 0 kilovolt per centimeter to 200 kilovolt per centimeter for both SBN60 and SBN75 thin film. Further, the complex dielectric constant and complex refractive index uh, were estimated as a function of applied electric field by fitting those SPR reflectance curve with the Fresnel equations. Now, now, next, the effective biofringence was also estimated, and the figure of merit was uh, found out for both the SBN60 and SBN75 thin films. And it was found that SBN75 thin films possesses a higher figure of merit as compared to SBN60 thin films. Now, these are the modulation parameters of the electro optic modulator of the developed electro optic modulator based on SBN60 and SBN75 thin films were found, and the modulation index of about 44% was achieved as compared to it, it is way too higher as compared to available in literature. Next, the setup was further modified to uh, study the dynamic electro-optic coefficient uh, in order to find out the resonant frequency of the SBN60 and SBN75 thin film-based electro-optic modulator. So, this, uh, so the available setup was modified in terms of uh, to study the modulated intensity interrogation approach for defining the modulation uh, resonance frequency of both the SBN60 and SBN75 thin films. As we see in this SPR reflectance curve, there was a sharp enhancement in the resonance angle and the other properties such as complex dielectric constant and complex refractive index at the resonance frequency, which was found out to be about 1 megahertz for SBN60 and 3 megahertz for SBN75 thin films. Further, the effective electro-optic coefficient of about 350 picometer per volt was just found out uh, for the SBN75 thin film, uh, which was higher, uh, like which was higher as at the resonance frequency. Now the uh, now the system was fixed at the resonance frequency and the effect of applied electric field amplitude was studied by varying it from 40 kilovolt from 400 kilovolt per centimeter. So the uh, the SPR reflectance curve was shifted towards the right hand side, indicating that uh, indicating the effect of applied electric field. And further, the, the deviation of reflectance curve was also studied on both the SPR configuration SPR electro optic modulators. Now, as the last part of the presentation, I also did thermo optic aided electro optics SPR uh, measurement. This was necessary to study the temperature dependent electro optic coefficient and to study the trade off between the thermo optic and the electro optic coefficient. So, the setup was modified, and uh, the setup is shown in, the, in this figure. The, there are two parts of the experiment. First, the SPR reflectance curve was studied without the application of an electric field, and the temperature was varied from 296 Kelvin to 396 Kelvin for SBN60 and SBN75 thin film. And it can be seen that the complex dielectric constant and the refractive index were found to be uh, following the uh, well established Curie Weiss law, in which we can see there is a ferroelectric phase, there is a phase transition at about three, uh, 373 Kelvin and about 343 Kelvin for SBN60 and SBN75, respectively, thin films. And we could see the ferroelectric to paraelectric transition transition in this thin films. So now the system was now to study the effect of the electric field on this thermo optic coefficient. The electric field was amplitude was applied varying from 40 kilovolt per centimeter to 400 kilovolt per centimeter. And it could be seen that the biofringes of both the thin films were found to be increasing with apply uh, with increasing electric field and they were found to be maximum at the transition temperature as compared to the other uh, temperatures. 
So the effective thermal uptake coefficient was found out for the various uh, electric field, and it was it can be seen that with increasing the electric field, although the uh, thermo optic coefficient was found to be decreasing, but the effective electro optic coefficient was increasing as compared to uh, as compared to the other electric fields. So these uh, so in conclusion, I would like to say that the modulation characteristics of both the electro optic systems were found in presence of DC electric field. Resonance frequency was also found out to be about 1 megahertz and 3 megahertz respectively. A phase transition temperature was obtained about 373 and 338 Kelvin for SBN 16 and SBN 7 So in general, I have made a, a thermally tunable electro-optic modulator whose uh, resonance frequency can also be established using this vehicle coupled SPR modes. Thank you. Thanks, Surabhi, for a nice talk. Yes, thank you. Any questions? We'll invite questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Yeah. If not, I think we'll move on. Next, next, yeah. Yes, uh, Anish. So move next, maybe. Thank we thank yes. uh, Surbi for for your talk. Yes, we thank Surbi for her talk, and now we move on to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Miss K. Somya from the Center for Materials for Electronics Technology, CEMT, in India. And her talk is on the effect of RF power on structural electrical optical properties of surface plasma and resonance of sputtered AZO thin films. Ms. Somya, are you here? Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Please. Uh, sir, what about my presentation? So, what about my presentation? Uh, is it available? No, you share. Uh, Go to please share. share. So is it available now? No, not yet. Okay. So what about now? Not yet, I guess. Hello? No, not yet. With Samia, if you can press on the share button or the third button, if you click on it and then you see some windows you click on your presentation window yeah, yeah. double click on that and it should open up yes now you can open your pbt yes Yes, now yes. presentation mode. Uh, okay, so oh. now I think it is better. Yes, now, okay. Yes, please go ahead. Right. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Saumya from CMET Trishur. CMET is an R&D institute. Its headquarters is in Pune, and we have branches in Trishur as well as Hyderabad. And today I would like to present on the topic effect of RF power on structural electrical optical properties and surplus plasma resonance of sputtered azote thin films. The presentation was divided into three, where in the first part, I would like to discuss some basics of plasmonics, and then I will consider the problems of conventional plasmonic material. Then I will move to preparation and analysis of iso thin film for plasmonic applications in near air. So uh, the field of plasmonic refers to the coupling of like with the free electrons in the material. Since metal was considered as the gunnery of free electron, they are the conventional plasmonic material. And like photon in photonics and electron in electronics, here plasmons are the fundamental particle. And unlike photon, they do not have a diffraction limit, so that they can travel, uh, so that so that they can localize the, uh, uh, sorry, so that they can lo localization of this is possible, and uh, they will enable strong uh, field enhancement also. So uh, the 
Uh, plasmons are the quanta that is associated with the collective excitation of free electrons in metal. And they are the collective wave where large number of electrons oscillate in a particular synchronization. And the plasmons can travel along a nanoscale material unlike photons. And uh, the surplus plasmons generation, uh, sorry, uh, the surplus plasmons are generated at the metal dielectric interface. That means between two material having positive and negative permittivity. And permittivity is a complex quantity and its real part refers the weight of a material to get polarized when it is interacted by an electric field. And the imaginary part is the loss encountered while polarizing the material. And uh, the permittivity have a direct dependence with the plasma frequency as we can see here. And for a frequency up to plasma frequency, the permittivity is negative and material exhibit transforming properties in these frequency range. And this plasma frequency is uh, directly proportional to the carrier conservation. And uh, so by tuning the carrier concentration, we can actually tune the plasma frequency. But for metals, the carrier density is fixed. And this is a one of the drawback of metal while using as a plasmonic material. And figure shows the imaginary permittivity of metals. And we can see that it possesses large loads in the near air. Usually, usually the loads in the metals are interband transition, interband transition, and free carrier absorption loads. And th this shows that they are not suitable for near air plasmonics. So an alternative material to this is very sufficient. And zinc oxide are basically a wide band semiconductor, and their band gap is about 3.37 electron volt. Its, its physical property can be tuned by doping or by temperature growth. Basically, they are semiconductors and they are divalent, but doping them with a trivalent atom like aluminum or indium can uh, substitute the aluminum in place of zinc and they can generate more number of free electrons. So uh, here what we done is we synthesized the azote thin films for plasmonic applications in near area. For the synthesis, uh, instead of using the circular solid target, we actually prepared azote powder by mixing zinc oxide powder and Al2O3 powder for one hour using an agate and calcined at 700 degrees Celsius for three hours. And this powder was half sputtered uh, at 500 degrees to minus 2 millibar pressure for 20 minutes. And, uh, and the distance that we kept is 5 centimeters. We continued this process by varying the R of power from 70 watt to 110 watt. And we first considered uh, the structural conformation of iso powder as well as the films. So iso powder exhibited polycrystalline nature of versatile single oxide structure, where all films, uh, sorry, sorry, where all peaks confirmed that uh, doping does not make any change in the structure. And while grown as a film, we can see that the growth was more preferred to 002 direction. And moreover, no secondary phase are identified, which again confirmed the substitution of aluminum in singularities. And when the R of power was increased, relatively higher intensity and smaller full width at half maximum uh, was observed. And which confirmed that more crystallite film was produced beyond 100 watt. The crystalline size have direct dependence, sorry, direct consequence with the grain boundary scattering, which also will result in the plasmonic loss. But for high uh, R of power, large crystallites are produced and that can be, so we can expect plasmonic loss to be minimum. So uh, uh, the very important property uh, for a material, as far as a material is concerned for plasmonic applications is the carrier density. And for near air plasmonic, the carrier density should be in the range 10 plus to 20. And we can see that this was also achieved for the highest power. And this may be due to increasing sputtering rate when R of power was increased. The thickness measured uh, also confirmed this and the mobility also enhanced with the R of power. The optical transparency was confirmed using the UV visible near air spectrophotometer. And irrespective of the R of power, all film possessed an average transparency of 80%. And the band gap calculated using the top load showed that the variation of band gap was according to the most bursting effect. And the higher band gap thus minimized the transition from valence band to conduction band below 3.24 electron volt. So we already discussed the importance of negative permittivity for the generation of SPR. Here we extracted epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 using two tolerance equation that is given here. And the negative epsilon 1 in near air was only observed for 110 watt film. And the wavelength at which epsilon starts negative is called the crossover wavelength. And uh, this was also observed beyond 1600 nanometer. So theoretically uh, only this film can achieve uh, as surplus plasma resonance in the near air wavelength. And to confirm this, we consider the Kirschman configuration. Our setup was like this. And tungsten halogen lamp having wavelength range 400 to 2200 nanometer was used. And this light was passed to a pre-polarizer that we can see here. And it reaches at a film substrate interface. And we used a BK7 glass prism and substrate. And they were stricter to the using an index matching fluid. So for an incoming light, uh, consider uh, all these will appear as a single material. 
and the events in the wave generated at the substrate interface here uh, substrate film interface will move to the film dielectric interface and couple with the surplus plus one at an angle greater than the critical angle and the reflected light was collected using a detector and analyzed the same so a decreasing nature of the reflected light was observed only for 110 watt film and this dip was considered as the spr dip of the film and no other film observed any dip at this wavelength this confirmed the spr of 110 watt film so conclusion is element of a zinc oxide film was interested using rf pattern technique and exactly confirmed the formation of zinc oxide film and hall measurement confirmed the three carat density uh, in the range 10 to 20 per centimeter cube and the zero crossover wavelength of the real permittivity of the 110 uh, watt film watt sputtered film was near in the near air and the spr tip generated using cushman configuration also confirmed the plasmonic properties in near air so i would like to acknowledge my guide dr uh, sn porti and my institute uh, cmet trishur and my funding agent csir thank you thank you somya for the talk thank you sir, thank you, sir. now we would like to invite questions from the audience are there any questions from the audience If not, we would like to thank Ms. Soumya for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is the last talk of the session. Th that was the last talk of the session. So we concluded the last session. And okay. in fact, we are almost ready for the next session. So we have seven minutes for the next session to start. And Professor Cross is already here. As I see, uh, Professor Cross, uh, he's already Hello. here. The next session is going to be cheered by Professor Jovi Joseph and Professor Brijay Krishnadas, who is also here. So we'll hand over the, the challenge to them. Thanks, Professor Mehta, for being the co-chair. Yes, thank, thank you, Anas, so and thank you, organizers. So mm -hmm. we, we conclude. So we sorry, conclude. delay, right? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. So I think we went into the lunch, but uh, well, thanks for so now we pass the baton to to Professor Jogi Joseph and Professor Bijoy Krishna Das. Okay then. Hi, Professor Das. Yes, yes. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. And Professor Joseph. Yeah. Please. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anuj and Professor Meta. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Bijoy, and Hi. we have some more time. We have yeah. another five, six minutes still there. Uh, we should wait for six minutes, I think, to start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And hello, Professor Koros. Thank you very much. Hello, for Professor Joseph. Very nice to see you. Nice Hi. to see you. Um, Hi, Professor Kos. Hello. Hi. I don't have the share option enabled. Oh, oh I see. Okay. You are unable to share. Is that the message you are getting? Yes. Okay, so then we will have to ICE host team and the person in the ICE team. Can you please check up what's the problem? Hello. Hello, yes. Can you please check up? Professor Cross is unable to share his screen. He's telling that he's not able to for him. Uh -huh. Professor Cross, when you press the share button, uh, the third uh, button, and uh, what is the message you are getting? Wait, oh, wait, wait. It's, it's on my side. Wait, wait. Wait, I need to go out and come back in again. Yeah, please, okay. please, okay. please. No problem. <clears throat> It is, it is too cold in Delhi, uh, Joby. <laughs> yeah, it is cold, but not very cold. I may be a little over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, little cold, but not very cold. Yeah, I usually, yeah. I usually wear a little more than. Over <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, okay. Sorry, it's more cold inside than outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because of COVID time, almost time, all the time are inside the room. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Good. Okay, I can now share. Yeah. 
just try. Yeah, good. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. It it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Right. If I go. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, good. It's coming. Very good. Thank coming. You. So we have another four minutes to go, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. So and also it's a participants. Uh, what I can see, uh, this nine participants, is that the... Uh, no, no, no. The participants, these are actually invitees, like um, some professors, some research students oh, who are speaking. So all the main participants, we cannot see them. So you have to look at the chat window if they have any questions. Sure, sure. So have you had a good meeting so far? Yeah, very good, very good. Thank you. This is the last day and this is the last but one session for the I know, but, but have there been many participants? Yeah, part number of I'm oh, sorry. Just a moment. Uh, sorry, Professor Crow. So the number of participants uh, who are listening to all these talks, I am including all different sessions, I think it's around uh, 1500. Um, wow. Yeah, they are, um, how many would be attending our session, we would not be able to know, but the total participants are that. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> So since that number is quite large, which can be accommodated by a um, video conferencing like this, so they are in the YouTube kind of a mode where they can only see and listen to you and we cannot listen to them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think uh, later we can start. I think it's 1.30, Joy, we, we can start the session. So I will just introduce uh, our uh, chairperson for the session, Vijay Krishnadas. And uh, Vijay, I think you have all the information for the invited yeah. speakers. Yeah, 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 I do have. <coughs> so in case any problem, I can introduce. Otherwise, you can introduce. By the way, I would like to introduce and welcome uh, my co-chair, Professor Vijay Krishnadas, uh, who is a professor of physics, uh, professor of electrical engineering at IIT Madras. And he has been a pioneer in silicon photonics, integrated photonics uh, over many, many years. And who did his PhD in, uh, degree in integrated optics from University of Paderborn in Germany. And ah, Dr. with Professor Dola. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Good. So after which uh, he is um, after many years of postdoc at uh, Germany and Japan and US and uh, he has joined IIT Madras Electrical Engineering Department. I think in which year? Uh, two thousand six. Yeah. Two thousand six. So so from there onwards he has been a pioneer in building the whole facility of integrated photonics at IIT Madras. A tremendous facility and uh, he's managing that and very good work on integrated photonics has been doing for many, many years. So thank you, Bajoy, for uh, yeah, accepting yeah. this chairship and uh, please uh, start your session. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jovi, for your nice introduction for chair itself. So uh, this is uh, my pleasure to, to welcome you all for this session. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, in this session, we have three invited talks and uh, one contributed to oral presentation is there. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first invited speaker, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Krauss. I think uh, we don't need much introduction for him. He has a, a lot of, it's internationally fam famous and a lot of contribution in uh, photonics, integrated photonics, particularly sensing applications. And uh, but uh, to uh, introduce, uh, to say something to start with uh, uh, is for Pramesh Thomas Krauss uh, holds a degree in optical engineering uh, in Colon, uh, Colon University, Germany, and then uh, PhD in electrical engineering, uh, so Glasgow, UK in 1992. And then he was a chair of uh, optoelectronics at the University of St. Andrews, and then uh, chair of photonics at the University of York. And uh, his research interest particularly is uh, for light matter interaction uh, related to functional devices, such as using novel nanophotonics concepts for the understanding and detection of biological processes. Quite hot topic and uh, very promising. He has. Uh, held a major uh, leadership roles, uh, like uh, head of the uh, Department of Physics, St. Andrews, uh, from 2009 to 2012, head of the Scottish University Physics Alliance, 2011, and uh, strategy champion for technology at the York, and has led major European Union projects, uh, and UK, UK also UK funded projects, consortia, and he is also fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institute of Physics and the Optical Society of America, and was awarded the Royal Society Wolfson Merit Award in 2015. With this, I uh, invite Professor Krauss. Uh, he will be talking on high performance biosensor based on guided mode resonances, elegant photonics in a simple package. So, with this, I invite Professor Krauss, please. Okay, thank you very much for the yeah. kind introduction. I'm delighted to be with you. I would be much more delighted if I were in India just now and yeah. enjoyed the culture and the atmosphere and the food. So anyway, but nice to be with you at least remotely. So um, the point of my talk is to tell you about biosensing activity. But unlike many other talks on this topic, I would really like to focus on the simplicity of the arrangement. I mean, there's many, many uh, ways of doing biosensing, but our goal is to, to do this in a, in a handheld, in a simple package. And if you do that, then there's a whole new uh, raft of boundary conditions that you don't normally have to think about when you only do an experiment in a laboratory. So this is really the guiding principle here. We want to do really high performance biosensing, but do it in a handheld package. And this is a, an artist's impression. We haven't got this yet, but we're very close to achieving something like this. And um, as you will find out, in order to do this, you need to have, you know, it, it, you can't just to take laboratory physics and stick it into a box. You really need to rethink your approach and you need to have some clever ideas to make all this work. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, actually, let me introduce my group. Uh, why does this not work? Um, so uh, this is about 15 people and two thirds of them work on, on the biosensor project. 
So you can see if you look at it, what we're doing. So this is a P and H and O. It's all a bit bizarre, but so we're we're making photonics with people, and uh, there's a bit of nice light in the background of which we don't have very much just now. But anyway, so this is my group, and uh, I also want to highlight we do work with clinicians. That's very important. They tell us what they really need. They don't just interested in in clever physics. And of course, we have funding from the UK Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council. So um, what's the point? Well, we all know the idea. You want to use lab on a chip to replace these people in the laboratory. Um, and that's all very well, and I don't need to motivate this further. But the key point I want to highlight is these people do extremely good work. They can detect proteins and biomarkers with very high sensitivity. And what they, these people are doing there, they're doing something similar to what we know as an ELISA, which is an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. And the way this works, you have an antibody, so you use the same mechanism that the body uses to recognize biomarkers. And then you attach um, a fluorophore or a color-coded um, molecule to detect, to be able to vis visualize and see the detection of your target. Now, this is reasonably complicated, it needs some washing steps, it needs skill, um, but it's very good. So typical uh, sensitivity curves, you can see concentrations here in picogram per mil. So for, for IgG, which is a um, protein related to the immune system, which we've heard a lot about with COVID, um, and ELISA can do picogram per mil. So the key point I'm making here is, if we want to replace ELISA, we need to be just as good. That's the key point. So we need to reach sensitivities in this regime before the clinicians will say, okay, I'll use your technology now because it is easier and it's just as good as ELISA. So that's a key point. Now, how are we gonna do this? So we're gonna use a simpler method. And the first of all, the simpler method just uses a label-free approach, which means you do not need to attach the fluorophore. And here's a generic picture. So you use whatever assay you have, and you need to have some sort of photonic feature. Here's a resonance. And then when you bind your target molecule, the resonance shifts, and you pick that up. I mean, micro rings, surface plasma resonance, and our guided motor resonance, they all work the same. It's all like this. You touch um, the binding, uh, the capture molecule to the surface, and then that helps you to detect your target, and you detect that with an optical beam. Fine. So now we're going to do this with a very simple grating. And um, this is, was first presented by Robert Magnus in the 90s. So this is really old technology. But you will see there's still clever new things you can do with this. Um, and it's it just a, a second order grating. So you couple in light. So the period of the grating corresponds to the wavelength. So you couple in the light, you form a Bragg resonance, and you couple out again. So this is also known as a Fano resonance, which is the interference between the, the Bragg mode here and the Fabry Perra mode of the thin film. And that's what gives you a relatively sharp resonance. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, if you look at it in transmission, you have a dip. If you look at it in reflection, you have a peak. So we mainly look in reflection, but just to illustrate. And if you attach molecules to the surface, then you will find that your resonance shifts. Okay, now, <clears throat> how does this compare? So why are we doing this when there's so many other ways of doing the same thing? And I'm bringing out some key competitors here. So this is the, the microring resonators, which many people are pursuing. And it's, uh, I would argue, the most prominent commercialization is done by Genelite. They do this very well. But this machine, this machine will cost you $100,000. Similarly, the surface plasma resonance, uh, many people do this as well. And that also costs you $100,000 or more. Um, then Laura Lishuga at Barcelona, she's pioneered these interferometric waveguides, and they're also very good. They get very high sensitivities. So why, do, why does the world need another modality? Well, let's think about the problems. As I told you, I want to put this into a box. Now, these are things that are in boxes, but I just said this costs you $100,000.
Now, I don't want my box to cost $100,000. I want it to cost $100, maybe, you know? So I really need to think, how can I get the same performance, but at lower cost? Well, first of all, let's compare. So here's uh, a metric that people usually think about sensitivity and Q factor. And, and then the, the limit of detection in terms of refractive index for the SPR is in the minus sixes. For the micro rings and the waveguides, it's even better. It's in the minus sevens, right? Now, ours is about minus five. So ours is the worst. Why would we do this? Well, now let's think about the problems with all these high performing um, methods. So first of all, the micro ring, you need to couple into a waveguide mode. And that's the same with the interferometric approach. Now, if you couple light, you need to use a, a, a grating coupler and you need to have a tolerance of one to maybe 10 microns at best. And you need a very tight on angular tolerance. So if you put this sort of thing onto a cartridge and slot it in your machine, it has to be precision manufactured and that is not cheap. So that's a problem. You need to have simple way of coupling the light in. Secondly, you need to have a way of tracking this resonance. I've told you about the resonance when you find the proteins, the resonance shifts. Um, and people always, well, we, we all have spectrometers in the lab, so nobody worries about this. But if I want to put this into a small box, what do I do? I don't have space for a big spectrometer, and it's also too expensive. So what do I do? And then finally, um, a lot of money goes into stabilization. So some of the reason uh, the Genolite can do 10 to the minus seven refractive index unit sensitivity because it's extremely well stabilized. Um, and then the question is, what well, do we need this? So this is what makes photonic biosensors expensive. So how can we improve this? So first of all, the waveguide coupling, um, I showed this already. So here's our, our GMR, you couple the light in and you couple everywhere. You don't have to hit a particular spot and you will always get this resonance. So it's position independent. So that makes it intrinsically easy to interface. So therefore, just using this sort of large grating coupler, and we make this over a millimeter, and you can position your sensor easily over a millimeter. So that's not a problem. So that solves the waveguide coupling. So we can just shine a, an LED or a laser diet at the surface, and it will work. Second problem, the spectrometer. And here we uh, invented a, a different way of doing this. We invented what we call the chirped grating approach, whereby you have um, a grating which changes either fill factor, what we show here, or it changes period with position. And so then that means your resonance is in a different place depending on the refractive index. So we are translating refractive index change into position change. And uh, that's shown here. So here's your grating. And it's in fact, we now use period chirp. We just fan out the grating. And then if you look at the resonance wavelength, it changes as you go up. And here, if you shine a, a simple laser, a laser diet, um, you will find the resonance is now a line. It's, it's this position. Line. And then we can simply take the the cross section of this line and extract our resonance position and that's how we measure it and I'll, I'll talk more about this but that's the key idea so basically you're grating by chirping it slightly you do both the sensing and you do the spectrometer function so you, you couple those two functions in the same structure so that helps us do the spectrometer function on the same chip so we don't need another spectrometer we just need a, a narrow source um, either a filtered LED or a laser. Uh, the third question, so, is the st stability. And here we use, we can do multiple channels in our field of view. So we can have one that is functionalized. So this one will depend on the proteins. This one does not depend on the proteins. And then we flow over both of them and we compare. And that gets us far into the um, stabilization because these are so close. We can make space. So if there's any mechanical vibration, if there's temperature fluctuations, both channels will see them, and we can then subtract all these extra, uh, <clears throat> these outside effects. So that's also reasonably solved. If I put all this together, 
And now I'm going to plot this as limit of detection versus cost. You can see there's the Genelite and there's the SPR, um, all very expensive. But our system um, is not quite as good, as I said before, but it's much cheaper. Um, so but we, I, I started off by saying, um, can we do this? the same performance as an ELISA, and we haven't got there yet, but I'll come to it. Now, there's another box I want to highlight, this blue box here. So typically, um, it is accepted in the field that 10 to minus 6 uh, refractive index units is about as good as you can do, because beyond this, any fluctuations in, in your liquid analyte, so this is then translates into fluctuations in refractive index of the water um, get very difficult to achieve below 10 to minus 6. So that's why I mentioned earlier the general light system is extremely well stabilized to ensure that the, these temperature fluctuations of the water don't impact too much. But so practically, um, if you want a handheld instrument, I think 10 to minus 6 is about as good as you can get. So that's a, a, a practical limitation here. Now, another point people always ask me, you say, well, but you make your gratings for e-beam lithography, and that's very expensive, and I agree. But since um, we can now also do this by nano and here's an example. So this is a field of view, and they see this line that I mentioned. And if we now take the data, here's an e-beam lithography grating, and here's one made by nano imprint, and you can see they look very similar. And if I plot the resonance curves, you know, the Q factor is the same, there's slight variations, but basically the performance is exactly the same. And we describe this in more detail in this recent paper here. So we can make it at low cost. That's very important again. So now this is all about refractive index. Now we need to change proteins. So what do we do? So just to, for those of you not so familiar, so the, I, I, I quote all my proteins in weight per volume, so in grams per liter. And just if, you know, in blood, you will typically want to look at nanogram, microgram, milligram levels. In urine, you want to look at picogram to microgram levels. And if you do environmental detection, so, you know, uh, you look for pesticides in river water, you often need to look even lower. So we have, for now, focused on this regime because we also think urine is a good uh, matrix because you don't have to finger prick and everybody needs to pass urine at least once a day. So that's that's maybe not a bad idea. OK, so we're looking in this sensitivity regime. So um, now in order to do this, we functionalize. We need to do a bit of chemistry. So our silicon or silicon nitride surface, we first hydroxylate it and then we silenize it. And then we attach amine groups um, to the surface. And then the amine group can bind to the antibody. This is a common protocol. Many people use it. And we, we first did this about eight years ago. And then about six years ago, well, five years ago, we, we had these sort of results. So when we use IgG, I've already mentioned IgG, um, when we see the binding curve, then we could, our limit of detection at the time was about 40 nanograms per mil. Um, and that was in this Optica paper. And we also already used the reference channels but 40 nanograms per mil is still a long way from the ELISA. So this is all very nice, but it's not yet good enough. So then we did lots of little improvements. I won't bore you with all of them. But a key improvement was to change the surface chemistry. So we then introduced this uh, PEG molecule, this polyethylene glycol. And the PEG has an interesting property. It gives sort of, you think of it as a spring which then gives much more flexibility for the molecules to attach. And the PEG also covers the surface very well, which means you have very little non-specific binding. And this is important if you measure in, in real substances like urine. We use human urine. There's all sorts of things in there, and you don't want them to bind. You only want your target molecule to bind, and the PEG really helps us with this. So the, you know, <clears throat> lots of detail here. And it's all in, in this paper, which we published earlier this year. So then we can now do 10 picogram per mil, simply because we have more binding sites and we have learned how to do it better. And we also have very little non-specific binding. 
Um, and now, this is the, the curve I showed you earlier. So the ELISA does five picker room, so we're now in the right ballpark. We can now compete with the ELISA, which is what we always wanted to do. And here's another picture. This is actually the urine we used. So all my students um, gave a donation, let's put it that way. And then we mix it up and we, we put our targets into it to measure, and that's where these curves come about. So this is a real measurement in a real matrix. It is not laboratory. Um, <clears throat> okay, and yes, here you see we can actually do four different uh, targets. So here's a reference and a signal for four different channels, and we showed we can do you know IgG and C-reactive protein, troponin, procalcitonin. So procalcitonin and CRP they are both markers of infection, and troponin is a marker for uh, your heart. So these are all very relevant. And we show we can all measure them, you know, uh, at about 10 picogram per mil or better. So this is very nice. Now um, let's do something a bit more clever. So here I need to explain to you how we measure these curves. So you see there's a binding curve. So when you when you add the protein, uh, you see a slight binding, and that's what we measure. Now, how do we actually achieve these curves? And here I bring you back to an earlier curve. So what we do, as I said. We have this chirp grating, and then when you shine uh, a laser at it or a filtered LED, you get this bar, and that moves up and down, as I've explained already. Now, what does this really look like? And that's look at the blue curve. So the blue curve is the real data. And you can see it gets quite noisy at the peak. So um, it's difficult to find actual maximum, which is what we need, which is what our measure is. And you notice we fit this red curve, which is what we a fan of it. But let's just look at this data point again. So let's look at only this part here. And I'll do this on the next slide. So this is what it looks like. This is the real data. So these are points. And you see how noisy it is. And then we try to fit a curve to this. Now, first of all, if you imagine all of these points of noise on them, if you were just to measure the maximum, you can see your, your noise is several pixels. So, you know, you take this measurement, another measurement, then this point might be higher or this point might be higher. So there's a lot of uncertainty where the maximum actually is. So we call this intensity measurement or AM modulation. It's like when you have AM radio. You just measure the amplitude of the signal. So what we then do, and that's in this curve here, we, we put this red fit onto it, which fits the final function, as I explained. This resonance is due to the interference between the Bragg uh, reflection and the Fabi Perot resonance of the thin film. So we put a Fano film, and now um, we think of this as FM modulation. So you're fitting a curve, and now if individual points have noise on them, the fit will not change very much. So you can get much higher accuracy in determining the maximum of this curve if you do this Fano fit. Okay, many people do this, so this is not particularly special. But then we think, can we do better? Can we improve our fitting? And uh, the obvious answer is, many people do this now, they do deep learning. And that's very clever. But the problem with deep learning is, you need a large data set. And it's computationally intensive. Now, I keep telling you, I want to put this into a small box. I don't have a supercomputer behind it. So deep learning is out. Too much compute power needed. We need something simple. And here's the idea. So, in fact, this is my, my son who's studying mathematics. He was just doing this Kalman filter thing, and he told me about it. And I said, ah, we could use this. So a Kalman filter was developed uh, for the Apollo missions 50 years ago when the Americans first flew to the moon. <clears throat> and they needed to find where's the rocket. And, of course, they didn't have such accurate a measurement system, but they had worked out the trajectory of the rocket. So then they knew where it should be, but then they also had a measurement, and it was all, you know, very difficult. But then the Kalman filter, it basically takes the measurement and it knows where the rocket is supposed to be, and it compares the two. And as it goes along, every increasing number of data points, it improves the fit. And the beauty is, it does this with very little compute power. Because 50 years ago, we didn't have supercomputers. They couldn't do this. 
with big data sets. They had to be very clever. And that's when the Kalman filter came about. So we have used exactly the same and we've adopted it to the protein measurements. And here's the result. Uh, I won't bore you with the mass, but so this, this blue curve is the figure I showed you before. This is what you get if you use the Fano fit and you track the peak of your resonance. So the noise is, is about one pixel. So just get back to here. So this is what I'm talking about. So this is a Fano fit and the noise, I say smaller, is about one pixel, right? So that's your blue curve. And then the projection is something else, don't worry about. But if we do the Kalman, look, that's the black curve. So with this Kalman filter, we can get the noise down by at least a factor of 10. So this is really quite exciting. And if you want to know more about it, um, it's just come out in ACS sensors. So a very simple trick that really improves your readout. So that's, that's a nice little story. Um, okay, in the final part of my talk, I want to uh, highlight a picture by the chairman, Professor Joseph. So we saw this paper in 2017, and they did GMR sensing with an interferometer. We thought this is really clever. Um, but again, then the problem with this is, so beautiful demonstration, but if you do this in your little box, it will be very unstable. So we thought, how can we put the interferometer onto our sample? And we came up with this idea of a common path interferometer where you use the fact this GMR actually has two modes. It has a TE mode and a TM mode, and they have different polarization, obviously. So, but you can excite them at the same time. And then one of them, the TE mode, has a low Q, and that's shown here. So the, well, the resonance is on the left and the phase is on the right. So the, the TE mode, changes very little with wavelength, whereas the TM mode changes a lot. So then we can use the TM as our signal and the TE as a reference, and we uh, shine them with the same structure. And Thomas, um, Thomas, uh, Thomas, you have to finish in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost done, thank you, oh, yes. Right. Yeah. And here's then we see a nice interferogram. Uh, and now, even this is before we had the Kalman filter, we can also do one picogram per mil um, with this structure. So this is very nice. So thank you for Professor Joseph for giving us his idea. Um, and this has just come out in uh, Nature LSA. So um, then that means with the interferometric GMR, we're now in this regime close to 10 to the minus 6 sensitivity, which is where we want to be. Um, so we can do high performance and low cost. Uh, this is still all very simple. So that brings me to the end. To summarize, so I've told you about the GMR, um, and it's, I've, I've introduced it by saying it's actually not as good as many others, but it allows you to do high performance with very simple um, physics, with very simple photonics. Um, so then I talked about the biochemical functionalization, particularly the PEG. Um, then I talked about the Kalman filter, which is a very recent innovation, um, which I think is very nice and very simple again little computational cost. And finally, I've showed you our common path interferometry. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. It's a very nice, uh, excellent talk. And uh, now uh, I think we can, we can uh, just have uh, one or two questions from the audience. If any questions, please. Uh, uh, Are there any? There is nothing in the chat window. So no. uh, yeah. So if I have uh, one question, uh, Professor Thomas Cross. Uh, wonderful talk. I am very very happy to I mean see you on at least on, <laughs> through computer. We wanted to have an interview here, <laughs> which did not happen. Thank you very much, and also I am very happy to see the work we have extended from our face sensor. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Also, I will read that paper and understand more about it. Just one question about your chirped uh, grating. And uh, within one channel, how many uh, uh, grating periods you usually use and how much is the optimum from your current experience so far? Um, I'm not, so you mean, if I look at this slide, so uh, you see the this is typically uh, 500 microns to a millimeter, and we change the wavelength by 5 to 10 nanometers. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. That, was that your question? Uh, so, yeah. It's done. Okay. So, Thomas, I have one question. Uh, so, you say that it is uh, cost-wise, it is cheaper. Uh, so, what is the approximate cost you are saying that $100? Is that correct? Well, what we want to do... Yeah. Um, we, so, with, so, we can do this with just, you know, an LED and a filter and, and a, a simple smartphone camera. So what's in here can be $20, $30. And we're hoping to make this cartridge for $1 or $2. I see. If you do it by nano imprint. I mean, all this does. And we, we have very simple microfluidics, which I didn't talk about, but we're still developing this. But the sensor itself, if you do it by nano imprint, and, you know, it's, you, you can do it on a wafer scale, then it's also very cheap. So, so that's what we're targeting. So sensor itself is for one-time use or multiple use? Yes, can... yes, one-time yes. use. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, it's a nice talk. I think if uh, we can, I think if some questions are there, we can contact you directly. Yes. Yeah, so thank, thank you. Please. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, uh, Jobin, you want to? Uh, yeah, we can go to the next speaker, and you can go ahead, and um, or else I can. Also yeah, uh, probably, probably you can introduce. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, Prith, how are you, well, Prith? Thank you. I'm good. Coach Jobin, how are you? Very good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You could join right on time. Thank you. So um, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Balpreet Singh Anglubalia, who is also a collaborator with us from IIT Delhi and uh, from the uh, University of Tromso in Norway. And uh, he has been there in UIT for the last uh, around 10 years, I think. Yeah, um, let me just see that. So he did his PhD from NTU Singapore in 2007 and after which he was uh, been visiting researcher and professor at um, center for uh, biophotonics and science and technology university of california davis and orc southampton at various periods and he is the group leader of ultrasound microwave and optics group at um, uit in norway and he has been doing pioneer work in uh, nanoscopy in general and for nanophotonics combined with optical sensors and he has large um, amount of uh, funding from uh, european union uh, projects and uh, erc funding etc and very recently we also have a collaborative india multinational collaborative project uh, we have submitted. We hope it will be coming through for a wonderful international collaboration between India, US, Europe, and uh, Norway all together. So, with this, I invite uh, Professor uh, Balpreet Gluvalia to give his uh, talk of today, which is on on chip nanoscopy platforms, a new paradigm for bioimaging. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Prof. Jovi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone in India and good morning to friends in uh, Europe and rest of the world. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, I can. So, um, I will, uh, as Prof. Jovi has mentioned, I will uh, talk in my uh, lecture today about the latest development in the field of uh, super resolution optical microscopy uh, using a, a photonic chip which we pioneered in, in uh, Norway uh, from last five years and we are continuously developing it. A uh, little bit about my university uh, is University of um, UIT is, uh, is, is the, is the uh, northernmost university in the world. It's, uh, we are at 69 degree north. Um, it's a very beautiful island. Uh, I came here as a postdoc um, and then fell in love with a beautiful city and stayed there from there onwards. Uh, what you see on your screen uh, on the, uh, this is island island and the north side of the island we have our university campus and it's uh, in, during the winter which is right now we uh, we can have uh, aurora activities and during summers we have midnight sun so it's a beautiful city uh, to stay that's where we are doing our small optics group uh, of around 25 people working on different aspects of microscopy and sensing um so what is about uh, 
optical nanoscopy. Uh, in simple word, uh, optical nanoscopy is super resolution optical microscopy. Uh, if you use a conventional microscope, there is a refraction limit of how small structure you can see. And the latest development based on fluorescence based optical uh, nanoscopy allows us to beat that refraction limit. Uh, I will go very, yes, I will have a couple of slides for a basic introduction for the audience and then I'll uh, try to explain different methods that we have developed and how we have developed on the photonic chip. So first to understand the diffraction limit, if you have a point object and you try to image that using a conventional optical microscope, uh, irrespective of the size of the object, if it is below the diffraction limit, it will appear like an airy disk. Uh, and these airy disks, if you bring two of these objects close by, there's a limit where after which you can't resolve the two objects. So although the resolution uh, of the optical microscope and the diffraction limit are not directly the same thing, they're correlated uh, eventually. And thereby it limits how small structure you can visualize using an optical microscope. Um, Abe was the first one to discover this um, and he, in, in 1866, they come up with a very um, famous uh, laws of physics of diffraction lim limit of optical microscope, which limits the resolution to down to around 200 to 50 nanometer using the visible light uh, in the lateral axis. And in the actual axis, it is limited to about 500 nanometer is uh, twice the words. Now, this is a problem in case of biology because your biology is much smaller than that. And this is the theoretical limit and most of the microscopes are underperforming. So for the biologist, what this means that, uh, I mean, your eyes can't see the resolution, your eyes see the contrast. But if you take an example of say, 100 nanometer objects placed close apart, like uh, again, 100 nanometer, and you try to image them using a advanced microscope, not something like what I've shown here, it's just a, a picture, you come out with a blurred image. And this blur is what has caused um, uh, a problem in the field of biology and therefore there has been a constant drive to come up with a different uh, superposition technique that led us to a near field scanning optical microscopes led us to electron microscopes led us to deep uv electron microscope uh, deep uv microscopes and all other methods but unfortunately all these methods are either near field object near field methods or will work with a fixed cell thereby doing far field optical nanoscopy was not possible and only in uh, uh, early 2000, when the field really emerged, when different kinds of method uh, are evolved to do to be able to perform uh, superposition microscopy. Now, um, just to give you an example of what a, what a gain of resolution means for the biologist, these are the images of a live liver cell uh, acquired by two of our postdoc, uh, Diana and Christina. Christina now is a professor associate professor now in the Department of uh, Medical Biology, and they were interested in looking at the very fine uh, details of you know, present on a liver uh, cell called fenestration or nano holes. And if you use the state of the art optical microscope, these are the image on the left side screen that you get. And when you use a, a structural emission microscope, which is just the double the optical resolution, we were able to visualize the nano holes present in the surface uh, membrane of the cell. And although the resolution is just improved by a factor of twice, it, the contrast improvement is factor of eight because it's on the X, Y, and Z axis. So the overall contrast improvement is a factor of eight, and it allows you to now start asking questions which you were not able to do earlier. And because of this huge impact uh, uh, optical uh, of optical nanoscopy, the Nobel Prize in 2014 in chemistry was awarded to these three gentlemen uh, for the invention of optical nanoscopy. It can be debated that it came a bit too early, but that perhaps is to show the impact this field will put in the field of biology. So that's kind of the background of the talk. Um, what uh, When I started this field in 2013 and 12, uh, these techniques were already existing there. Optical nanoscopy technique existed there, all three of them. Uh, without going into detail, what I want to convey in this slide is that there were methods based on single molecule localization, based on stimulated uh, st uh, emission depletion microscopy and structural emission microscopy. But uh, at, the problem was that none of these techniques were able to perform all the possible uh, options that a biologist is looking for. For example, resolution 
can be very high using uh, STED or localization microscopy, but they could, could not really deliver 3D and was not really compatible for live cell imaging. While SIM, on the other hand, um, was quite friendly for live cell and 3D and was also a little bit fast. Uh, the problem was that it will not uh, provide resolution better than 100 nanometer, and also it was quite expensive to own. Therefore, uh, there was no clear winner in this field and uh, that's how I started this field to start thinking because my background was on photonic chip on integrated optics to, to see if we can develop this microscopy on an integrated platform uh, then instead of changing the microscope we just have to change the chip uh, and that could perhaps lead to a better multimodality optical nanoscopy methods. So that's how it motivated us to get into this field. Um, I will go through these topic uh, today and first going to the concept of chip-based nanoscopy. What is it all about? Um, so the present, all present optical nanoscopy methods, they use a very complex microscope to perform laser beam shaping and laser delivery to the sample stage. And they use a very simple glass slide to hold the sample. What we proposed was an inverse configuration where we wanted to use a photonic chip or optical waveguide to hold the sample and to provide the light via evanescence field to the sample stage and retrofit the photonic chip to the conventional microscope converting into a superposition microscopy. So that was kind of the concept that we had uh, and all the techniques that I will discuss today in my talk are using the illumination from the waveguide using an evanescence field. Therefore, it is all 2D turf methods. So at the moment, we have not done any 3D imaging. So what we harness is the evanescence field, which is present in top of optical surface of the waveguide. Uh, when you guide a light into an optical waveguide, which is an optical kind of optical fiber based on principle, light is ref uh, reflected based on total internal reflection. And at the surface, you have the evanescence field, which, which is non-propagating and it is decays exponentially. And depending on the refractive index contrast of the media and the core, it will typically die out in first few hundred nanometer from the surface. And these evanescence field is what we harnessed in our imaging application. So then in this picture, the light is guided in a straight optical waveguide. So what are the advantages of performing this, uh, uh, this on chip? The first and the foremost advantage is that we have decoupled the uh, light illumination and collection light. In all present optical microscopy methods, they were using an objective lens to send the laser light and to collect the, uh, collect the uh, light. While in case of photonic chip, we are using uh, a photonic chip to make, to illuminate the sample, and we were using an objective lens only to collect the light. So in this way, the light paths are decoupled. And this, in a way, very similar to light sheet microscopy. Uh, besides that, it the light is not guided through the free space. Uh, so this allows us quite a lot of freedom uh, in terms of beam shaping, which is irrespective of the uh, illumination objective lens. And this opens a lot of new possibilities as I will discuss in my talk. Um, first of all, the complex light beam shaping become quite easy and straightforward. Once the light is guided into the photonic chip, you can divide them into an array. You can perform any beam shaping you like as long as you are within the laws of integrated optics. Uh, multiplexing becomes quite straightforward and all light illumination can be brought through an optical fiber right at the sample stage. Uh, there are other advantages as well. Uh, for example, in case of photonic chip, it can confine the light much more tightly, which, for example, if you use an objective lens to, sh to send the light, you are still diffraction limited. Uh, the picture here shows a light which is confined by 0 0.04 any objective lens. As opposed to this, if you can find that light inside the high refractive index optical waveguide, it's confined by the physical dimension of the waveguide itself. Uh, this does open a lot of other advantages, uh, which I will also lately show in my talk. Um, recently, we have developed this photonic chip based on a silicon substrate as well as on the glass slide, so that we, uh, as long as a cover glass, so that we can use both upright and inverted optical microscopes. Now, so how does this principle works out? Um, in conventional chip-based turf microscopy, you use a turf lens to send the laser light uh, at a bigger than a critical angle. And in case of waveguide, it's pre-aligned for us. For example, in conventional uh, turf microscope, you would have to adjust the critical angle for different wavelength. But in, in case of waveguide, it's pre-aligned. Once the light is guided inside the waveguide, all the wavelength will have will give a uniform turf excitation. 
So multiplexing become quite straightforward. Uh, in this example, what you are seeing is a three color uh, imaging of uh, LSEC liver sinusoidal cells uh, obtained in a turf illumination. And all the three wavelengths can be simultaneously coupled inside the optical chip and can be parallelly imaged. And secondly, uh, what we can also deliver is a very large field of uh, field uh, illuminated using a turf objective lens, uh, using a waveguide lens. This is an example of an image acquired by 4x objective lens. Oh. And then what we can, what we have shown here is that in, in this case of chip based illumination, you can simply change the imaging objective lens without changing the turf illumination. Whereas in case of uh, conventional turf objective lens, you are only limited to a field of view def defined by 60x turf lens because to be able to achieve that, you have to uh, come at the steep angles. Uh, we have also uh, demonstrated the large area of turf imaging uh, in case of neuron imaging. What you see here are neurons deposited on top of the photonic chip. These are the optical waveguides. This work has been done by one of my PhD student, Ida and uh, Florian. And these are the results uh, of OLA image of a turf as well as of the um, uh, epifluorescence imaging. Now going towards more on single molecule localization method, which is perhaps a little bit more interesting. Um, in, as I've explained earlier that conventional uh, resolution is limited by the diffraction limit. And in case of single molecule localization, the trick is to, uh, is to uh, decode the information in time if you can't decode the information in space. So what you do in single molecule localization, you, you turn all the molecules off and only you, uh, let subsets of the molecules to switch on. And if you know that these molecules are single molecules, you can perform two dimensional Gaussian fitting and get the center of these molecules. And what then you have to do is to, is to repeat this experiment until all the single molecules have been localized. And that's how you get a super resolution imaging. Uh, so what is really important for this is a blinking of single molecules. This method was pioneered by various researchers. And what we wanted to do is to develop this on a photonic chip. And then first thing we came across was a D-Strom method where we wanted to send the molecules off to a dark state. Um, so this is simply a Jaworski diagram of a single molecule localization method where you excite the molecules to the higher state and then you push them to a dark state, long lived dark state. And there you need to have a high intensity in the evanescence field, typically of the order of one to 10 kilowatt per centimeter square. So the first thing that we have to do was to study was to see whether we have such a high intensities on the surface or not. So that's why we used a uh, high refractive index optical waveguide material. And this is just an example of how the blinkings will look like in case of uh, 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 blinking on, on, in, in, on top of optical waveguide surface. What you see here is a photonic chip and these molecules are blinking. Uh, um, on top of an optical on uh, tantala pentoxide uh, waveguide. So once we achieve the blinking of the molecules on top of waveguide surface, we were we were just a matter of time that we will pr we produce this result. Uh, we shown that on chip optical nanoscopy working on the principles of single molecule localization, uh, and the resolution that we obtained was around 50 nanometer. This work was performed by uh, two of the PhD students, uh, Oesten and Benedict. And the, res the resolution was quite nice. The work was published in 2017. Uh, but this was the most interesting part of this result is that not only we were able to demonstrate uh, 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 optical nanoscopy using a photonic chip, we demonstrated something which was not possible earlier. The field of view of conventional uh, turf based single molecule method is around 50 by 50 micrometer at best. And what we what demonstrated was 100 times larger area because we have decoupled the illumination. So we no longer go through the objective lens. The, the, the cells are illuminated using a waveguide. So we can simply use a small 25x objective lens and image a very large area. So an area which is almost like 0.5 by 0.5 millimeter with a resolution of 70 nanometer. So we have recently also worked on intensity fluctuation methods, uh, chip-based intensity fluctuation methods. Here, uh, the trick is not to localize every molecule, but to extract statistical information stored in the in the fluctuation of the fluorescence or on the illumination itself. 
So instead of localizing all the all the molecules blinking, what you do is that you look for the statistic analysis between the fluctuating molecules and try to extract the information. So in our case, we were using optical waveguide. So we we tried to generate speckle-like illumination inside the optical waveguide and try to uh, harness that. Uh, so this is a typically how a highly highly multimoded waveguide will look like. You have lots of modes; they will interfere as they propagate. And moreover, you can use a high refractive index material, for example, titanium dioxide or tantalum pentoxide, and you can have even smaller uh, speckle pattern, which otherwise is not generated. Uh, in if you use illumination using a turf objective lens, for example. So what we did here in this work is that we can scan the input facet. So when you scan the input facet, uh, you uh, uh, illuminate different modes present in, in, the, in the chip, and you can harness that for intensity fluctuation algorithms. And or you can do more fancy engineering of light mode, for example, four beams and six beams. And this is one of the work that we are now doing with Prof. Joby and his group, where we are having a more than uh, three beams to interfere and use that uh, speckle pattern for a supervision microscopy. So we have done different ways of that. I'm not going in detail. I'm happy to talk to the audience afterwards. There are different algorithms like Musical, ESI, Sophie, Surf. These are all different softwares that you can use uh, to extract supposition information. Uh, we have shown based on ESI. We have shown based on Musical, chip-based Musical, and recently on Surf and Sophie as well. So this is uh, perhaps the last part of my talk on chip-based uh, structural emission microscopy. Um, uh, in case of structural emission microscopy, uh, we try to extract superposition information based on a uh, frequency mixing in, uh, concept. Uh, what we do is that instead of illuminating a sample with a uniform light, you illuminate the sample with the stripe patterns, and then you uh, then you do a you you try to decode the higher spatial frequency as a more fringe pattern, and by knowing which frequency you have illuminated, you can perform a complex mathematical operation to extract the super, super resolution. So what you do is that in, in, in case of SIM, you illuminate the sample. In case of 2D SIM, you illuminate the sample with nine images with these three angles of interference fringes and three phase step between them. So what we uh, propose is that instead of using, again, an uh, objective lens, we use an optical waveguide to do that. We used a contour propagating beam. Uh, the light here inside the waveguide was guided and it, it was made into a waveguide loop. The, the quantum propagating light were made interfere, that generating a turf uh, standing wave. And we use that to illuminate the sample. So that's kind of the concept of uh, chip-based SIM. Uh, this is the work pioneered again by one of my postdoc and PhD student, Frehon and Oesten. Uh, what you see here is a pseudo coloring. Let I will guide you through. So we have we to have three angles, we use three pair of waveguides let's say green, red, and blue. And to perform a phase shifting, we will change the phase between these arms. We'll take three images between this arm while other arms are switched off. Then we switch on the other arm, take three images, and likewise, we will generate nine images. How to do phase shifting? There are different ways of doing phase shifting. One is uh, phase shifting is, if I just explain the phase shifting in one, one angle, you can split the light outside the waveguide and you can change the phase step then you can get three phase step at the imaging area, or you can do everything on chip. For example, you can uh, come up with first laser light, it illuminate the sample, and then you illuminate the second waveguide arm. The second waveguide arm still illuminate the same imaging area, but now the light has gone through a different path length. Therefore, the phase will be shifted. So this is, I'm sorry, this is this should be on chip and this should be off chip. This on chip phase shifting, this is the most stable uh, phase shifting, but unfortunately you can't change it after you have fixed it. Or you can do on chip thermo optical phase shifting. So we have implemented all three of them. Uh, and this is this was simply one angle and this is three angle based setup. So this is a three angle based on uh, off uh, off phase shifting and thermo optical phase shifting and likewise. Uh, the experimental setup is a little bit simple, I would say. You have a laser, you send the laser light into an into a optical switch. An optical switch has uh, one input and nine outputs. And based on your uh, based on your input, it will decide which of the uh, fiber will be activated. And then you have a fiber adapter 
which is an array of fibers which illuminate the chip. So this is how the experiment looks like. You have uh, light interfering at the sample stage and then you can do the phase shifting. And we have demonstrated that we have done a chip based SIM experiments uh, and shown that the the chip based SIM can deliver the resolution enhancement of up to 2.4. Uh, again, uh, this is the uh, largest uh, resolution on SIM chip or on SIM method using a linear optics. Uh, people have shown plasmonics or non linear SIM with a higher resolution than that, but this still holds to be the highest in the linear uh, SIM work. This work was also published in 2020 in May. All right, so then what I hope to be convey the message that chip-based nanoscopy, we are trying to push this area where we want to integrate different chip-based, uh, different optical nanoscopy on a simple platform. Instead of investing heavily on buying different imaging modalities, what we hope is to be able to supply a photonic chip, which you can be retrofit with a conventional objective lens so that you want to change from um, same or single molecule or turf, you just need to change the chip, not the microscope. This work uh, was done uh, by lots of talented postdocs in the PhD in my group. Uh, lately, we are work has been doing together with Krishna, who has joined our group uh, in 2018. Uh, we are hiring a lot of new people in, in AI and also in uh, computational nanoscopy. And I would like to acknowledge all the funding agencies that have provided me uh, generous support over the last 10 years that has enabled us to do this work. Yeah, and that was my last slide. Uh, thank you. And I see I have used my time now, so I'll be happy to answer question. Okay, thank you very much, Belpreet, and wonderful talk. Very, very good. Thank you. So let's um, see when he... Okay, there is a question from Professor Thomas Cross. The scene is very exciting. What's next? <laughs> What's next what as in... Next? So what next within SIM or what next as in the technique? No, what else can you do with this on chip? I think this is a really nice platform. I'm just curious what else you're planning to do here. Um, thanks, Thomas. Um, yes, SIM, SIM has been done. Now, I think we have just touched the uh, top of the iceberg here uh, with terms of SIM. It has worked in the lab, but we have to make it more robust. Um, in terms of what we are really trying to do that, when you bring the platform on the photonic chip, uh, you're, you're not limited by the speed. You can go to gigahertz. So, you know, I mean, that's the whole uh, reason for our motivation to bring things on the chip. What I would really like to push is uh, label-free uh, towards using WaveGuide platform towards label-free microscopy. Uh, we have some uh, interesting ideas there. We are working on that. Uh, and other part of the project that we want, uh, Thomas, is to move from 2D to 3D, that to bring the light to the photonic chip, then go into the free space using an you know, optical phased area approach and perform some uh, exotic oh. 3D stuff. It was That's an, yeah. very exciting. No, yeah. I will definitely show, make sure to follow your work. This is very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Valpit. Hello, Prof Mehta. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, there's one question in the chat window. Can we no, take that question? Can no, I let, ask us just, question? Let, let us finish the question from the chat window first, then we will open inside the room. So there is one question. Uh, what is the minimum feature size we can go down to speaking in terms of electronics-based applications? Minimum features, we can go minimum resolution. Yeah, minimum feature size, we can, yeah, probably minimum uh, best resolution we can achieve. Speaking in terms of electronics-based applications. Electronics-based, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but if the question was really how small resolution we can see, so we can see down to 20 nanometer, that's should, based on the single molecule localization. Uh, smallest feature, if the question was more on the photonic chip itself, I think we can write structures down to 100 nanometer. I hope it has answered the question from Mr. Sanjeev Verma. So we can take the question from Professor D.S. Mehta. Okay, yes, oh. Valpi, how are you? I'm good, uh, Prof. Mehta. Oh, nice to see you, and it is a surprise, Joby. <laughs> so I saw Valpi is giving talk. So very nice talk, very important work, and uh, wonderful work. So in, in your sim, uh, this multiple beam interaction no, from different directions, what is 
area of interaction you after those uh, tips of the web guide no what is the area and how do you prepare the sample thank you um, prof mehta this is an interesting question and i think you have nailed nailed it down to a very important point here uh, is that this area at the moment is very small is around 25 by 25 micrometer square in our okay. uh, in our recent work we what we have done is instead of using a, a tapered waveguide we have let the beam diverge out in the slab region so okay. instead of this imaging area this, it has become a slab and then we have shown an imaging area of few millimeter square uh, oh. and that's actually this exactly what we are now trying to do in sim is to able to image very large areas and at very high speed so i think our sim on chip has just started uh, it's very far from being complete okay okay and and, and this uh, sample you prepare this uh, the, the interaction area is uh, with a different refractive index web guide the slab or or it could be uh, free space also it could be free space uh, as well for example this thomas uh, uh, talk you were showing about this grating couplers that could also be a very elegant way of doing that that for example if we have the large imaging areas and we can have the grating all over the surface so instead of using wave guide to deliver the light we can simply use the grating and then send the light towards the imaging area from the forts from the all the side okay 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 thank you very much and jobi i uh, yeah yeah good thank you thank you for the um, questions as well as the answers so we can close this particular um, talk uh, right now so thank you alfred for all the wonderful work and wonderful presentation and uh, let's move to the next speaker and uh, over to joy to introduce the next speaker thank you thank you okay uh, i think uh, uh, yeah it was a very nice talk uh, indeed enjoyed and uh, i think uh, umesh is there next speaker uh, umesh theory dr umesh theory yeah he is there i see he's uh, okay. yeah so uh, so dr umesh uh, yes sir I'm, i'm here i'm here yeah yeah i got it so uh, i just wanted to introduce you uh, to the audience so uh, dr theory is a phd from iit delhi uh, in 2014 uh, he did his phd work in optics and uh, optical communication technology and then uh, right now he is a principal scientist in uh, uh, csi lab csi chandigarh uh, in uh, as a, also another affiliation uh, another designation he is having that is associate professor uh, and uh, he actually uh, received several awards a uh, few names as such as csir young scientist award and then ietecoa ceoat ot award in 2020 csir raman research fellowship uh, also uh, also several uh, other awards including uh, hello of the institute of electronics and telecommunication engineering and uh, life member of national academy of science india and uh, his research interest is uh, uh, particularly fiber based grating uh, long period grating for again uh, sensor application and also his research area extended to plasmonics metamaterials optical twisting trapping using fiber nano tip Uh, so it's a vast area of research uh, as far as photonics is concerned and uh, he will be talking today uh, uh, on the recent trends and development in immobilization immobilized immobilized optical fiber biosensors i think uh, that's it uh, umesh uh, it is your stage uh, i think you have 25 minutes time yeah okay uh, i like to thanks chair for such a generous uh introduction and i also like to thanks the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of our work of we have done at csir csiu chandigarh and uh, indeed uh, it's a great a great uh, honor to me i'm speaking in front of my teachers all the teachers are there uh, from it delhi so i'm a, a, a very closely associated with the iid delhi so with this uh, i like to share my uh, presentation so i i hope the presentation is uh, yes it is visible yeah yeah 
so uh, the uh, title of my uh, today presentation is the recent trends and developments in the immobilized optical fiber bio sensors so the outline of my presentation is uh, like i just introduced like different kind of uh, optical fiber uh, sensors uh, which we are uh, basically immobilizing with the different kind of uh, analytes for the biosensing application and then uh, these are the some of the uh, things i'm uh, going to discuss uh, uh, we have uh, prepared and we have uh, designed the different kind of sensing platform using the long period fiber grating uh, for the glucose uh, sensing for the uh, triglyceride sensing then multimoded fiber break grating for the bacteria sensing sms structure based, based uh, bacteria sensing then we have also uh, uh, carried out some of the work on the 2d material uh, functionalized uh, sprs based uh, sensor for the protein sensing so and then i'll conclude my uh, talk so uh, uh, as we know like the uh, sensor is the convert uh, change in the physical parameters into a change in the magnitude of the second different parameter which can be measured more conveniently and perhaps more accurately so uh, we know like uh, the uh, even uh, uh, as a today scenario lot of these sensors are very very important for the healthcare uh, due to this pandemic like pulse oximeter is uh, very very essential uh, on our today life then uh, one of our lab also developed the fluda covid 19 uh, testing kits uh, very very uh, sensing in a less time and more accurately glucose sensor is uh, glucometer is very important for the diabetic uh, detection the uh, temperature sensor is also it's very important and it is people are scanning in every uh, entries uh, just to whether the person is having the fever or not due to the covid so as we know like the importance of the this uh, uh, sensor research is basically the uh, uh, biosensor is very very important for all these uh, biomedical diagnostics uh, then uh, food contamination detection then water contamination detection so uh, as we all know like biosensing research is very very uh, essential uh, for the uh, human safety for environmental safety and uh, for drinking water so this uh, what a, sen a sensors uh, must have basically it should have a very high sensitivity a uh, very uh, wide range response time should be very very small uh, sel selectivity very very high and it should have a very high repeatability a cost should be less so this is all like uh, requirement for a biosensor so then biosensor is basically uh, comprises of a sample then there should be a bio recognition element that can be enzyme antibody protein nucleic acids cells etc optical transducer can be spr lspr interferometers resonators grating can be the reflectometer and then this uh, the output of this uh, transducer is uh, connected with the uh, this electronics processing units which is giving a uh, uh, output to the user what is a bio optical uh, fiber sensor is basically so a sensor that is measuring the physical quantity uh, based on its modulation or intensity or spectrum phase or polarization of the light traveling through an optical fiber the advantage the, it has also offers several advantages as compared to the convention sensor like it has a compact size it has a, it can sense the multi uh, parameters so it is a multifunctional remote accessibility is uh, uh, one of the important feature of the optical fiber because if one can uh, detect from the long distances then multiplexing uh, one of the very good features like you can multiplex many many uh, sensors in one single fiber then uh, the fiber is also resistance to the harsh uh, environment so it can work in a harsh environment uh, um, conditions it is also immune to emi rfi interferences so this is the basically a structure of a bios uh, sensor is basically there is uh, bio recognition elements there is an interface and there is a transducing elements okay so this is basically that these are the things like transducer can be the uh, transducer can be the chemical or maybe physical so uh, and then there is a measurable signal then there is a bioreceptors this is basically uh, uh, functionalizing with the analytes so uh, i first discuss the uh, this uh, fiber break rating so uh, 
fiber break rating is basically it is a perturbation of the uh, periodic perturbation of the refractive index uh, in the core of the optical fiber uh, which is uh, uh, done by the uv uh, lithography and the so this periodicity is the order of the 500 nanometer to the micron it depending upon like what kind of wavelength uh, we uh, need to uh, uh, get back or uh, want, we wanted to reflect it back and then this is basically this uh, structure is governed by the uh, very well known the break conditions that is uh, basically lambda b equal to 2 into n effective into capital lambda so the n effective is the effective reflective index of the core mode lambda is the uh, this uh, periodicity or pitch so then uh, one can basically uh, play with these two parameters either n effective or lambda and you can get the shift in wavelength so these uh, both the parameters either you can sense either the strain or in the temperature so that how people are basically making the transducer in such a way so that you can sense the strain or temperature so in a more uh, detailed way like you can say like this is the uh, more physics like uh, how the refractive index is uh, uh, varying in the uh, this fiber break rating so this n object is a change in the refractive index throughout this uh, through the length so then n0 is the refractive index the uh, this uh, optical fiber delta n is the change in the refractive index due to due to the uh, uv uh, radiation then cos 2 pi by uh, 2 pi z by uh, uh, this capital lambda is the basically the phase matching condition so that uh, so in that way uh, you can get the refractive index changes r is the basically reflectivity so the reflectivity can be calculated so then 10 uh, hyperbolic square kappa l kappa is basically coupling coefficients so then uh, basically the is uh, depending upon like uh, you can, one can calculate the reflectivity if you uh, know all this uh, kappa and l l is the length of the grating so if you uh, launch a broadband light through these kind of structures so then one of the wavelength for which the grating is created is reflected back and then it acts as a wdm filter and all other wavelength they pass through another kind of uh, structure is basically this is called the long period fiber grating right that is uh, proposed by the uh, venserker and the bhatia uh, way back to 1995 so, like in this grating there is a coupling uh, between the core mode to the cladding modes so the periodicity in this grating is of the order of the 100 to uh, 1000 uh, micrometer and then this is the uh, basically transmission kind of grating where the core mode is coupled with the uh, forward propagating core mode is coupled with the cladding modes so and this is also governed by the phase condition phase matching condition ni uh, lambda i is the resonance wavelength that is basically based on the n01 is a, a fundamental core mode minus nth of the cladding mode and that basically the core mode energy is coupling with the beach cladding modes decided by this uh, periodicity so according to the periodicity uh, one can uh, basically match the uh, overlap between the core mode and cladding mode and you can get the field uh, on the surface of the optical fiber and if you uh, functionalized or coat a suitable uh, protein or antibody on the surface of the optical fiber so you can detect or you can sense the uh, desired uh, bio uh, uh, elements these are the some of the features of so that as i will not discuss because uh, because of the time constraint so uh, another kind of uh, sensor we are uh, basically i'm going to uh, uh, show you a single mode multi mode uh, structure so basically there is a mm, we are having the multi mode fiber uh, sandwich between the two single mode fiber so there is a basically the fundamental core mode is exciting only the eigen modes of the multi mode fiber and because of the phase difference between the their uh, uh, phase difference between the single mode and multi mode it is giving a very nice interference pattern and also uh, uh, <clears throat> there is a, a phase uh, this path length uh, is also playing a key role so then you have to design in such a way so that you can get a nice uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, fringe patterns at the output and if you are changing because here in the multi-mode fiber if we can reduce the diameter of this multi-mode fiber and if we can uh, reach uh, in, uh, up to the core region 
so you can easily uh, get the evanescent field on the surface of this fiber and then again you can immobilize up uh, your desired antibody or uh, desired uh, bioreceptors elements and you can uh, get a very good biosensor out of this although these kind of structures they have already demonstrated for many other sensing application like strain temperature and even also for the some the communication applications so the first of uh, the first work is basically based on the it is a enzyme immobilization on long period grating for the sensitive detection of the glucose so as we know the glucose is a very very important biological parameters for a human being right so uh, people uh, still uh, we have also tried for this kind of uh, uh, range of detection so that uh, even we can detect the diabetic or non diabetic uh, kind of uh, patient so basically this is a uh, based on the uh, covalent bonding so as we know the optical fiber uh, dimension is very it's a cylindrical structure and then it's not a flat substrate so uh, doing the this uh, immobilization is very very challenging so we have chosen the uh, this chemical route and that is called the covalent bonding so we first uh, basically treated the optical fiber surface with the uh, this uh, sulfuric acid and then that basically generating the oh bond and then it, the OH bonds they basically uh, uh, attached with the aptes and then aptes is uh, uh, giving uh, oxygen uh, uh, group and then uh, SI, uh, SiO bonds and that basically uh, uh, nicely uh, attached with the uh, amine group and amine is uh, uh, having uh, affinity with the carboxyl so then when we are putting the this GOD, GOD is basically giving the or voxel group and they are attaching very nicely on the surface of the optical fiber so this is the, the graph which is left side as you, one can see the transmitted power versus the wavelength so we have basically done it's a control uh, experiments where we have not basically uh, immobilized or uh, functionalized uh, coated the optical fiber so because as we know the optical fibers they are sensing the refractive index so this is the refractive index based sensing so even if you put the refractive index of any kind of uh, other uh, uh, solution so there you can get the shift so we have done without the uh, immobilization so then there is very very uh, minute shift or you can say th there is no shift so then we have done this with the for the just control uh, uh, experiment and then after that we have done this uh, uh, experiment with the enzyme uh, immobilized optical fiber so uh, we are getting very nice shift for the different kind of concentration of the glucose so this is the reference and then uh, we have changed the concentration is very very small quantity like 0.1 mg per ml 0.2 uh, mg per ml 3 mg per ml like that and then uh, we have also basically uh, uh, demonstrated their uh, surface morphological studies so that like whether really uh, the enzyme is uh, uh, coated nicely on the surface of the optical fiber so we have done some of the uh, same uh, imaging after the treatment so uh, the same is also shown there is a change in the surface of the optical fiber and also we have done the confocal imaging so the confocal laser uh, around 500 uh, uh, nanometer it is when it is uh, interact with the this enzyme god enzyme it is giving the fluorescence uh, basically it's a green color fluorescence so that confirms yes there is a enzyme uh, uh, activities on the surface of and there is a covalent bonding very nicely and then we have also uh, then we have done some of the performance of this kind of sensing platform so as one can see like we have changed uh, this uh, with respect to the different concentration of the glucose and this is the change in the refractive index so this is the initial test solution and this is the after the uh, god so then one can see like the change in the because of the god the change in the refractive index is uh, much uh, higher uh, because the glu when the glucose is interacting with the god a uh, glucose oxidase enzyme it is basically forming the gluconic acid and then uh, we are getting a more a change in the refractive index and that giving a very nice shift in wavelength to the uh, this optical fiber uh, sensor and then we have also shown the shift in wavelength for, uh, we have tested for the different ph values so we are getting a very 
highest uh, this uh, response at the 6.5 pH and then it is uh, uh, decreasing and then time effect is also one can see so then time effect is also it is taking around uh, to get uh, uh, its uh, uh, situation value is uh, 30 seconds so then uh, it is taking 30 around 30 seconds to uh, give, give the uh, its uh, uh, results so then one, uh, the highlights is uh, basically we have done the practical range of the signal linearity achieved for the detection of the physiological significant glucose concentration the proposed technique for the protein embolization is useful for disease diagnosis pathogen testing and study of the environmental pollutants lpg based biosensor offer fast response and much efficient and convenient signal transduction so and it has a uh, important is like it has a very low signal to noise ratio and then we have uh, reported this work then another kind of work also we have performed uh, using this uh, kind of uh, optical fiber long period grating so that we have done uh, for the uh, detection of the uh, triglyceride uh, and as we know, like pride reflects uh, also uh, one of the very, very important physiological parameter for the human being. If uh, its range is basically 150 to 200, then uh, uh, it's a normal. If it's uh, around 200, then uh, it's a borderline. If more than 200 to uh, 400, then uh, there is a, a, a risk. And uh, if it's a more than 500, then there is a severe. And the, basically, the if the higher value of this pride slide is basically uh, giving the risks for the coronary uh, diseases, right? So then here also again we have done the uh, uh, putting of the uh, this uh, antibody of this uh, uh, particular uh, PG uh, triglyceride uh, uh, enzyme, and here one can see we have done a different kind of uh, uh, experimentation just to see like how the shift in wavelength is there for the different kind of reactions like for this the uh, uh, response of the LPG for the bare LP and then after that uh, pirana solution treatment then after immobilization of the enzyme at room temperature and even we have also tested for the uh, how much the shift for the if the temperature is increased to the 37 degree. Here uh, we have uh, and then we have tested for the different concentration uh, of the like a slide so uh, one can see like at the room temperature and uh, this this uh, study and uh, the this study is at the 37 degrees celsius so we are getting a very nice shift in wavelength for the different concentration of the uh, this uh, trigger slide uh, sensing so then it is a zero millimole then seven millimole so these are the kind of uh, uh, studies we have performed this is uh, basically concentration versus the shift in wavelength, resonance wavelength. So here one can see, like we have tested again for the at, at the different uh, uh, buffer solutions. So at a different pH value. So then uh, pH at 7.4, 8, 5.5. So for the higher pH, even as well as the lower pH, right? So and you can see also the without enzyme layer and with the urea concentration also we have done so that one can see like whether there is a, some interfering uh, uh, just to confirm there is no interference for the other solutions so uh, this graph is urea concentration so there is no uh, response or no shift in wavelength uh, so there is a, it's a flight response and then you can say that we are getting the maximum uh, shift in wavelength or maximum response of the sensor at the pH value 7.4 because at that pH value there is a maximum enzyme activities uh, in the solution so uh, we are uh, so the highlight of the sensor is uh, the sensor has maximum sensitivity as 0.5 nanometer per millimolar at pH 7.4 in comparison to the sensitivity of this uh, 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 respectively for the different uh, pH values and the, the best, uh, best uh, uh, response of the sensor at 4 mg per ml solution for the this is the lipase enzyme basically for the uh, uh, sensing of the triglyceride the limit of the detection of the sensor is 17.71 mg per dl and that is equivalent to 0.2 millimolar. The another experiment we have done using the fiber break grating, as I have shown in the, our initial slides, we have uh, basically chosen the three kind of sensing platform. So then uh, another sensing platform is uh, this fiber break grating, uh, which is basically working in the reflection mode, right? So here also again, one can see, uh, people have reported a lot of work in the fiber break grating and that is a single molded fiber break rating. But here, uh, what we have demonstrated is we have uh, fabricated the fiber break rating in the multi-mode fiber. 
so the thing is like uh, to make the biosensing platform in a fiber break grating one has to uh, edge or reduce the diameter of the fiber break grating to the uh, to reach the core and core size in a single mode fiber is around 4 to 10 micrometer and if you are etching the fiber up to that diameter then it is a difficult or challenging to handle that fiber and then again you have to treat with the different kind of solution so we have done in a multimoded fiber because the core diameter of the multimode fiber is 6.2 uh, but here in our experiment we have chosen that core diameter is even higher and that is basically uh, the di core diameter is uh, 105 micrometer so that you have you need just 20 uh, micron you have to reduce the diameter to get the ivanacin field on the surface and uh, so that you can get very nice uh, 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 experiment uh, this biosensing uh, platform so here uh, we have also done basically uh, uh, for the some of the other uh, studies like temperature uh, 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 temperature discrimination study also because as we know like these kind of sensors they are uh, sensitive for both strain uh, temperature and refractive index so the thing is like if there is a, some temperature effect on the uh, this uh, sensor so the person or the observer is not knowing whether the shift in wavelength is because of the your analyte activities or due to the temperature effect so as you can see that in this multimoded fiber we are getting more than one uh, reflection peaks so this main peak is and this peak is shifting equally for the temperature response as one can see but for the ri solution for refractive index only this peak is shifting so one can subtract the uh, amount of the shift in wavelength from here for this so that and you can get the shift in wavelength uh, for the particular enzyme activities so here the ri uh, sensitivity of the sensor is basically 15.71 nanometer per rru and this sensor we have used for the bacteria detection so one can see here we have uh, taken the different concentration of the bacteria and that basically it's a in terms of the colony forming unit basically because the bacteria is forming the colony so we have chosen the concentration very very small like 10 cfu 20 cfu and still we are getting very good Umesh, you have just one minute oh sorry sir so then here also one can see like where the sensitivity is basically 15.71 we are getting very good sensitivity and the uh, uh, fwhm is 0.3 nanometer lod is uh, 7 cfu per ml so uh, and then another kind of sensor is basically uh, this as uh, this functionalized uh, yeah, mos2 kind of uh, uh, the uh, functionalization we have done uh, so so uh, i'll i'll go a little uh, uh, faster so here we have done one of the sensor is basically a uh, surface plunge mode resonance based so as we know like uh, uh, if we are coating the uh, this uh, fiber surface because the dielectric with the metal and we have coated with the gold so then there is a surface plasma resonance <coughs> generated and which is the surface plasma the propagation constant of the surface plasma babe is basically now omega by c uh, uh, root of uh, epsilon m epsilon s by epsilon m so F omega is the angular uh, frequency of the electromagnetic wave and em is the uh, basically permittivity uh, constant of the metal layer es is the uh, this uh, permittivity constant of the uh, yes, uh, uh, this uh, surface uh, so uh, here uh, we have done basically uh, just to avoid the chemistry we have done the mos2 uh, uh, functionalization the reason being uh, the mos2 uh, directly uh, attaching the protein so we don't need a, a very complex chemistry and there is no cross-linking agent is uh, required so the uh, this i am not going to uh, go to detail of the mos2 so i just show some <coughs> results so these are the like we have done the, some of the uh, control experimentation uh, without the coating of the mos2 and with the coating of the mos2 so uh, we are getting a very good uh, sensitivity uh, better sensitivity why because the mos2 is also providing uh, a more uh, larger surface to volume ratio and it is providing a more uh, binding sites up for the uh, analytes and these are the some of the uh, uh, results uh, one can see uh, shift in wavelength uh, basically uh, so for the uh, this bobin uh, protein so bobin uh, we have done because this is a very uh, uh, Good protein people are doing in all the studies basically so uh, we have also done the with the 
बीएससी एंटी वैसे kind of uh, in, uh, antibody antigen uh, reaction so here uh, we are getting very good sensitivity if it is imos to antibody psa uh, coated then uh, again some of uh, more results uh, uh, for this spectra then uh, this uh, last slide so this is the you can see the selectivity for the biosensor so this is the uh, you can see the shift in wavelength uh, for, without the mos2 and and we have also chosen the different uh interfering reagents where uh, which is having the same kind of uh, refractive index closer to the bsa so you can see here we have chosen 10 microgram per ml here for the bsa but the glucose is more even urea removes but they are uh, giving a very very less response uh, towards the uh, this uh, sensors and here again if the mos2 is coated then larger even more sensitive uh, responses there. So sensitivity is around 3135 nanometer per RIU and LOD is 0.29 microgram per ml for the this kind of sensor. So in summary, uh, I have uh, presented the various optical fiber biosensor as a new sensing platform. The enzyme embolized long period grating uh, was presented for detection of the glucose and PG triglyceride. Then uh, MSS structure and multimodal FBG based bacteria sensing and MOS2 assisted direct protein immobilization on the optical fiber for SPR biosensing prediction of the BSA is presented. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I think I've taken a few minutes. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it's okay. That's a, anyway, this is a good overview and uh, activities in fiber broad breathing based sensor and a lot of biological applications. And uh, maybe one or two questions for the audience uh, if you have. We are already exceeding two minutes. If not, yeah, if not, uh, then uh, let us thank you once again, uh, uh, Dr. Umish for, for the talk. And to, we move on to next speaker. I think, uh, Joby, you. you can introduce me yeah. the next speaker. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we have one um, oral presentation right now. That yeah. is by Mr. Anish Argov. It's available. Yeah, Anish is over there. So Anish, you can um, uh, start uh, giving your uh, screen share. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, where is your first slide? Yeah, please. First yeah, I, I, so Anish Argov is from NDL IIT New Delhi. Yeah, I'm from uh, NPL. The title of your presentation is um, Preliminary Studies of VN Thin Films for its Utility Towards Single Photon Metrology. Yeah, you can uh, take around 12 minutes, 12 to maximum 10 minutes. So please start your presentation. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, are the slides visible? Yeah, but it is not in the presentation mode. Uh, I see many slides in the window. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's in the PDF mode because uh, right now I'm at a remote place and I don't have access to PPT. So I, so I, I would like to give it uh, through a PDF file mode. Is it convenient? Is it okay? The, uh, the phone size is very, very small. Is there any way to increase the or if you keep your mobile phone? Is it on a mobile phone? Yeah, uh, it is. It is, is in, it in the landscape mode. Will it help? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just turn. I'll. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, now okay. it's visible. But, yeah, definitely, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the uh, title goes as the preliminary studies of vacuum nitrate thin films for its utility towards single photon metrology. So um, this uh, topic will cover various aspects whereby I will be starting with first the fabrication as the name already suggests that it is a thin film. So first I'll go with the fabrication part, then a few measurements that we have made on it. And uh, definitely when we are uh, working on a nano scale and uh, when we are working towards a single photon reduction, we definitely need a good system integration. And uh, why all these things are being carried out? Because uh, uh, there has to be some ultimate goal. So our main task will be then 
to develop these things and finally make it available to the industries. So uh, in this, uh, me myself is, a, is the speaker and the first author of the paper. Pratiksha has helped me in the fabrication part. Samresh, Professor Samresh Das uh, has um, helped us towards uh, uh, framing all the different different parts of this experiment. Whereas Manju Singh and Rajiv Rakshit has helped me um, towards uh, uh, utilizing it for uh, metrology uh, perspective point of view. Now, the outline of a presentation will be, I'll start with the introduction where I'll be, where I'll be talking about uh, what is SNSPD, how it works in a few slides. Then what are the main characteristics that basically governs the single photon detection um, part? Means, uh, what are the parameters that one look into it? And uh, then why I have chosen vanadium nitride as a material and uh, how the fabrication part and measurements, initial measurements have been carried out. Finally, I'll be talking on the results. Uh, now, first, the first question, why vanadium nitride and why single photon detection? Now, uh, in India, if we talk about um, emerging quantum optics and related technologies, we don't have any reference standard with which we can compare whatever the results that we are making or whatever results which we are producing. And also, now since the future is quantum, everyone is talking about that, yeah, the, for the future standards will be quantum based, where no uh, physical, uh, the, means it will be basically on, uh, based on physical uh, quantities. So there will be no any parameter which can hamper the results and it will be very much accurate. So uh, because of this major transformation, we need to have some device which is indigenously developed as well as it should have its own traceability uh, from our own uh, standard uh, laboratories. So um, this makes it uh, necessary that we should develop some technologies on our own, produce it and then use it for our own industries. Now this technique or this device is being fabricated globally by the leading NMIs such as NIST USA, PTB Germany, NRIM, NPL UK, etc. So that gives me a motivation that yes, we should work on this field and try to develop something indigenously. Now, first of all, I'll talk about the principle of SPD. Um, it basically consists of um, a thin and a narrow superconducting nanowire. Uh, by thin, I mean uh, it's around five nanometer, and by narrow, I mean about about 100 or uh, 80 to 100 nanometers. The length, it is basically a meander pattern. So the length goes in around about several micrometers and um, normally um, a square shape we use to make uh, the main patterns. Now this nanowire is then basically cooled uh, below its critical temperature and it is biased with a DC current that is uh, less than the critical current of the nanowire. So as per the normal superconductivity feature, whenever a photon falls on the nanowire, it basically breaks the Cooper pairs. And that may causes the local current, the, the critical current, which is uh, there uh, locally developed to go below than the bias current. As soon as it happens, we have a, a resistive region being formed for a very short duration and for a, with a very, very little resistance. So that gives rise to a voltage pulse indicating that we have detected a single photon. After a few minutes, again, there, uh, after a few seconds uh, or a millisecond, this superconductivity then restores and our device is ready to again detect a, another photon. Now, this is the basic principle of SPD, what you have talked about. Uh, later on, I will show you that how, which characteristics or which parameters definitely hampers the performance of this devices. Now, where, where these devices will find application? Uh, as of now, as of the literature survey which I have made, as well as uh, whatever, uh, to the best possible uh, knowledge which I have seen that the application which have turned out, it has it has reached almost each and every field from, from right from medical science where we can perform a particular imaging, a particular tomography, then uh, capturing pictures from a long distance. By long distance, I mean uh, pictures which are coming from the space to image that. Then, uh, as already I've talked about standards, yeah, from advanced quantum standards, they will all be based on these devices. Uh, quantum data processing, everybody is talking about quantum computing, cryptography. So all these are going to be come up from these devices and biotechnology. Now, uh, even the uh, uh, government of India has are making a big efforts. And as we can see that uh, a big amount is being invested uh, even uh, in this financial year also to develop some technologies 
related to quantum computing and I have a good standard backup available so that in our own country we have each and every facility and we can also uh, compete with the leading NMIs globally. Now, um, this is a great screenshot uh, on this page number six where it has been uh, said that the international system of unit has recently been recasted based on fundamental constant and for this reason it is necessary that we have to make some standard which is based on single photon now uh, coming to the topic now i will talk I'm talking about the what are the crucial snspd parameters that basically governs or that basically decide the performance of the devices well there are numbers numbers but i'll just focus on the four major parameters uh, that has been uh, uh, the people who are working globally on these four parameters to make the devices even more better and make it um, available for practical applications. Uh, there are four, the four parameters are detection efficiency uh, that basically decide whatever light is falling, how much amount of it is, uh, it is, get, it is getting reproduced or how, as soon as the light falls, how much it gets detected. Second is the dark count rate. If there is no light, we expect that there should be no any photon count because already we are working at a level of single photon and we, we, we can't uh, afford any false count rate. Timing jitter. Well, yeah, once the photon is detected, uh, we expect the pulse to arrive we, or we expect a voltage pulse. But, but there remains some uncertainty in the arrival of the output pulse uh, or the pulse which gets generated the output. That uncertainty is nothing but it's a timing jitter. Again, it should be as less as possible because we definitely want whenever a photon falls, a voltage pulse um, gets generated to the output. So, uh, so hence the timing jitter should be as low as possible. The figures which I'm showing that the detection efficiency 93%, DCR of 10 to the power minus four, timing jitter, these are all the best values that have been obtained so far. And again, the reset time, because once the photon is detected, observed, uh, hotspot region formed, again, we want our device to go back to its initial state and it should be ready for the next photon detection. So these four parameters, these four crucial parameters rather, are governed by two parameters, means intrinsic as well as extrinsic. So by intrinsic, the material which we choose for making the SNSPD, so its chemistry, its structure, its geometry, all that decides these parameters. From by external extrinsic parameters, uh, such as the temperature, the bias current which we are giving, then the wavelength at which we are working, they also affect these parameters simultaneously. So as of now, there, uh, there is not a single device that provides the best value of all these four parameters. There is a trade-off, means either uh, some group has uh, good uh, has uh, developed as an SPD with good detection efficiency, but the timing jitter is more. Some has developed good with DCR, but again, reset time is then uh, more. So like this, there's a trade-off going on. And especially for uh, detection efficiency and DCR, uh, dark count rate and reset time has been explored. But timing jitter still remains a crucial parameter because there is no uh, proper theory or stir or any uh, literature has been uh, developed or come came up come up which defines a uniform theory that yes, this is a parameter which affects the timing jitter. So it becomes it it remains a wide field, an open field which one can explore. Now, as I was talking about that, all the parameters uh, depends on the uh, geometry on this. So I, I'll uh, showing in this slide some few of the derivations where uh, LK, the kinetic inductance, definitely an SNSPD is made up of homeyendous structures. So we have a long uh, number of wires either in uh, circular form or in uh, uh, square form. So the, the, the distance between the two uh, meander lines or the gap, the distance, they all affect the kinetic inductance. And once the kinetic inductance changes, it also affects the, um, the detection efficiency of SNSPD. So in this way, we have that uh, dependence of uh, the different parameters on the detection efficiency part. Next is the timing jitter. Now, one, you can see what the graph which I'm trying to show. Uh, there you can see that the critical temperature, TC, um, uh, which you can see that when the timing jitter is for less TC, we have more timing jitter. For more, when the TC is more, we have less timing jitter. But as TC will increase, it will affect the inductance, which will cause the detection efficiency to go down. So in this way, all these uh, parameters or all these uh, um, part are affecting one or the other parameter simultaneously. 
and that uh, gives us a reason to explore the even new materials which can provide us with a good solution and so on uh, this is a table which shows that um, yeah there are different materials which have been explored by different groups so you can see that niobium nitride is one of the most explored uh, material please for SNSP. next one minute please finish in one minute yeah okay so we have uh, this we can see that yeah uh, there were different trade-offs and uh, then uh, vanadium nitride has not been explored much so i have chosen vanadium nitride as a material now we have fabricated vanadium nitride under different growth conditions uh, with uh, at uh, the temperature of about 600 degrees Celsius with different nitrogen argon contents starting from 1 ratio to 5 to 5 ratio to 5. And this is the figure which I'm showing in the mid is a is a micro bridge that we are going to pattern out. The few measurement results uh, which I'm showing that since uh, vanadium nitride was a new material and it has not been explored so far, so we have tested it for superconductivity. And yes, uh, we have uh, achieved a good, uh, it, it, they show superconducting transition with a TC ranging around 7.2 kelvin to 8 kelvin and the delta of 0.1 kelvin also with the nitrogen content we have seen that the tc varies so uh, with the nitride uh, usually the behavior is non-linear but uh, here is a linear behavior is coming up so even i think a few more samples are needed to come to a quick conclusion of uh, on it we have performed the empty measurement and uh, we uh, the transition appears to be diamagnetic and the diffusivity we calculated because diffusivity is one of the major parameters that will define the uh, the region where the superconductivity gets restored. So we it, it came out to be 10 to the power centi uh, 10 centimeters square per second for a 100 nanometer film. EDX analysis again confirms that yes, vanadium nitride is a suitable material. It shows the presence of vanadium nitrogen in the same ratio as we wanted. And even SAM analysis shows a smooth texture of the film. XRD analysis has also been carried out and uh, we got an orientation of good to uh, 200. And it shows us both the peaks, uh, Vn, as well as MGO substrate we used. So with this, uh, I'll conclude that, uh, yeah, it's a new material, a new magic material. And it, uh, a lot of uh, analysis has to be even more done. But initial studies shows that, yes, vanadium uh, nitrate is a good material to be explored for SNSPD application. And we expect that, yeah, we will achieve a good efficiency as well as a good timing jitter with this material. With that, I thanks to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Anish Parker. And let's yeah. open for the uh, question. question in the chat. There is no question in the chat. Anybody in the audience with any question? If not, uh, we will thank uh, Mr. Anish Parker for his uh, good work and the presentation. Thank you very much. So, with this, Thank we you. are at the end of the current session so we will have the next session starting at four o'clock in this hall so thank you vijay for being with me for sharing this session yeah thank yeah. you Jabi, for giving me opportunity also it's a good thank session you. yeah we enjoy thank it yeah thank, thank you. you thank you thank you everybody and uh, we will assemble here in the same hall at uh, with the same link at four o'clock for the last session of this conference in this uh, botanic session Thank you.
Hello. Yeah, hello, yes, Ajinda. Hello, hello, Professor. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. Thank you. Last day? Yeah, last day and the last session. <laughs> Dr. Dixit, uh, so yeah. um, we will start after 10 minutes or so. And, sure. Yeah. And sure. also, you have the biodata of the speakers with you? Or you yes. Yes. yes, I have. Yes. First, first one and the third one, you can introduce. The second one, I can introduce. Okay. So we like uh, all three speakers will be there or? Yeah, I suppose so because the other two are from USA. I hope they will join at their time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's very early okay. morning for them. So. Okay. Okay. I suppose the first speaker is already. I think he yeah. has already joined. Yeah. is here already. Ajanta Benugabal is already. Right, right. So it is, this is going to an end, like this is the last session. That's correct, this is the last session.
Hello, Ajanta. You can just see whether your slides are getting displayed correctly. Yeah, good. Uh, is it okay to share this like this or shall I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can keep it. No problem. You can keep it. No Maybe Professor Venu Gopal, you may come on video also. Yes, I'll start. Okay. Hi. Hello. Anyway, Amit also has joined, so it's very, very oh. early for me. But I think this will be five thirty, something like that. Very hot. Yeah, I hope so. Hi, Amit. What time it is for you there? What time is the uh, time for Amit Agarwal? Uh, I was asking Amit Agarwal. 5.30 a.m. Okay. Uh, hi, Amit. Hi, 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 Jinder. I mean, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, yeah it's super early. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking to put you in the late night, so much late or early morning. We finally decided <laughs> you must be waking up early. So <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, okay, you're a young man, so you can make it. <laughs> yeah, he has two babies at home. Right. He gave a tutorial when that was very late for him. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they just don't. Okay. Okay. I think we can start the session. Okay. Okay, so I'll just introduce um, the audience, the chair, uh, you will be taking the chair, I am a chair, of course, with you. Um, for the audience, I will just introduce uh, the co-chair who is with me today. It is uh, Professor Dixit. And who is from RRCAT Indoor, and he has been working in RRCAT uh, from 1990. 1987, it's a very, very long time. So, <laughs> a long time in RRCAT. And uh, he did a PhD from Devi Ahilya Vishwadhyaya Indore in 1996 and did the postdoctoral work at Oxford University and also at various uh, laboratories around the world. And he has almost 200 publications and edited books. And he is currently leading the fiber sensors and optical spectroscopy activities at Cat Indoor. And also, he is a professor at Homi Baba National Institute. So, please uh, start your chairing the session, please, uh, by introducing okay. the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joseph. Now, this session is going to be the last session before the concluding session. So, we have to make the time. And the first uh, speaker, uh, he is Professor Achanta Venugrupal. And my, it is my pleasure to introduce him. Professor Venu Gopal obtained PhD in physics from TFR Mumbai and PhD in electronics from Tokyo University, Japan. He worked as a NEDO fellow at FESTA Laboratories, Japan, and as J fellow in NEC Corporation, Japan during 2000, 2004. He joined TFR as a faculty in 2004 and currently a professor. His research interests are nanophotonics and planar architecture for classical and quantum information processing. He has more than 120 journal publications. He is on the editorial board of Scientific Reports, Frontiers and Encyclopedia of Applied Physics. He is a senior member of IEEE, a member of OSA. He is, he is executive council member of Optical Society of India. Now, I invite Professor uh, Venugopal to start his talk. Your time is 
about 25 minutes, five minute advance, I will prompt you. Thank you. You may start now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dixit. Um, so I'll be talking about flexiton dynamics. Um, yep. So uh, we know uh, particle plasmons, which are uh, um, oscillation of these free electrons in the surface of a metal nanoparticle. So when we have a uh, incident electric field or electromagnetic field, the electric field oscillation during the positive half cycle, uh, the electrons are pushed down, and then during the negative half cycle, the electrons uh, are pushed to the top of the metal nanoparticle. So you can have a resonant coupling between the incident electric field and the this resonant oscillation, and can transfer energy from incident field to the uh, localized plasmon mode or the particle plasmon mode. Similar thing, we can also have surface plasmon polaritons at the metal dielectric interface. So if you have planar interface of a metal and a dielectric, you can excite these plasmon surface plasmon polaritons which travel along this interface. So away from the interface, you have decaying fields and the dispersion relation is given by this Kx uh, relation, which is here. So to overcome the momentum mismatch between the light, which is the, the light line is given by this dashed line and the uh, plasma momentum is uh, the dispersion is plotted by this uh, um, line, a black line here, black continuous line uh, in, the, in the third floor. So to overcome this momentum mismatch, like so we use different techniques like prism coupling or grating coupling or, or waveguide coupling. So um, this is about the plasmons and excitons in nanoparticles are very well known in semiconductors and quantum confined structures. Excitons are well known. And the couple, strongly coupled plasmons and excitons are of interest for uh, over a decade now. So the interest is to look at like uh, novel states and uh, to go to regimes which are uh, non perturbative in, in nature. Right? I'll be talking about these things in, in this talk. So um, people talked about uh, core shell structures where you have a metal uh, nanoparticle with uh, organic semiconductor like like a, like a G aggregate um, surrounding it, and different size particles have been probed, and uh, they showed that like you can either have a dipole or a quadrupolar modes. The dipole is much stronger, which leads to stronger coupling between the plasmons and the excitons. And uh, people also have seen a single uh, nanoparticle with a dye, uh, close to a dye, and uh, they looked at uh, the coupling between the plasmons uh, from the particle plasmon and the dye molecules. So other uh, more recent ones, uh, so this is a single molecule uh, strong coupling uh, report from uh, Bomberg's group, and this is uh, WSC2 excitons coupled to plasmons uh, in, a, in a AG, I mean, uh, this is a silver nanocube, so this is more recent one, and people are also proposing structures where you can electrically control the flexiton dynamics. So here, like you have a FET uh, FET structure where you can control the the dynamics between the plasmon and the exciton by uh, by tuning the gate voltage. So if you are looking at the interaction uh, picture, so the Rabi model for the two-level system, you can have a non-interacting or uncoupled Hamiltonian system, which is like you have the two-level system uh, given by the first term and the electromagnetic field given by the second term, A dagger and A or the creation and annihilation operators. You can look at the quantum Rabi model where you have this third term, which is the interaction between the two-level system with the electromagnetic field, in which if we apply uh, the rotating wave approximation or in the perturbative regime, we ignore the fast uh, rotating terms like for example a dagger sigma plus and a sigma minus terms are ignored in in this it, uh, sigma x has sigma plus and sigma minus components so you can uh, uh, separate them out and ignore these fast moving terms so then you end up with the james Cummings hamiltonian which is mostly used in the perturbative regime right. so if you are looking at different coupling regimes so the coupling between the with the two level system and the electromagnetic field can be characterized by this G, which is a coupling strength, which is will be related to these damping coefficients, gamma one, gamma two, which are the, the decay components. Right? Uh, so for example, in the weak coupling regime, you can have effects like Fano effect, uh, electromagnetically induced transparency, portal enhancement. Uh, and in the strong coupling regime, you can see uh, Rabi splitting, that G, the coupling constant is greater than the losses in the cavity, as well as the um, 
lifetime of the two level uh, system okay. the polar term. so in the non perturbative regime which are the ultra strong and deep uh, strong coupling regimes which are of current interest your g by omega uh, is of the order of like 0.1 uh, greater than 0.1 for ultra strong and if it is g by omega is greater than 1 omega is a resonance frequency so here the coupling is comparable to the frequency and not to the losses so you go to these part non perturbative regions where your frequency shifts or or the effect of coupling is as large as your uh, resonance frequency okay. so there are different coupling regimes which are reported so just to show in a pictorial way in the weak coupling regime so you can have parcel effect so where you see um, reduction in the radiative uh, lifetimes which means like you have enhanced emission from uh, in the weak coupling regime and in the strong coupling regime, you can have quantum Rabi oscillations, right? And in the ultra strong regime, and and also like splitting of the energy levels and uh, anti crossings are reported in the strong coupling regime. In the ultra strong uh, regime, uh, like so you go to um, um, cases like where where you have density dependent uh, coupling term, like so you have large number of. Uh, um, uh, two level systems where uh, the, the effective coupling strength can be G prime is G times square root 10 and is the number of two level systems. Or you can have a very, very high Q cavity with a single molecule. So there also like you can get a uh, ultra strong coupling. So you can have um, applications in modified opto electronics and uh, quantum vacuum emission. So in these non perturbative regimes of ultra strong and deep strong, so even the vacuum state is expected to be uh, modified. So this is mostly interesting for the quantum information processing. So if you look at the um, literature, so this is taken from these two review articles. So basically there is a lot of work in the um, weak and strong coupling regime, but the ultra strong uh, coupling regime, there are very few handful of reports so far. And uh, in the deep strong coupling, like there is only uh, one system that's in the superconducting qubits where uh, uh, G by omega greater than one has been shown. Uh, so far. Okay. So our own work, like so we have been uh, working in different regimes, for example, in uh, photonic crystal micro cavities with a single quantum dot, we showed uh, by temperature tuning that like we can bring the quantum dot resonance matching with that of the cavity resonance, in which case like you'll have this uh, uh, personal enhancement and enhancement of the quantum dot emission. So here the Q factors are of the order of like 6000. So in the weak coupling regime, we see this uh, uh, thing. So we're, we're probing this for, uh, we probe this in for uh, single photon emission from these uh, structures. Okay. So we also have seen plasmon mediated uh, enhanced emission from uh, zinc oxide, zinc sulfide nanoparticles, like where we see, where we have seen about 10 times enhancement because of uh, encapsulation as well as the plasmon mediation. Compared to unpatterned metal, the patterned metal shows about uh, 2.5 times enhancement and a completely linear uh, growth with respect to the pump uh, uh, power. Okay. So in, in the uh, plasmon plasmon interaction, so we have reported like, for example, strong coupling regime where the, uh, the interaction of the in-plane propagating modes, um, so they inter interfere with each other, they interact with each other, and the coupling leads to these uh, uh, anti-crossings which are highlighted by these rectangular boxes. So you can see different uh, areas, like the so different regions where you can see these uh, modes which are uh, not crossing, but they are anti-crossing each other. Okay. So more recently, like we have shown that you can uh, enhance the personal factor as well as the collection efficiency for quantum dots, which are embedded in, inside the central region of a five layer hyperbolic metamaterial with a nano antenna on top. So uh, this gives like very directional emission um, from the quantum dot emission. Okay. So uh, these are some experimental results. These, these are uh, optical images and uh, and the uh, AFM uh, images of uh, the structures. So each of the dot corresponds to the uh, nano antenna, which we probed a large number of them. So initially we optically identify which are the bright antennas and then probe them uh, for the emission uh, statistics. So we see um, the expected um, reduction in the uh, in the uh, decay time when the um, when the plasmons uh, 
when the when the quantum dot emission is coupled to the um, nano antenna board. Right? So we saw about 200 times enhancement in emission as well as like 40 percent uh, collection efficiency from quantum dots, which are embedded in these uh, hyperbolic matter materials. So we also uh, recently proposed a uh, non-classical light generation because of uh, quantum dots, uh, which are in close proximity with a <clears throat> metal uh, um, edge. So what we showed is that like you can generate these so-called null states. So if you have, for example, two dots, we can have plus one mediation between these two quantum dots, which leads to null state generation, which means all the photons will be either in the detector one or in the detector two path. So if you have n number of um, quantum dots which are close together, if they are um, coupled by this uh, um, plasmonic mode, so then we can have all the n photons emitted in, in one of the two uh, given paths. Okay. So um, this is the known state generation, which is plus one mediated uh, quantum dot coupling. Okay. So if you look at periodic structures, for example, a one degree T, a plasmonic crystal, so what you see is geometric resonances, which means like uh, if you change the, I mean, this is a dispersion plot, uh, wavelength versus angle or uh, omega versus uh, K, uh, K is the momentum. So in this case, like what you see is like if you change your incident angle or the K direction, you're also changing your, your uh, uh, resonant wavelength. And in addition to that, you also change your lifetime. Right, so because the line width of this mode is changing, so this is calculated dispersion for the grating given by this. Right, so we also measured this and compared. But um, for the point of this is like if you have periodic uh, structure, metal dielectric structures of different uh, dimensions, you have these geometrical resonances, which will have, which will depend on your uh, uh, dimensions of your periodic structure. Right. Now what we showed is um, this. Uh, um, periodic versus quasi-periodic. We are working on these quasi-periodic structures for almost like five, six years now. So where we showed that compared to if, if you have same density of scattering elements, uh, which are arranged in a square lattice and a quasi-periodic lattice, we showed that the quasi-periodic lattice is a very dense case space, which leads to um, a, a band of, uh, I'm sorry, a band of uh, um, plasmon modes, which are dispersion based. So we designed such structures and then looked at their uh, um, statistics. So which showed that like, so basically we, um, this is a hyper uniform structure. The, the pattern which we are generating, the quasi periodic pattern is a hyper uniform structure with 80% uh, randomness in the structure, which we know because if we get a reference uh, um, scattering element and look at the nearest and next nearest uh, neighbor, distances and the angular distribution we see that like more and more as we go to higher uh, or the next nearest neighbors next to next nearest neighbors the more and more uh, uh, scattering elements are coming in non pi by phi angles which leads to randomness in the structure right so this is the cm image of one of the pattern structures um, interestingly like so if you compare the optical constants and then k values of uh, bulk gold uh, versus PLQC or unpatterned gold versus PLQC of the same thickness, you see that like their NNK values are, are pretty similar. The whole uh, distribution um, leads to a fill factor of air of uh, less than 10 percent in this structure. Okay. But if you look at the uh, response compared to unpatterned metal, like we get about uh, 10 times enhancement in uh, in uh, transmission. So this is a plasma mediated transmission over a band of uh, um, wavelengths, right? So this red band is uh, shows the dispersionless uh, plasma band, okay? and this also has interesting nonlinear properties. So we showed second harmonic generation uh, from these structures in the entire band, which uh, shows like plasma uh, enhancement. Okay? So uh, one interesting aspect in this is like so, what are the carrier dynamics? Hot carrier dynamics in in uh, uh, plasmonic structures. So the nanoparticles have been well studied. So there are three time scales basically. So in the first step, like so the plasmons which are excited, so they go to non thermal hot carriers. So the plasmon mode um, decays into hot carriers, high energetic electrons. And then these high energetic electrons, uh, due to electron electron scattering, so they thermalize themselves over a time scale of 100 femtoseconds. 
then these uh, thermalized hot carriers, high energy electrons, they interact with the phonons and then uh, they um, they uh, decay down in the energy scale. So that happens over one picosecond in time scale. Right? So as I said, like in a, in a this is okay for nanopart nanoparticles, but if you're looking at uh, um, looking at plasmonic uh, surface plasma polaritons, we wanted to get uh, uh, the geometry independent uh, dynamics. So we studied these dynamics in in the in the plasmonic quasi crystal because uh, we have dispersionless uh, plasmons in this. So we considered the band structure of gold and accordingly like chosen four different uh, uh, pump conditions. So in the initial 500 nanometer, we are ex exciting this 5D to 6SP uh, interband excitation of electrons. This is a free carrier excitation. And in the 575 nanometer excitation at the L band, like so we basically excite the high energy plasmons. This is again interband plasmons. And at 650 nanometer, we chose uh, to excite simultaneously the interband excitations at X point and interband excitation at the L symmetry point. Then at 800 nanometer, we have the uh, low energy plasmon excitation. So this is the resonant uh, uh, condition. So the probe is always chosen to be at the low energy uh, plasma mode. Okay. So we looked at the dynamics. So we see um, linear uh, dependence for uh, free carrier and plasma excitation. But uh, for 650 nanometer, we see a quadratic dependence showing that like there is a uh, alternate pathway for the for the hot hot carriers to decay down to. So you have two uh, valleys to which like um, the, the hot electrons can decay down to. Okay. So accordingly, the the rise and decay times are uh, different, and uh, uh, we did all these uh, studies in, in detail. Okay. So for the purpose of this talk, like, so I'll be concentrating in the next uh, uh, five six minutes on the plasmon exciton coupling. Right. So we have a broadband dispersionless plasmonic system, uh, which has broadband linear transmission enhancement. The strong local field leads to harmonic generation, and the plasmon dynamics are limited only by the metal band structure. Uh, and we have very interesting near field properties, which are not covered here. Um, but um, for the uh, next step, like so, we'd like to look at would this strong local field correspond to enhanced interaction between plasmons and excitons, and could we go to non-perturbative regimes, or under what conditions we can reach the non-perturbative um, coupling regimes between plasmons and excitons. Okay. So we the, the structure which we studied is like this: like we have a quartz substrate, a 50 nanometer thick gold, uh, which is patterned to have uh, plasmonic uh, quasi uh, periodic structure, and uh, we have a 10 nanometer thick SiO2 so that image charge doesn't kill the excitons in the quantum dots. And then we spin coated quantum dots on the top at, at different speeds so that we can control the density of quantum dots on the top. If you look at the bare quantum dots, you get the quantum dot resonance as 665 nanometers. So we chose two different conditions. The pump is at 400 nanometers or at 665 nanometers. At 665, we have resonant pump probe. And at 400, we are exciting the free carriers in the quantum dot. And uh, the, the probe is always at 665, matching with the quantum dot resonance. Uh, interesting point is like we have a very broadband uh, plasmon resonance. So the 665 also corresponds to plasmon excitation. So these are the uh, SEM and AFM images from which we estimated the quantum dot densities. Uh, here I'll report two different uh, densities. So one is of 150 uh, quantum dots per micrometer square, and the other one has 2 into 10 power 5 quantum dots per micrometer square. Okay. So uh, the interesting aspects are like first we looked at the PL compared to the um, Bare quantum dots, we measured the PL on, on plain gold, that's unpatterned gold, and on uh, quasi periodic pattern. We see that like both of them are blue shifted compared to the uh, compared to the um, bare quantum dots, and uh, there is a red shift between the gold and the um, PLQC uh, quantum dots. Quantum dots on PLQC are red shifted from those corresponding to the those on the uh, plain gold. So, so the pump probe dynamics show um, 
something interesting like this. So there is a very long decay, but then there is a uh, little faster component here. And when we zoomed in this region and did high resolution measurements, we see these oscillations in the uh, in, in the time dynamics. So the oscillation period is about 0.85 terahertz. And the Fourier transform also shows at 0.5 terahertz. So the fit here is a, is a modified two temperature model. And what is interesting is that like these oscillations are lasting much longer than the plasma lifetime. The plasma lifetime, uh, as I showed in the bare plasmonic quasi crystal, as well as in the in, in this with quantum dots, um, we have uh, about one picosecond lifetime. So one to two picosecond, depending on the excitation intensity. The plasma lifetime is the order of that, but then these oscillations are lasting up to 30 picosecond or longer. Okay. So we did, uh, this is in the transmission, is the delta T, a differential transmission with and without the pump beam. And uh, we did the simultaneous uh, reflection and transmission measurements. So the delta R doesn't show those oscillations. There is a very weak five, oscillation. Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. So okay. there are, um, oscillations, weak oscillations at much longer, uh, uh, slightly longer frequency, but these are very weak, right? So if you go to uh, low density quantum dots, we do not see these oscillations. And uh, uh, so what these dynamics show is that like, so we have uh, different reflection and transmission dynamics. So the, um, the reflection and transmission delta R, delta T are different for PLQC as well as gold structures because in one case you have plasmons, in the other case you don't do not have plasmons, and the transmission involves the plasma mediation, right? Uh, but the reflection is mo mostly governed by the uh, exciton absorption in the top quantum dot layer, or uh, when the uh, free carriers are generated, like you have more metallic nature, which leads to a, a positive delta R compared to delta R negative when you have absorption in, in the quantum dot layer. Right? So you can distinguish between the process of delta R and delta T reflection transmission process in, in these structures. Right? So um, we um, did the extensive, uh, um, both semi-classical as well as uh, full quantum Rabi model calculations. So the calculations involve a three level model. So you have a common ground state, and you have these two plasmons corresponding to uh, two uh, excited states, E2, E3, corresponding to the two uh, plasmon modes, which are separated um, by these uh, energy separation corresponding to the Rabi oscillations. And then we introduced Z2 is equal to zero. So there is no direct coupling between the excitons because these quantum dot clusters are, are spatially separated. So we do not expect uh, coupling, direct coupling between these uh, uh, quantum dot clusters. So the G2 is zero. But still, under with the dynamic uh, the decay times and rise times taken from the experiment, like when you put in the model, what we see is uh, we can get uh, plasma mediated exit on exit on coupling, and uh, uh, that leads to G by omega of about 0 0.441, which is uh, for the high density resonant excitation case. So we have ultra strong uh, coupling. So the coupling is between excitons and excitons which are mediated by the, the coupling is mediated by the plasma. So the uh, excitons which are emitted um, by the quantum dot clusters in the hotspot regions. So they they excite the couple to the plasmons and then those plasmons basically uh, excite other quantum dot clusters. And, and this leads to the coupling between these two uh, excitonic clusters. So that's the mechanism which uh, uh, shows that like we have uh, ultra strong coupling at, at uh, two into 10 power five quantum dot density. So just to summarize, like so the plexitons are currently coupled uh, plasmon exciton state, plasmon exciton coupled states. These uh, the dynamics are interesting for novel device applications, including light emitters. Now, cavity quantum electrodynamics has evolved from uh, perturbative regime to non-perturbative regime. And uh, um, more recently, like systems exhibiting ultra strong coupling are being pursued for their rich physics as well as for applications in quantum information processing. So we are showing plasmonic quasi crystals with the quantum dots on top, on top um, plasmon mediated exciton exciton coupling, uh, which is in the ultra strong non perturbative regime at ambient conditions. So unlike the superconducting uh, or other systems which have been shown so far, we have um, at room temperature under under uh, ambient conditions. So 
Thank you. So these are the acknowledgements. This work is mostly the thesis work of uh, Baloj Naik. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Venikopal, for a very nice talk. And uh, normally, as I understand, uh, people should ask question on chat box. And uh, I see right now. Question. I have a question here because um, you told that um, you have a pump and probe wavelength varying from 500 to say 800. I suppose that you are taking this from Tyson Fair laser, right? Yeah, it's an amplifier laser, Tyson Fair, yes. Okay. And uh, this, uh, in the last slide, you told that uh, from novel light emitters, uh, this study will be going to be very useful. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the applications in the, in, in the, because this is ICEE, I thought like I'll just show about that. Like, so there's like light emitting plexitons is one, one idea people are looking at. So if you go to a plexitons, like, so we are basically splitting your exciton mode into two modes in the strong coupling right. regime. Right. So you can generate like multiple colors because of these uh, uh, strong coupling uh, features. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, this would be interesting to generate like uh, new, uh, light emitting states. Okay. So Joseph, sir, what do we do? Like yeah. uh, there is no so, question on chat box. Yeah, so yeah. We... more questions from the audience here in this hall. No more. If so, then we can go to the next. So now uh, let me thank uh, Professor Vanigo for a very nice talk. It is I know this is a very recent subject, and uh, it is gaining a lot of attention. And I also know that to ask questions, this audience should at least be in resonance with that field because this is the advanced field. So thank you very much, Professor Ravi Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Now the thank next you. speaker uh, is uh, Professor Dr. Amit Agrawal from NIST. Dr. Amit, ah, yes, you are there, right? Hi, hi. Okay. So now uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Amit Agrawal. Uh, Dr. Amit Agrawal is currently a project leader at NIST at Gethersburg, MD, USA, and an associate research scientist at the IREAP of the University of Maryland at College Park. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Utah, followed by a postdoc at NIST. He then joined the faculty of Syracuse University as the inaugural John E. and Patricia Brewer Professor in Electrical Engineering in the EECS department. His current interests are focused on developing integrated nanophotonic device architectures operating from the ultraviolet to the infrared for quantum optics applications, including atom trapping and frequency comm. I suppose this is going to be a very nice talk. Professor Amit Agarwal to I'll give his talk. You have got about 25 minutes, and at 20 minutes, I will prompt you. Thank you. You may start now. Thank you, Dr. Dixit, for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. No, everything is okay. okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Joseph, for the uh, great, uh, uh, kind uh, invitation and, and for the kind introduction. And, and so, uh, for I, uh, my name is Amit Agrawal and I'm going to be uh, talking about some of our recent work on using flat optics and I'll talk about that in a second, what I mean by that, mostly for an atom physics perspective, okay? And so part of my talk is not going to uh, spend too much time on talking about flat optics or their applications uh, in general, but uh, sort of the assumption in the talk is that some of you in the audience are familiar with uh, the work on uh, meta surfaces, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll be happy to answer any question at the end of the talk. Okay, so this is my group. Uh, it's, it's mostly five postdocs. Uh, some of them are very nano fabrication oriented people. Some of them uh, do the measurements, and so we collaborate with Cindy Regal's group at Jilla in Boulder, Scott Papp's group at, in Boulder, and and Vladimir Axios group here at Nest uh, on some of the work that I'm going to be presenting. I think all the nanofab that I will be showing you is done at NIST nanofab here, and and uh, our work is supported by a, a research agreement between Maryland and NIST, as well as funding from uh, Army and, and DARPA. Okay, so the 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 question that I'm going to be answering, uh, uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, is is how to move laser cooled atoms or ions out of a lab. 
Okay, so if you are familiar with uh, this idea of trapping uh, either a single atom or an ensemble of atoms or single ions, and these uh, atoms or ions, they have uh, seen a resurgence in, in interest because they serve as a calibration-free measurement platform for various applications such as atomic clocks, gyroscopes, magnetometers. And they are also uh, in the second quantum revolution that we are seeing, they are also leading components for for uh, single photon sources, quantum memories, or, or atomic qubits. It, but if you look at the, the picture on the top, uh, if you go to at any atom physics lab in the country, in India, here, uh, or in the US, uh, this is how typically it looks like. A number of different laser beams comes. Uh, comes there are mod coils around, and then things are very, very complicated and, uh, to achieve what you've done. But then really, if these applications are to be possible, then one has to move these laser cooled atoms out of the lab to say uh, a field. And, and so the transition is probably, you can already see it if in the literature uh, over the last decade or so, where people went from a lab scale system to miniaturized systems uh, work done here at NEST, where these things are on the order of say a few inches, uh, but still needs a number of different free space optical uh, light, which is fibers and whatnot, to a simplified system, which is a single beam system that takes an optical fiber, but still needs free space optics, such as lenses and quarter wave plates and, and, mod uh, and, and grating chips. To trap single atoms and, and 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 really only in the last few years we are seeing some examples of very small uh, components of such a system that could be fully integrated and, and and manufactured so the goal of our work is is to develop a set of planar optics or just one planar optic that can enable laser cooling uh and then you transition from uh, optic side experiments to manufacturable systems that you can take to the field okay and then if you can do that, then 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 all of these applications that I've talked about, they become real and 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 uh, and and uh, applicable. OK, so my talk is going to give uh, a slight summary of uh, why we are interested in atomic clocks and where is the market for it. And then I'm going to talk about uh, this this platform that uses photonic integrated circuits and metasurfaces to trap atoms. And we have now an experiment that that clearly show that we can trap single atoms. And then I'll talk about some other uh, experiments that are currently underway, both in our group and some other groups, to to uh, again show the capabilities of of this this uh, this idea of using photonic integrated circuits to trap atoms. All right. So if we look at a a, a simplified energy diagram of of say uh, an atom, then then from the optical clock perspective, if you are trying to make an optical clock or, or optical atomic clock. Uh, then usually you are you are probing what is called the 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 dipole transition of the of the, of the atom, which is is quite high frequency in the hundreds of terahertz in optical frequencies. So naturally, to to probe this transition, uh, a, a source that is used is, is laser. Uh, you use the laser electric field to probe this transition, and therefore your local oscillator is a, is a laser. But what is amazing is that you may have heard the word optical atomic clock. Uh, Quite a bit over the last 30, 40 years, but there's no single commercial product as of today that is uh, out there that that where a company makes these things uh, an optical atomic clock for for a variety of applications. Whereas if you look at microwave atomic clocks, then you are prob probing the hyperfine transitions of an atom, which is this this sub levels, and therefore you use a quartz oscillator or so, and 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 then together with a frequency multiplier to go up to the RF frequencies. And, and this microwave atomic clock is the basis for all commercial atomic clocks that are out there. Okay. So now if I open my uh, uh, a microwave atomic clock, this is kind of how it looks like. It's pretty amazing to me that a mi in a microwave atomic clock, there's a, there's a free space optical experiment going on. There's a Vixel at the bottom, which is a light, light source. Then there's a quarter wave plate. <clears throat> and then you go through this, this free area, which is where the atoms are, an ensemble of atoms in this case. Yes, and then there's a photo detector on the top. So you're basically measuring an absorption resonance here, uh, and you're driving your laser using a microwave synthesizer to probe this hyperfine transition. Okay. So now if I try to make an atomic clock out of it, then the number that matters uh, that you may have seen thrown around is what is called ADEV or uh, Allen deviation of, which is my standard deviation of of uh, my clock, which is how much time I lose if I go, let's say, uh, one second, and 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 that. That ADEV number is given by one over square, one over qua, uh, quality factor times signal to noise ratio. Oh, and quality factor is equals to if you want, uh, any resonance is equals to uh, my carrier frequency divided by my resonance fine width. So now you can already see 
that in microwave atomic clocks, my carrier frequency is in the gigahertz regime. Therefore, my Allen deviation is related to my Q is limited by my carrier frequency, and therefore my Allen deviation cannot be very small, right? Because I'm using microwave frequencies. And so the limit of uh, ADAB limit, which is how, how accurate my clock can be, he is is in the order of 10 to the minus per, uh, minus 13 sec uh, at one second. Okay. Hey, so, um, but if you now uh, look at the, the two boxes, that is the matchsticks, uh, match, match box size uh, uh, picture that you see here are commercial atomic clocks. They look like um, very, very small boxes that you can buy. Currently, they cost around two, three thousand dollars and they can give you this frequency stability. So what is what is uh, great about these is that they have huge market penetration. If you buy a lock-in amplifier, say from uh, Zurich Instruments, there is one of these atomic clocks in there. Uh, so, uh, so there's a lot of need for it. And for a lot of applications, you don't need a, a time stability that is better than this. Okay, the best uh, atomic clock that is used to define time standard today, which is done here at test, the using cesium atomic transitions is uh, in the order of 10 to the minus 18 uh, at one second ADAV. Okay, and, and that's an optical atomic clock. So if I now go to optical atomic clock, the, the picture looks quite similar, except that instead of my uh, local oscillator now becomes a laser. And then the, I, I down uh, frequency convert using a, using a comb. Okay, so now if I go from a microwave source to a, a optical source, then my quality factor automatically becomes 10,000 times higher. And that's where the advantage of an optical atomic clock is, okay? Hey, and so, and then also because uh, lasers uh, and optical fields are less uh, susceptible to environmental instabilities, they are uh, naturally 100 times uh, better in stability. So if I look at the transition of best microwave atomic clocks versus best optical atomic clocks over, over the last 30, 40 years, then you can see that the, that optical atomic clocks right after the invention of lasers uh, and, and becoming commercial and like very good frequency stable lasers uh, is just orders of magnitude better than what a microwave atomic clock can do, okay? If I now look at the commercial aspects of it, I showed you these two examples of uh, uh, a company such as Teledyne or Microsemi making optical atomic, uh, microwave atomic clocks. But if you want slightly better stability of your clock, then you can buy a new clock from a company in, in, in France or Spectral Dynamics here in the US makes another clock that is also gives you a similar number in terms of stability. But they are much more bigger rack size units. Now, instead, if I look at optical atomic clocks, uh, the story is completely different. Here is the best optical atomic clock in the world. Uh, this is Junier's lab where strontium atoms are being trapped. And, and you can see that the two laser, primary laser wavelength that you need, 689 and, 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 and 461 nanometer in this. So typical uh, atomic physics labs or atomic uh, optical labs typically look like this. And then there was a fantastic experiment that was done in, in Europe uh, a couple of years ago where they took this optical atomic clock based on strontium and they put it in a tractor trailer. And the idea is that these clocks are useless. They can do fantastic things, but they're useless in terms of applications if you cannot take them places. So when so basically what they did was they made this clock on a trailer and they will drive it around um, all of Europe and do geodesy measurements, which is a topography of the Earth. By, by doing um, a sort of a Doppler measurement, if you would, uh, from a satellite. So here, if when they transition from an uh, 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 optical lab to a tractor trailer, they could still get quite quite a, uh, amazing 10 to the minus 14 stability. And, and for a lot of applications, this is quite good. Okay, so there's an estimate that the atomic clock market is valued currently at $312 million, just based on microwave atomic clocks. And it's expected to reach around 500 million in, in that ballpark by the end of 2020. So there's a big market for it, and, and, and the larger market would be if one could somehow make an optical atomic law that is commercial. Okay, there's been some work done on miniaturizing things using chip scale photonics. Thanks. But, uh, but basically, if you look at all the work that has been done in trying to reduce uh, the size of the optical atomic clock, it always comes as a part of cost of ADAB. The best microwave atomic clocks work in this regime where I said that they cannot do better than 10 to the minus 13, that's their fundamental limit. But if you go to optical atomic clocks, they can do much better, but they are much, much larger in size. Okay, so the, the, the work that I'm going to be presenting today comes out of DARPA, uh, uh, out of number of programs that came out of DARPA, ACES, A5, and and whatnot, and, and the idea is, is not to go along this diagonal, but to go along this diagonal, which is make them better and make them smaller, reduce what they call swap, which is size, weight, uh, uh, and power. Uh, and, and if you are in this regime, then really it is useful for commercial applications, okay? One can look at uh, what 
uh, applications they enable. So if I can make atomic clocks that are much, much smaller, uh, then the chip scale atomic clock that I showed you that are low power applications and are typically used in navigation and undersea exploration. If you go to a little bit larger ones, then you can, uh, uh, such as rubidium clocks, then then telecom, finance, military, and communications are, are, uh, are applications. And then finally, the, the best atomic clocks, which are reference clocks for strategic applications, are typically used in like gyroscopes and, and interferometry and radar and, and studying fundamental physics, metrology, and, and satellite. So there are a number of, of very, very important technological applications that are enabled, and they will all become better if one could figure out how to make a atomic clock that is very, very small and, and has a very, very high stability. Okay. So, so uh, we are part of a program here at, at, at NIST together with a number of partners uh, from uh, uh, 10 different universities. So there are, uh, it's an 11 PI program where the idea is to take this tractor trailer clock, if you would, and then make it the size of a coffee cup. So two inches by two inches by five inches. Okay, and 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 mid. If you look at the frequency, fractional frequency instability again, it's in the order of ten to the minus fourteen uh, per square root of tau. So again, meeting this the same spec as one would in this tractor Taylor experiment. Okay, All right. And so if you look at uh, uh, at least in this program, this is not the whole story. We are allowed lasers outside the chip, but there's a concurrent program going on where uh, people are trying to make all the lasers that we need for this program on chip. Okay. But um, but the most of the space that is taken in in this tractor Taylor experiment or any strontium atomic clock ex experiment is is free space optics. So really, the heart of the system is this box here that where you are seeing the red and the blue sort of uh, colors, and this is where we are trying to trap atoms using flat optics. And that is the the idea of my talk. So how do we go from here to here and and trap atoms and 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 get this frequency instability? In a, in a size of say one inch by one inch by one inch box, so very very small. Okay. Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll introduce the platform that we are going to try to use to accomplish this, and I'll show you uh, how uh, we are planning on doing this. Okay. So to understand that, uh, I'll I'll spend one slide on talking about photonic integrated circuits. Hopefully, uh, if, if the audience in the audience is is somewhat familiar with optics, then they would know photonic integrated circuits, and I'll show you our results on peak plus metasurface platform that enables uh, some of this, okay? So photonic integrated circuits uh, uh, is seeing uh, a sort of growth that say microelectronics saw maybe 10 or 15, 20 years ago, where now I can go to a photonic foundry and use uh, a number, there are a number of companies that are interested in and use the number of simulation tools to design my integrated circuit that can directly be on a, on a CMOS chip. Uh, and these can be fa fabricated directly on a CMOS foundry where my laser, waveguides, multiplexers, detectors, modulators, and whatnot all are on the single chip, okay? Hey, so the reason uh, photonic integrated circuits ha have come where they are right now, where uh, from data comm perspective, a lot of people are looking at it, is, is because of I what I believe are two key enablers. One is silicon photonics, where we, one can use CMOS platform, silicon platform to guide light on silicon chips, let's say, uh, at distances. And then together with heterogeneous integration, silicon is a, is a uh, non-direct band gap, so it's not a very good light emitter. But if you can now think of a platform where you can put 3.5 gallium arsenide or germanium and whatnot on the, on the silicon chip, then you can enable all of these good qualities that the 3.5s or group 4 materials give you together with what silicon gives us. Okay. So, and then of course you can make them on a chip scale and you can cut them into small, small pieces. And then each piece could be one of your device, right? And you can make thousands of this chip on a big platform. Right. That is kind of the idea. And, and PICs have, have reached that level of maturity. Hey, but the issue with photonic integrated circuits is, is that light is always confined to these waveguides. It's all over the chip. Anywhere it goes, it never leaves the chip. Hey, but there are a number of applications, such as, say, a biological system, if you're trying to do biosensing, or AMO systems where you're trying to talk to atoms, as I will be talking about in this talk, and as I've already talked about in this talk, or trying to trap macroscopic objects or even, even atoms, then, then you really need beams that are millimeters or if not centimeters in size to collect an ensemble of atoms and rather than beams that are confined in a waveguide that are submicron in, in, in mode field. Okay. So, so how does one use this advantages of, of photonic integrated circuits? It's to guide light and in and, 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 and low loss in a very, very compact manner but still uh, get a beam that has very uh, well-defined 
free space uh, profile uh, of phase intensity and, and, and polarization, very well controlled uh, phase intensity of polarization. Okay, so this is what we are basically trying to do. And the idea is that these all these applications require light matter interaction in volume rather than its surfaces. Okay, so the so the the platform that we have proposed is, is still a pig based platform. So you use uh, a photonic integrated circuit to guide light. So this this thin line is is what is my waveguide here. Okay, uh, in, instead here in silicon nitride. Right, and then what you do is 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 now my mode field diameter on this waveguide that is that's quite long and is going uh, places is is uh, approximately hundreds of nanometer. Okay, 300, 400 nanometer for 461 nanometer. If I want to expand this beam uh, to a decent size, then then one trick one could do is is you do 1D expansion by by sending light into a collimated slab mode by adiabatically bringing this waveguide close to the slab. So you do this 1D expansion. And now, and now you hit this expanded beam onto an apertized grating, and the beam that you get out is it must look uh, Gaussian. But the issue is still with this 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 mode expander, as you would call it, is you can go from tens of micron or uh, some micron beams to tens of micron uh, beams that comes out of this pick, like, or even 100 micron diameter, and it can give you some control over directionality, but it cannot give you any control over polarization or 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 or, uh, or beam shape, if you would. Okay. So the idea that we propose in this paper that came out end of last year is, is that instead of that, why not we make meta surfaces on top? So meta surfaces are these nanoscale uh, dialectic element based systems. I won't be talking about much about them in this talk, but but basically depending on the nanopolar dimension and its shape and its size, one could control the, the phase intensity and polarization of light that comes out. Okay, so now what you have really done is now I can design this meta surface to act as a let's say high numerical aperture lens then what i could get out is is a beam that gets tightly focused and expanding quite quickly and therefore i can get large beam diameters i can also design the meta surface so that it can do focusing as well as polarization control so i can get a linearly polarized light or circular polarization or whatnot and i can also change the directionality of the beam so you can do the function of a mirror which is directional change a wave plate which is polarization change and a lens which is is controlling the beam diameter so you can do all, sort of all sort of things by designing the meta circuit that is fabricated on top. And now you, you, you what you really have is a is a two stage photonic foundry based platform where you make your pick extreme mode converter in the first step, and then you make your meta surface on the second step, and then you have all the functionality that you could imagine that you would need for a free space optical experiment. Right. So again, going back to this picture, we are trying to make a trap uh, um, atoms ensemble of strontium atom for this thing. And and if I open this box up and 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 look at it in a piece of paper, this is how it looks like. It has a number of uh, lasers. Some of them are on-chip lasers in this program. Some of them are off-chip lasers. Um, uh, then we have uh, reference cavities that are directly fabricated on chip to stabilize these lasers and to probe the the clock transitions. Once we have on-chip frequency cones to down down frequencies uh, uh, convert the the the, the lock light. But the heart of the system is in the photonics, which basically takes up most of the space. And if you look at the the a cross section diagram of that, the idea is that we will use this pick plus meta surface platform shown here in the bottom with these blue dots to generate light that will uh, give me all the necessary beams to trap strontium atoms. Um, so what are the beams that one one needs to do such an experiment, and what are the requirements on the photonics, if you would? And that's kind of shown by this by this picture here. Uh, I have a bottom layer pick plate, which is my photonic integrated circuit with the with the with the what, what I would call uh, uh, these extreme mode converters, and together with these Lego looking blocks, the twelve of them up here and and six of them on the top plate that are my meta reflectors and my meta transmitters, and, and the beams that you need for such a program or such a uh, experiment is 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 the is the is the narrow cooling beam four sixty one nanometers that is tens of milliwatt at the atom location on uh, almost a centimeter in diameter of circular polarization then you can then you need a, a narrow cooling uh, the second cooling beam which is the the red mod beam again four or five millimeters in diameter that is circularly polarized and then you need other lattice clock and repumping beams so you can see there are seven or eight wavelengths that you need to try get to the atom location the idea is that first you trap an ensemble of atoms with blue light then you cool them further with red light and then you use a lattice and a clock beam to probe the transition of your atoms, uh, your lattice beam to put them in a lattice and then use a clock beam to probe the transition of the atomic state. Okay. 
the size here is one inch by one inch by one inch. And as you can see, there's no free space optics. It's all light that is guided on optical fibers to these, uh, these out couplers and meta surfaces that are going to direct light in different directions. And so this particular geometry that we have come across or come uh, not come across, but, but, um, but put together is what is called a hybrid cubic mod geometry, where we use expanding beams from the bottom and then collimated beams from the top. Uh, to get the best of both worlds, if you would, of like large beams that are collimated and 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 large beam diameters coming out from the bottom as well, uh, and then and then the red and the blue ones are for this 461 and 689 nanometer. Okay, so now if I look at one of the meta surfaces here and see, oh, what is it really required to do? Oh, uh, I think before going to going to that, let me show you an example of the of the my pick platform. So here we are using uh, fibers from both sides in this in this example to guide light to these six uh, emitter locations. So these are the extreme mode converters. You can see if I go to these six spots, I I have my 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 beam that is coming out from the pick. It's all around hundred microns in diameter. And if I try to uh, play this movie, uh, you can probably see this here. You can see that there are six beams coming out. Three are going to the top pick and three of them are coming directly towards the atom. Now I'll play this again. So a single pick is generating six beams that are very well controlled directions and very well controlled direction, um, uh, propagation direction. But what is what is the issue here is that these beams are still hundreds of microns in diameter, but the beams that we need are centimeters, if you know, if, uh, that, as I showed you in this slide here. So how do we, and then also these are linearly polarized beams, we need circular polarization, right? For trapping atoms. So that's what meta surfaces do is we design these Lego blocks. I will just talk about one example of the meta surface, which is takes a linearly polarized light from this pick that I just showed you in this slide before, and then converts it into a circularly polarized light, changes its direction, and also gives you it gives it a very, very high numerical aperture to expand quite quickly so that we can get the beam diameter in this one, one space. So we have been making these meta surfaces quite regularly now. Here is a chip that shows all of the 12 meta surfaces. So if you really look closely, these, these dot marks that you're seeing are each one of them is a single meta surface. And this single meta surface acts like a lens, a mirror, and a wave plate all at the same time. It's quite, quite amazing what they can do. So then the idea is that this, this chip. Minutes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm finishing yeah. up. Yeah. So the idea is that we take this meta surface space and put it on top of the pick plate, and then and they are they are uh, uh, bonded together. And then if you look at the beams that are coming out of these these meta surface things, I'm only showing you three beams here. The ones that are going to the top plate, you can see the three beams quite clearly on a piece of paper, and they are almost a centimeter in diameter. And then again, the beams that are coming at 45 degrees, which is these beams, the expanding beams, you can also see them quite clearly on the piece of paper, and they are quite large. So it's amazing that you can go from tens of microns or on a 100 micron diameter to a centimeter with very well controlled polarization and 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 uh, and, and and beam directionality, if you would. Okay. Same thing with the top reflector. Uh, uh, you can directly use a mirror to do the reflection, but but here we are trying to sh shape the size. So this is an anomalous reflector. The SEM image of the uh, of the fabricated sample is shown here, made using what is called the PB phase approach, and then and then when we reflect the beams, you can see that if we look in the far field, these beams are quite large in diameter. So the atoms will be actually here, a centimeter from the pick. But if you look in the far field, the beams are quite large. So it's kind of doing the function that we needed to do. Okay. So in the last maybe two minutes, I'll show you two more experiments that we are currently working on. On one is on trying to trap single atoms, and, and and basically that experiment is to use a meta surface directly to replace free space optical components that are used in a in an atom physics lab together with Cindy Regal's group. And here, what 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 we are showing is that in a lattice configuration, we can use a meta lens shown here in these pictures, a flat optic uh, which is sitting here uh, to trap an ensemble of rubidium atoms. In this case, fifty five thousand atoms. And then, and then, basically, the idea of this experiment is showing that the metal lens is not doing anything untoward the, towards the atom. So the light coming out of the metal surface is not ideal. It doesn't look like a perfect lens. It has some non-idealities, and atoms sometimes do not like stray light. So the idea was to show that uh, it can we trap an ensemble of atoms. And then, really, where this experiment has gone is 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 we are looking at trapping single rubidium atoms, neutral atoms, uh, and because they are an attractive candidate for quantum computing applications. And, and then only in the last couple of weeks, we have demonstrated that we can trap single atoms using this platform using a very, very high numerical aperture lens. So 0.9 numerical aperture to trap single rubidium atoms. So what we do is we make a mod, uh, bring an ensemble of rubidium atoms close to the focal point of the lens, as shown more clearly here. Here, the focal point is somewhere around here. 
or, and then and then let all the atoms go and then see if we can trap single atom. And we have evidence now that we can achieve single atom trapping. So now this is makes it quite powerful because now we can use very, very high uh, multifunctional metasurfaces to trap single atoms for, for quantum computing applications, if you would. Okay, where the, the neutral atom acts as, acts as your qubit. And then final uh, side here uh, is, is to show again this PIC plus metasurface platform to trap atoms, but only using in planar optics. So where we make the PIC, we make the metasurface shown here. Uh, this is what my group does. Then we have this, this uh, three level grating, if you would, three sided grating. And, and 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 then what we show is that indeed you can see this bright spot is your mod, or uh, uh, an ensemble of trapped rubidium atoms. And really, uh, the idea here is that if you use set of planar optics, then then you can basically compress this everything down to a very very small spot, right? And if you have to use non-planar optics, then of course you are size limited. Right. Uh, one other experiment that came out a uh, uh, couple of years ago, uh, sorry, a couple of months ago, uh, again shows this idea of using uh, integrated photonics to trap single qubits uh, that came out of nature. Uh, uh, and the idea again is quite elegant where you can trap, uh, guide all of these different wavelengths on a waveguide, use grating couplers to uh, couple light out, and then do all of these operations in an integrated photonic manufacturable platform than, than, uh, uh, than using free space optics. Okay. So hopefully in the last uh, few uh, uh, half an hour, I've shown you that uh, meta surfaces together with photonic integrated circuits offer a very compact manufacturable platform for building and collecting light for atom physics applications. There are a number of applications I talked about quantum optics, but in ultra fast optics for shaping light to uh, imaging to LIDAR, there are uh, various different applications for this. And, and then the use of meta surfaces is quite application driven. Right? You don't expect it to re replace a traditional lens in say that you buy from core labs that is quite well that works quite well but rather uh, where you need more multifunctional response at specific wavelengths and then and then of course meta surfaces are, are lossy uh, they're not ideal like a typical lens that we buy AR coated lens we buy but so one has to be cognizant about the losses whether they are acceptable or not but then if, if all of this is is well then then really this is a quite elegant platform to shrink the size of your free space optical experiments that are that can be quite complicated all right. So with that, uh, I'm I, I'm out of time. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Agbar, for a very nice, interesting talk. Uh, actually, the questions uh, usually come in chat box, but you know, the Dixit, may I ask a couple of questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Hi, Amit. Uh, very nice work. So uh, yeah. I just have a couple of questions. Like, so what is the power level you get over one centimeter? Uh, uh, so uh, for this program, in this slide, you can see what we need is six beams, let's say for the strontium mod. Each beam has to have five milliwatts. So we need uh, at a centimeter distance from here, we need uh, uh, 30 milliwatts at the atom location for the blue mod. So really, if you look at all the colors here, the challenging one is 461. The, the red is is not as lossy, silicon nitride is not as lossy at, at in the red wavelength. So getting these level of powers, hundreds some milliwatts to a milliwatt or whatever is quite easy at these wavelengths. The blue is is the challenging one. Right? So pretty much all of our effort in the last year has gone into designing photonics for 461. Because silicon nitride starts showing some Raman bands around 461, you're kind of coming close to, even though you're still away from the from the from the band gap. Silicon nitride is, starts getting quite lossy at, at 461. And, and there's some other materials such as tantala and uh, uh, aluminum dioxide, uh, which is basically sapphire that people have been looking at also to guide light in the blue. But for any atom trapping experiment, doesn't matter strontium or or ytribium or whatnot, there's always this one or one wavelength in the blue that is your large transition that you need. Right? So developing integrated photonics for the blue and the UV is quite a big challenge and, and, and very application oriented. Uh, and so if people have ideas on developing photonics for blue, that will be quite a quite quite strong candidate, right, for all of these atom physics applications. And even for this paper that I showed you, uh, I'll just say one more thing. Even for this paper that I showed you where they trap strontium ions instead of atoms, a single strontium ion for uh, for qubit operation in a manufacturable, you can see that the two wavelengths that you need is this 422, 405, and 461, right, to do these operations. So that, that makes it quite hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically that that's a I mean doubt I had that like you have a wide wavelength range, and making your structure compatible for all the wavelengths and maintaining the power levels. 
Okay. Right. It's it's quite tough. Yeah. <laughs> but but there are multiple waveguides that are going on top of each other here there. But but uh, but 461 is the one that is uh, because of the waveguide losses or material losses is, is is somewhat challenging. But other ones are quite easy. Yeah. So what is the distance between the top and the bottom layers? You said one, uh, one inch, but one inch. One inch. One inch. Yeah. Two point five four. Okay. And and one last question. Like uh, in the single atom trap experiment, like you have the mod. Uh, we have like tens of thousands of atoms. Then um, you turn your metal lens on, or or like um, basically right. light on that, and mm -hmm. uh, then you switch off your mod and uh, assume that like or, or expect that like one of the atoms get trapped, one single ion gets trapped. Is right, that and that is correct. Yeah, and then there's a there's a imaging beam. So same metal lens that traps the atom. The atom is trapped at seven eighty nanometer, and then we image it at eight thirty nanometer. 850, sorry, 780, 850. So these rubidium atoms are imaged at 850, but the same metal lens images it. So you focus. So you have we, the metal lens used here is a, is a dual wavelength metal surface designed to focus with high numerical aperture at both 780 and 850. Hmm. Okay, so we trap and then we image with the same. And then there's a lot of ex, like uh, uh, experiments you can do. Two of them are shown here, which is you look at the lifetime of atoms. And then you also look at the the radial and the axial trap frequencies of the atom, and then from that you can tell whether you really have a single atom or not, right? So, do you do any any trick to broaden the wavelength range, or is it, I mean, for the metal lens operation, or is it just the inhomogeneity which gives, I mean, helps you get the entire range? Like, for example, no, no, our our metal lenses are designed for one wavelength. We, we yes. don't do achromatic, right? But people have done it in literature where you can use these kind of weird tricks of making very, very odd shapes to get mm -hmm. achromatic operation, right? But in our case, we don't do this. We just make one meta surface for 461, one for 689, one for 789, and all of these different wavelengths, right? Okay. okay. Thanks, Amit. All right. Thank yeah. you. I have one question similar to what Ajinta asked. The meta surface which you designed, you said that these are designed for different wavelengths, but all of them are kept at the same place, one after the other. Uh, in, in this experiment, uh, no, they are spatially separated. So, out of these 12 meta surfaces here, one meta surface is at blue for blue. This generates 45 degree beam that is right handed circular polarized. Then if I go to the next one, this is the red beam that goes at zero degrees uh, yeah, and yeah. then expand. So they're spatially separated. Yeah, that is correct. Right. So and, but you yeah. also mentioned that the imaging also will have to be done by the same metal lens. So in, in this particular experiment uh, for the strontium uh, strontium trap, we have an ensemble of atoms, right? So that there you just use a camera from the side to image all of them. For the for the single atom experiment. This is a different experiment uh, where we are trapping uh, single atoms. Um, in this one, you when you trap a single atom, it's basically one pixel of your camera, and you do a lot of statistics on that one pixel of the camera. So it's, it's almost impossible to know where your single atom might be. So the only way one could do it is to trap an image with the same lens and assume that the meta surface is uh, one atom is sitting in that trap location, right? So there, in this experiment, we have to image from the same. So here, the meta surface is. This particular meta surface is two wavelengths, 780 and 850 for rubidium, right? The strontium we image separately, yeah. One, just one more in regard. You also mentioned that when the meta surface is used to focus, you will have undulations outside the center, and right, how about right. um, that will also trap uh, some of the atoms, or it will not trap at all. It, it's it's possible, yeah. We have looked at the PSF quite carefully for the for the atom, so it it looks still looks like a sink function, like you would expect. Right for a, for a circular aperture or, or a Bessel function, so there are undulations, but I don't think that that the in the in the side lobe the 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 the, the, the trap depth is enough that you can get the atoms to be there. I think the center one is the one that that where the atoms are trapped. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Agrawal, for a nice talk and very nice discussion. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, so now we have, uh, I can I see, uh, we have a third speaker, Professor Jian. Professor hi. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. So now, Thank uh, you. 
this is my pleasure to introduce Professor Zian. Professor Zian Zhu is a professor of uh, engineering science and mechanic, mechanics and an exempt professor of electrical engineering at Pennsylvania State University. His research is in optoelectronics, materials, and devices. Dr. Zhu obtained his PhD degree from the University of Michigan and Harbor. He was the recipient of National Science Foundation Career Award 2009, System and Della Royal Research Award in Materials of Pennsylvania State University. He currently sits on the editorial boards of the Journal of Electronic Materials and the SPY Journal of Nanophotonics. He has been the chair of the fall meeting of the Electrochemical Society Symposia on Semiconductor Nanocrystal and Metal Nanostructure Enhanced Photonic Devices and an executive committee member of the SPY Photonic West. Dr. Zhu has published more than 150 peer-reviewed journals and conference uh, papers to date. Now I invite Professor Zhu to start his talk. Your time is, will be about uh, 25 minutes and uh, when five minutes are remaining, I'll prompt you. Thank you, you may start, thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my presentation today is about the modeling of nanophosphor coupled porous layers for color conversion in three nitride micro LED arrays. Uh, my name is Jen Xiu. Uh, this work was performed by uh, my students, uh, Arsene Noor uh, Blahi, uh, and also myself. And we are from the Department of Engineering Science and Mechanics at Penn State University. Okay, so uh, I will start with a brief introduction about the application, uh, one of the key applications of micro LED array, the so-called micro display panels, okay? Um, the, um, currently, we have been using the uh, cellular phones, you know, with, you know, uh, the small size display panels, but uh, the next generation of uh, powerful um, electronic device will be uh, those had mounted display technology, uh, wearable display technology, okay, which request uh, miniaturized L uh, display panels. Um, and uh, the micro LED based display panels uh, will be the, you know, the key candidate for these kind of uh, micro display uh, systems. A micro LED display panels uh, involve the three nitride micro LED arrays, uh, silicon CMOS spec plane, uh, and also the FPGA based uh, controller systems. Okay. And uh, by combining the micro LED array with the silicon CMOS el backplane electronics, uh, we are able to develop those high resolution micro display chips, okay, um, which have the key advantages, uh, including the high resolution, okay, um, because those micro LED. Uh, pixels uh, can be as small as uh, tens of micron or even sub 10 micron features. Okay. And uh, they uh, also exhibit uh, high or super high brightness and uh, very high contrast. Okay. Uh, as a active display devices, um, it's superior to those um, passive you know, liquid crystal display panels uh, in terms of the contrast uh, because uh, when we turn off each individual uh, LED pixel, we can get a absolute zero uh, output. So the contrast can be as high as 10,000 to one, while most of the liquid crystal display panels only give us a contrast somewhere between 100 to 500 to one. And also the micro LED display panels uh, have, uh, you know, uh, features a very high level of integration because uh, we are able to monolithically, uh, you know, integrate all those micro LED pixels on the same chip and then use the flip chip bonding technique uh, to combine the micro LED in chip with the silicon CMOS backplane to form a, a, a vertical integrated, you know, micro display panel. So which shows a super high level of integration. And uh, most of those micro LED display panels shows a very low operation operation voltage and also a very high efficiency uh, simply because the three nitride based on LED technology um, has already um, refined has been refined uh, 
um, by in the past 20 years uh, to show a very high uh, quantum efficiency. You know, I'm talking about the external quantum efficiency and the power efficiency. And the power efficiency of those light sources can be as high as uh, up to 70%. Okay, so this is, is the, uh, the, the unprecedented uh, super high efficiency of all, among all the light sources you know, we have achieved uh, so far. Um, and uh, those micro LED display panels also um, enable the fast response and the frame rate. The, the, you know, like, uh, again, unlike the liquid crystal display panels, which uh, have a relatively low uh, you know, frame rate, typically somewhere between 30 um, you know, frames per second to you know, as high as 100 uh, frames per, se per second. Uh, those micro LED display panels can give us a uh, you know, frame rate uh, up to uh, several thousand uh, frames per second. Okay. And uh, those micro LED display panels uh, also show um, very stable and you know, photochemical and uh, thermal stability, and therefore very reliable in terms of their application. And uh, they also uh, have a very wide range of operation temperature, again, okay, making it possible to run those micro LED display panels uh, under uh, very warm conditions or very low temperature conditions. Okay? And uh, when we are able to mass fabric, fabric, uh, fabricating uh, those micro LED display panels, uh, we are able to you know, lower the overall cost and eventually um, offer the very low cost solution for the uh, micro display uh, panels uh, for the next generation variable electronics uh, and uh, uh, head mounted you know, virtual reality and the uh, augmented reality uh, uh, electronic systems. Um, and at Penn State, uh, we have a uh, you know photonics and auto electronic device group, uh, which um, is focused on the development of novel auto electronic devices based on nanomaterials and the nano fabrication technology. Okay, we combine the material synthesis device fabrication and the characterization in order to optimize device performance. And uh, um, one key technology uh, we have pioneered uh, in micro LED based display technology uh, involves the gap-free uh, monolithic emitter uh, matrices, okay, the development of this gap-free monolithic emitter matrices, uh, which um, is developed toward high resolution and high brightness uh, nitride LED micro display. Okay, um, uh, this technology has been patented, uh, you know, um, and uh, which include the pixel isolation with ion implantation, resolving the well-known difficulty um, of the ICP etching of high aspect ratio air gaps in three nitride processing. The gap-free pixelation. Uh, leads to a high surface fraction of emitters and ultra narrow separation of the, the neighborhood neighboring pixels for high resolution and high brightness. Okay. Um, so the um, the uh, figure, uh, figures in this slide shows this uh, you know this um, uh, gap free uh, pixelation technology uh, which is presented here and uh, um, the photo micrograph of the uh, LED display compares the organic LED display with our nitride LED display, and uh, you can see the very clear difference in terms of uh, brightness. Okay, the micro LED display technology gives us a, a much higher brightness compared with the conventional OLED display technology. Okay, and at the same time, they will inherit the high contrast and uh, the uh, high resolution uh, capabilities. Um, here are some of those micro LED uh, display panels um, which have been developed um, by the collaboration of our group and uh, some industry uh, partners. Okay, um, uh, those micro LED display panels uh, has a uh, pixel, uh, has a pitch size about 24 micron and uh, the um, display aspect ratio about uh, four to, uh, 5 to 4, 5 to 4. Um, the target application of our micro LED display uh, panels involve the smart watches, uh, smart bands, and mounted display devices for virtual reality and augmented reality classes. 
Um, the wearable microcomputers, uh, microprojectors used for the head-mounted display system in our uh, you know, car systems, okay. and the portable biomedical examination systems, high-performance camera, viewfinders, data communication, health monitoring, and portable audio and video entertainment equipment. Okay. So those are the key applications of those uh, pixelated micro LED display systems. And in these slides, we try to compare the uh, micro LED display uh, with the conventional liquid crystal display, uh, you know, this um, uh, DLP technology, uh, LCOS technology, and the OLED technology. Uh, the uh, LCD uh, DLP technology are more considered as a uh, passive display systems, uh, you know, uh, and also include the LCOS display. They are all passive display systems, while the OLED and the micro LED displays are considered as so-called uh, the active display systems. Okay, um, uh, and you, you can compare uh, the performance of all these different display systems, and you will find that micro LED display systems, you know, uh, features, you know, the uh, very high lumen, uh, lumen efficiency, uh, you know, this ultra high contrast, uh, you know, uh, very, very, uh, you know, fast, response time uh, down to nanosecond uh, you know response time and uh, a very wide uh, working temperature okay. now, in terms of working temperature you know it's uh, it's very important because uh, all the display system um, given the a lot of superior properties uh, you know the it does have some uh, shortcomings and the two of the you know key shortcomings of those OLED display systems, one is the you know the um, brightness. It's difficult to get a very high brightness out of this OLED uh, material, and then the other is the you know relatively narrow working temperature range, and the micro LED devices you know overcome all those in shortcomings, and uh, which give us some um, more superior performance, uh, and also. Uh, Three nitride-based, uh, you know, LED devices, you know, has a, you know, very uh, good, you know, for thermal and for the chemical stability, and therefore uh, they show a, you know, very reliable operation, okay, uh, with a very long lifetime, okay. So even though the manufacturing cost of those micro LED array-based display systems are still high, but uh, uh, as we are able to, you know, eventually we are able to mass, uh, you know, fab fabricating those devices uh, the final cost can be uh, lower can be lower to uh. now uh, this kind of uh, led array based uh, uh, technology can extend beyond uh, the uh, display in you know, the region okay we can use the pixelated micro led devices um, to develop uh, the so-called alternating current led devices uh, which is another uh, important Research broke uh, research uh, breakthrough uh, at Penn State. Okay, so uh, on the single chip, uh, we are able to integrate LED pixels with some power electronic components. It could be the um, short key battery dial based uh, power electronic uh, devices, or even the um, mass fed based you know devices. Okay, we are able to demonstrate uh, alternating current LED devices. As we all know, uh, the LED device is a pin junction based devices. Uh, so it's the operation of those devices you really request uh, the DC current and the low operation voltage somewhere between three to five volts. So if I want to run those uh, LED uh, you know, uh, light sources uh, using the city electricity somewhere 110 volts um, you know, alternating current, then you need a power supplies. Okay? You need to convert uh, the city electricity, okay, uh, the alternating current uh, power to a, a DC uh, electric electricity, and then you need to you need to lower the voltage uh, from 110 uh, volts to the three to five volts. Now, by integrating those uh, power electronics with pixelated array of micro LED devices, we are able to um, permanently eliminate the eliminate the power supplies, and then using um, the single LED chip uh, with city electricity. Okay, so that's the you know uh, the way you know we develop those alternating current LED devices. Um, this view graph shows the um, 
architecture design of our micro LED chip, okay, which involves the, um, you know, the micro LED pixels, you know, which are, have been cascaded, uh, and then some uh, circuit barrier diode. Uh, a, and those circuit barrier diodes, you know, form a um, this, uh, current rectifying bridge, a okay, diode uh, bridge, okay, to rectifying the current. Now, if each individual LED pixel takes DC current somewhere between three to five volts, by cascading all those micro LED pixels together, you know, we can have this LED uh, string or LED array to take a high voltage somewhere uh, around 110 volts. Okay, and then uh, this on-chip um, you know, diode uh, current rectifying bridge um, functions to convert the AC uh, current to the DC current, and eventually to uh, run the uh, to run the current DC current through those uh, micro LED strip, uh, which eventually allows to use a single LED chip, okay, um, and they're operated by the uh, alternating current city electricity. So um, this has been uh, demonstrated. And the overall size of our AC LED chip is around two by two, two millimeter by two millimeter, uh, uh, with an average size of the air LED pixel unit uh, about 20 to 40 by 20 to 40 micron. Okay, for each individual LED pixel. Um, and uh, this can be achieved by uh, integrating on a standard LED wafer. Okay, uh, the you know using the standard LED wafer, we can. Uh, fabricate uh, LED pixels and integrate uh, next to the LED pixel a um, circuit barrier diode. Okay, circuit barrier diode. Okay, and the the, um, the this is the uh, the lateral view, you know, the, the cross section view of this uh, monolithic integration between the LED devices and the uh, circuit barrier diodes. Okay, so to fabricate the circuit barrier diodes, we have to uh, etch away the LED. Uh, structure and then using the uh, undoped gallium nitride layer and the untapped gallium nitride, uh, you know, uh, and using a um, short heat metal to form the uh, short heat barrier diode working with the LED devices, you know, for current rectifying. And uh, the our success, you know, to integrate those power electronic components with um, micro LED devices. Uh, arise from the, our in-depth understanding uh, of the um, interplay between the um, the defects related you know, surface states uh, of those three nitride materials, and then the electron barrier lowering effect uh, in those same uh, gallium nitride materials. Okay, and uh, technically um, we are able to control okay, the surface states of the ion etched. Uh, gallium nitride LED devices uh, using a, a very special, uh, you know, so-called uh, uh, the uh, cycled digital etching technique. Uh, we are able to um, eliminate the surface states uh, of the ion etched gallium nitride material and restore the etched gallium nitride surface uh, to the device quality, and therefore. Allow us to fabricate, you know, high quality uh, the short key barrier diodes uh, on the same LED wafer, and essentially integrate the LED pixels uh, with those uh, uh, high performance uh, power electronic components, and allow us to fabricate, you know, those uh, the integrate uh, LED, uh, you know, de devices. Okay, so that gives us a you know a background, you know, those uh, about those micro LED array uh, technology we have been developing in our Penn State lab. Um, now I'm moving to the uh, most uh, you know the, the, the our topic about those uh, the modeling of uh, nanophosphor coupled porous layers for color conversion in three nitride micro LED arrays. Um, so the you know when we Try to you know most of the nitride LED devices uh, output blue light. So if I want to convert the blue light uh, to a white light or to a colorful uh, you know light display system, uh, we have to use phosphors uh, to convert the blue emission to the red and the uh, green emission. Okay, the red green emission. That's the most economic way 
uh, for the color conversion in the LED-based system. Um, and uh, conventionally, in the solid-state lining, uh, we try to use uh, conventional phosphor materials, okay? um, especially those yellow, green, and the red phosphors, you know, based on the um, cell, uh, based on this uh, erbium and the uh, cell cerium based um, these real earth elements, okay, uh, to convert the blue emission to the red and the green, and then mix the blue, red, and the green together to form the so called white color emission from those uh, LED devices. Well, this conventional color converting process does not work for our micro LED based technology, okay, especially for display applications, uh, simply because uh, those phosphor uh, material, okay, uh, the phosphor crystals uh, has a relatively large particle size and therefore uh, exhibit a very strong scattering, okay. Uh, this strong scattering makes it impossible, makes it impossible to extend the simple color conversion method to micro LED okay, uh, uh, display applications, uh, which usually request, you know, the phosphor layer to be high transparent uh, and uh, with good efficient color conversion. Okay. Uh, this, because only with a very high transparent, highly transparent and the efficient um, color converting phosphor layer, we are able to demonstrate you know, high resolution distortion free and full color panel display or image projection in our uh, with our micro LED display system. An alternative approach to create white LEDs on a wafer level is to incorporate thick layers of colloidal quantum dots in the epitaxial structure of LEDs as a color converting uh, converting layer. Okay, those um, quantum dots uh, features in a very small pixel, uh, very small particle size and down to nanoscale, and therefore uh, they do not scatter light. Okay, and therefore uh, we can use those uh, colloidal quantum dot uh, phosphor uh, as a highly transparent uh, phosphor layer uh, on the micro LED devices. But um, if I want to get a efficient color conversion, I still need a very thick layer of those colloidal quantum dots uh, because uh, we, we want to make sure the quantum dot layer will absorb most of blue light and, and for the efficient red and the green uh, generation. Well, when we use a very thick layer of quantum dots uh, on top of those five, micro LED. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, um, with those LED devices, um, then uh, we find we have the problem of agglomeration, color, high surface roughness, you know, light cross top in a long time um, for the uh, deposition. Okay. Um, therefore, uh, we have been trying to address all these concerns and find new ways to overcome uh, the uh, problems of quantum dot phosphor um, in the micro LED display system. Uh, a new approach uh, was recently demonstrated uh, by Dunn's group at Yale uh, to create a white micro LED devices on a wafer level, which uh, considered as a promising approach okay, to fabricate colorful micro LED displays, which involved the uh, n-type gallium nitride layer of LED uh, um, exposed to a later liftoff process and the subsequently etched the electro chemically to create a plenty of nanoporous structures in a gallium nitride layer. So what happens in their approach is they remove the substrate, the sapphire substrate, and then back etch the um, uh, gallium nitride layer uh, to form a, a very high density of nanopores uh, on the LED. And then they try to incorporate a high density quantum dot into those nanopores, okay? Um, Using either a simple uh, deep coating technique or some lithography approach, you know, to pattern the different colors of quantum dots into this device. Um, but their approach, uh, in sounds very promising, but uh, there are some key studies missing. Uh, a lot of key parameters need to be studied before using this structure in micro LED space, which including the light extracting efficiency, light crosstalk between the pixels, examining different nanoporous thick layers investigating the effect of multiple densities of power cavities in structures and analyzing the influences of blue light leakage from the quantum dot films. 
and towards you know those, uh, those challenges, we have uh, used the um, trace, uh, you know, um, the retracing techniques, the retracing techniques uh, to calculate uh, the color converting process in those uh, quantum dots embedded in the porous uh, LED structure, and uh, we computed the blue and the red light out of the nanoporous LED structures for different thickness of power cavities. Uh, after the incorporation of those red quantum dots into those nanoporous layer, okay, and the, which is presented here, um, um, the um, from this our calculation, we find that as the porous thickness increases, both optical outputs coupled um, device structure are decreased because uh, red blue light is highly scattered by the uh, inner wall of the device structure and makes its way uh, makes its way to the side of the device. Uh, most of the blue light was absorbed by the quantum dots located deeper in the pore cavities for high thickness of nanopore structures, which can be a cause of the reduced blue light output as the nanopore thickness increases further. Um, we further calculate the overall absorption of the blue light by the red quantum dots and uh, also the blue leakage uh, from those quantum dot layer. Okay. And, uh, we identify the conditions of quantum dots infiltrating inside the nanoporous and find that uh, those conditions affect the overall absorption uh, of the blue light. Uh, and we find that increasing the porous thickness can absorb uh, most uh, of the blue light from the same quantum dot thickness films, since most quantum dots, uh, more quantum dots can be incorporated in the structure. And uh, we also find that the increase uh, of porous layer to one micron can reduce the blue light leakage to about 70% compared with 40% for a porous thickness of about 200 nanometer, suggesting that the increasing the porous thickness as a effective approach to minimize the desired blue light leakage. Um, we further calculate the light outputs for various porous densities. Okay, The light output for both blue and the red emission will increase as the porous density increases for a porous thickness of about 200 nanometer. Um, and the uh, analysis for higher porous thickness, both light output and are suppressed uh, by the increase of the poros, uh, porosity uh, density in the LED structure. Okay. For high porous thickness, uh, of about 400 nanometer and beyond, okay, we will find that more red and the blue light will be scattered back and forth inside the nanoporous uh, gallium nitride layer. And by increasing the porous density in those the thickness of the pore cavities, most of the blue and the red light will be lost due to the lost magnet, uh, which is presented uh, in these two figures, okay, which we show uh, the left one is the blue light emission for different porous densities, and then the, the right figure is the red light emission for different porosities. Uh, we further studied the crosstalk, the light crosstalk between the LED pixel of the nano power structure for both emissions. And what we find is uh, the you know the light channeling uh, and along the gallium nitride gallium nitride layer, which is essentially the waveguide effect, uh, is the main source of the optical crosstalk in our uh, micro LED uh, display panels. Okay, and we also find that the red crosstalk will be more than the blue crosstalk for the uh, adjacent adjacent pixels and far from the original LED device. Um, and the, the fact that the red light crosstalk uh, propagates uh, over more distance uh, will create different colors than the uh, desired ones, uh, particularly if it is used in the application of colorful micro LED displays. Okay. Um, this, is, this is considered a serious problem, okay. um, and which has to be um, taken into account uh, when we design the uh, micro LED display systems, okay. both the, because the picture quality uh, will be affected, and also the overall contrast of those devices will be affected by the uh, light crosstalk behavior, uh, especially for the red uh, light, the, the, the phosphor generated light emission. So here is a, uh, a conclusion of our uh, study. Okay, um, We reduced the light output after the quantum dot incorporation means that the light is highly scattered inside the multi-angled inner walls of those device structures, uh, which is considered as a light loss, uh, light loss in the structure. The quantum dots 
overall absorption depends on their cross section and absorption coefficients. Uh, because of that, some of the blue light photons uh, that will not be absorbed by the red conducts and can transmit out of the nanoporous LED structures as a blue light leakage, which will affect the desired color from the micro LED pixel. Um, we find that increasing the porous density for higher porous signals values will decrease the light output because of the scattering. And because of the high light channeling in the nanopore structure, the light cross top will increase uh, for the adjacent pixel, uh, particularly for the red light cross top. And uh, based on our studies, uh, uh, we have you know, determined that the, the future, future research directions, okay, moving forward, the quantum dot stability mechanism uh, will be studied ex experimentally by measuring the photochemical stability and also the thermal stability of quantum dots after film deposition on micro LED devices. Since the power density of micro LED devices um, uh, is far smaller okay, than the regular sized LED devices, this feature will play an important role in the stability of our quantum dots. And an experimental study should lead to the increased understanding of fabricating micro LED uh, display technology. Okay. So uh, this uh, is the, the, you know, the general idea of our uh, micro LED based uh, display study. Okay, and uh, um, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Professor Zian, for a very excellent talk. And any question from uh, Ding? I have one question. Yeah. May I? Sure, sure. Now, how do you how do you design this uh, uh, porosity? Like, is it just random distribution of uh, pores of different sizes, or uh, is it possible to put some periodic or uh, currently, uh, uh, you know, these uh, nanopore structures has been created by a, uh, you know, combination of uh, dry etching and wet etching approach, okay? And uh, the, the uh, porous, the pore density uh, is not very well controlled because, uh, because of the difficulties to etch this gallium nitride material. But the location of those nanopore structures can be precisely controlled using the lithography technique, okay? Uh, so therefore, you know, the, currently there is a key study in you know, how to uh, further control the, uh, the pore density and also the, you know, the shape of those pore structures. Okay, so that's something which is yeah. currently under study. But in, the, in, the, in your calculations or simulations, like, so what kind of pattern do you take? Um, well, when we do the, when we come back to the you know simulations, uh, certainly you know uh, we can choose uh, whatever porosity uh, you know whatever thickness of power lasers uh, we can use. But uh, in real calculation, in, in, uh, in real device fabrication, uh, those factors uh, is not uh, the control of those factors is not trivial. Okay. So, but in our calculation, you can easily determine you know control the thickness. You can get whatever thickness you need. In our calculation, we simulate uh, the porous thickness somewhere between 100 nanometers to one micron. Okay, and uh, well, we didn't uh, change the uh, the shape of those nanopores. You know, those nanopores uh, in general, you know, they have a uh, inclined wall structure. Okay, and a typical uh, inclination angle is about 60 degree, and you know, which is determined by the uh, lattice structure of those uh, gallium nitride material. These are all C plane or? Yes, we use the C plane direction for our calculation. Okay. Any more question? If not, then let us thank Professor Jian for an excellent talk. And I, I am sure that uh, after OLED, because we know that OLED is now commercially available, and I'm sure next uh, uh, revolution will come from the probably micro LED. Thank you. And I thank all the speakers to, for maintaining time and excellent talks, Professor Achanta Venigopal, Professor Amit Agrawal, Professor Dian Ziu. Thank you all. Jo Joseph, you have to say something? Professor Joseph? Yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. participating. Thank you. In thank, you. thank you. And we will have the concluding <laughs> session with Halvan. I don't know whether, or whether you will be able to attend that. That will be starting soon, I think, in Halvan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. 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 Th
He is going. I is going. Yeah.